Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is, the, this is the second day of our conference, the Cultural Clash in the European Union, and I would like to invite our first panelists. It is my pleasure and, and honor to, to host this, this first panel, uh, looking for advantage, and I would like to invite our panelists, Mr. Um, um, Andrew Kajewski, who from the Law and Justice, Marek Jurek, uh, the former, uh, former uh, uh, Mr. Marek Jurek, uh, Słowami Rykcenckiewicz, and Zdzisław Krasnodensky, uh, Professor uh, Sławomir Censkiewicz uh, was supposed to be with us, but, but unfortunately he's, he's, he's ill and uh, our panel is uh, slightly changed and we will talk about uh, Polishnessness and uh, uh, it is my impression that uh, we, will t we will continue our discussions about Poland. Uh, uh, we lack uh, such discussions in my opinion. I, I hope that my, my guests uh, will not find it offensive, but I, I would like to start this panel with uh, a very uh, personal uh, question. What do you, what do you, how do you understand this Polishness? Polishness, um, uh, Professor Krasnodemski. What is your definition of Polishness? Well, you have started with this very personal and difficult question. We, uh, we, we have already had such discussions, this phenomenon. I uh, followed your discussions yesterday, and uh, uh, it uh, seems to be the, the, the easiest uh, the easiest answers may be found in in the history, but uh, it's more difficult, slightly more difficult to find it in the in the present. Uh, uh, we have this uh, impression that there are some common denominators. Uh, uh, we have uh, common um, um, emotions. Um, in, uh, we heard from Professor Winstein yesterday, Schickstein Gemeinen, uh, the uh, community of uh, fate, uh, because we share the same fate. Uh, we are here in the in this uh, district, uh, Praga district of Warsaw. We have. Uh, uh, a, an anniversary of some historical events uh, from related to the Zamojszczyzna region of Poland and evacuating pop, uh, people um, folks from from there we differ in terms of uh, in terms of politics in terms of our, um, our opinions I represent Poznan as a, as, a, as an MMP I know that Wielkopolski Wielkopolski region has a different uh, perspective, uh, takes a different perspective very often, and uh, uh, has various uh, opinions. And uh, the opinions from people of people living there vary from those living here. Uh, the um, and the European Parliament is a, is a nice place where you can observe this Polishness and the understanding, the definition of this of this term. Is it still significant? Is it meaningful? Regardless of. Uh, so we observe various opinions uh, uh, with some uh, common uh, denominators. And we may say that uh, Poles share some values, uh, just the way Italians uh, share some values and, uh, and other nationals. Uh, let me also add that um, in the modern sciences, uh, there is this tendency to to deconstruct uh, some uh, joined uh, subjects. Uh, so we tend to move away from uh, talking about a nation in general, about uh, a country in general, but still we understand that there are some common elements. Another thing that I would like to draw your attention to is, uh, is this emotional dimension. Not only understood as uh, um, but this emotional emotional um, dimension I mean uh, the way we deal with our emotions uh, that is determined by the way we are we are brought up by our parents our, our uh, attitudes towards our nationality our our expectations in front of, of, of our lives. Uh, 
expectations in front of uh, expectations by 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 the poles. Uh, I believe that the Polish are very emotional, in my opinion. And uh, let me also share with you my observation about this conference. Uh, we are now experiencing very, very hard times uh, and a hard uh, moment with those uh, flows uh, of emotions, uh, uh, some emotions disappearing. When we compare ourselves to our Western neighbors, uh, we lack certain consistency in action. So we start doing something and then we give it up. That's what I would like to say. The, this emotional dimension is very important in my opinion. The same question to um, Mr. Marshall. Uh, would you like to share with us what, uh, how you understand this Polishness? Uh, uh, let's uh, let's recollect yesterday and the and the football match and all the emotions related to this football match. What? How do you understand Polishness? Well, of course, of course, I can share with you my personal view, uh, but I hope that you will ask uh, some objective opinions uh, too. Uh, we tend to believe when we are young that we are quite original, but uh, uh, when time, with the time passing, we discover that uh, we are more and more average uh, in the macro scale. For me personally, if you ask me personally what Polishness is, uh, Polishness is uh, my personal foundation, the foundation of my life, uh, what happens in my life, uh, what uh, what has happened already in my life, what will happen. My parents, my grandparents, uh, and uh, some, um, some recollections from the past, uh, from my family past, uh, the recollections of my grandparents, uh, about the partisans and uh, and uh, and uh, soldiers. In I remember I remember what happened in nine, 1995. Uh, uh, that uh, certain certain terms and definition changed. That uh, changed then. Uh, we uh, uh, are. Uh, Catholic and uh, 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 sometimes we feel that uh, sometimes we feel that we live in this kind of an upper height and we are um, some worse citizens uh, uh, sometimes we we worry that uh, we will lose our jobs and our children will be will be relegated from school because of our views and uh, opinions and then um, the reality and the history has very uh, has uh, actually dealt with our opinions. Uh, the awareness of people uh, is related to the uh, to people's position, and our uh, we believe that, that we know that the society believes uh, the majority of the society follows our opinions, uh, but uh, they are just afraid of uh, of, uh, of saying that aloud. Uh, I remember hearing from one one journalist from Switzerland that Poland is a strange country. Uh, this is this Eastern Bloc. It's it's a, you are a very strange world, uh, a strange strange country. Uh, because you are ashamed to admit uh, to uh, your affiliations with the ruling party. That's very, very strange. Uh, so it's like uh, it's about a rejection, whereas uh, let's not forget that we are the majority. Publishness is also this whole uh, experience of John Paul II and, uh, uh, and his service. Uh, this is what Polishness uh, means to me and his first pilgrimage to uh, to Poland. Uh, I remember it was very close to, not, not, far, not far from here, at uh, Józef Piłsudski Square, in the center of Warsaw. That's, that's where, where I saw him. And uh, I remember some comments, uh, uh, comments after, uh, after the, the service and after the ceremony with John Paul II. Uh, but I also recollect. I also recollect uh, an event uh, of uh, um, 
some um, event in, in, in a political event in 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 Poznan. I, I remember I remember that uh, I remember hearing people and realizing that some of the participants are against the society, not against the ruling party and against the government. So, uh, it's like a, I feel this. I, I could sense this uh, this uh, myth of the of the sixty of nineteen sixty eight. Uh, uh, I remember. I remember. Uh, I remember asking uh, some difficult questions, uh, uh, like questions about uh, uh, the, um, the so about socialism, about uh, uh, about some movements, political movements, which uh, people tend to avoid discussing. So, in my in my opinion, so uh, socialism still socialism still carries um, its promises uh, in places such as uh, the Makoto district of Warsaw, for instance. Uh, I remember the Dominican, Dominican um, um, uh, and I hearing from, from some of the participants in some of the events that you, you are fascists. Uh, uh, whereas, uh, whereas we want just to uh, emphasize the, our nationalism and, uh, and patri pat patriotism. Uh, I remember hearing from uh, from John Paul II. Uh, he once said that the nation is uh, uh, is the is the, is the most important community. A, a nation is not the only community, but is one of the most important, or even the most important, for uh, for a national community. And yet another observation by. Uh, John Paul II, uh, probably followed by a 17-minute applause, uh, a Polish, uh, a Polish soldier uh, fighting and struggling in in Warsaw uh, during the Second World War, uh, looking at its, uh, looking at its city. It was, uh, it was also sub almost subject to censorship. To, uh, he then talked about uh, talked about the Polish Polish soldier uh, and and, uh, and his his observations, which I, I I keep for myself because they were the most important uh, uh, from his whole pilgrimage. So from from the uh, we. Feel and we can see all those uh, all those tensions from the left and from the right. The left is, uh, of course, represented by the Borcha daily newspaper, and uh, um, we remember that John Paul II was the uh, was uh, was our was like our promised uh, promised land, and uh, I, I remember I remember Gazeta Wyborcza daily. Uh, saying there is a miracle so um, and uh, especially especially in the in the in the, in the, with, the with all those attacks on, on John Paul II in the background right now I, I remember that even at that time Gazeta uh, Babata had to admit that John Paul II could do miracles uh, uh, so even Gazeta Wyborcza had to admit that uh, there is uh, there is space for for a full miracle. Whereas well, so this is the leftist uh, leftist uh, um, uh, communication, and then we have the rightist. Uh, well, John Paul II. Uh, and, um, the uh, Pope uh, from ISIS. Uh, and I remember hearing from one rightist uh, journalist uh, um, saying that uh, John Paul, the Pope is a man nowadays, uh, whereas his service uh, is about humanity and the Polish romanticism. Uh, I, I tend to, I always remember that the, every Pope is also a human being and uh, and uh, this uh, this is uh, this uh, synth synthesis is uh, is specific in this in this way. Uh, the synthesis of of uh, of uh, various various options uh, and uh, and the wilderness of uh, Benedict the Sixteenth. Uh, 
Pilpa. We are this kind of uh, um, artist uh, uh, artist uh, society, and, uh, and then take uh, John Paul II and Pius. Uh, uh, this, uh, the the twelfth uh, and his relations with uh, with a royal with a royal castle and for 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 the pope this is the relation with the with the romanticism romanticism. Now we are trying to um, find uh, find our way in this. Uh, uh, so um, when I when I thought about about uh, about the topic of this discussion, um, I want I wondered uh, Polishness uh, Polishness is uh, more um, slightly more than than just remembering and uh, just the community of fate. Uh, I, uh, a human being who loses uh, identity and and memory and, uh, and uh, because memory is very important for this identity the identity is a continuity of problems continuity of beliefs uh, and when when we take this uh, community of faith uh, is uh, about also about the continuity of of our conflicts uh, these are the issues and uh, uh, issues uh, Relating to the tradition, the tradition that not only evolves, but the tradition that is uh, that is spoken, the tradition that is in the in the essence of uh, of uh, what constitutes me, Polishness, uh, and it's worth uh, and it's worth sharing among Poles is what constitutes ours. Uh, uh, professor, professor, um, as. Uh, uh, talked about um, our experience in uh, in the European institutions uh, when we meet uh, uh, and our international partners uh, we can uh, we can see what 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 we share and but but also what distinguishes us are us uh, we share we share certain up certain uh, certain uh, opinions uh, with our international uh, neighbors uh, uh, but we differ and uh, only by talking and meeting we can realize uh, what constitutes us as as the Poles uh, and uh, helps us to understand what what Polishness is uh, when I when I take all this uh, I believe that we should be grateful because when you are young and uh, when you read what Dmowski once uh, wrote uh, uh, who said? Who once said that uh, our, our our history and our past constitute us? Uh, uh, we have received much more than we will give and than we will offer. When you are twenty something, you think it's theory, but then, uh, with the, with the time passing, you discover how real it is. Uh, so Polishness, what is it? It should be about it should be about um, gratitude too. Thank you very much, and now I would like to move on to uh, the professor the, the, to uh, Mr. Jatkowski. Um, how do you perceive uh, Polishness? How do you feel it? Thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, because uh, I ask myself the right questions, uh, I want to know what Polishness is for me. Polishness is a source of phenomenal, phenomenal um, power and uh, proud. Uh, I, will, I will try to draw three pictures uh, come from, all come from, uh, from my past. Uh, I'm a 50-something year old uh, uh, and uh, I remember talking uh, I remember. I remember that uh, the Polish traditions were not uh, discussed widely in my in my family. I have this first picture, um, constituting in my mind, uh, uh, drawn drawn in my mind, uh, and some events shaping me and my Polishness. So just please remember. Imagine I have. I'm five, five years old. So my mother makes some pasta. It's very Polish. Uh, making making the pasta is very Polish. Uh, so I, I asked my mom, mother about my my, my grandfather. Uh, he was stopped by the Bolshevik soldiers in 1939. He was about to be shot uh, because uh, he was a butcher. Uh, they checked your your hands, uh, uh, your palms. Uh, if your if your hands were too uh, were too delicate, then you would be you you would be you would be shot. Uh, and uh, my grandfather grandfather was was to be shot because his his hands were were delicate and he was not shot only because someone defended him and uh, 
I remember I, when I was at, at the age of five, I became anti-communist, uh, and that's what defined me. And then I started wondering what this Bolshevism and is about. What, and I, I, I had those questions in my mind, uh, and so. In my case, this is the first my first uh, contact with uh, Polishness, um, and the second picture I would like to draw is that my my grand my another grandfather was uh, was a railman and and and, uh, and I remember what they ate uh, those uh, tri typical Polish cuisine dishes uh, and my fa my father worked at the, the railway uh, and and he could be promoted uh, by joining the the, the communist party but he didn't want to do that. I didn't understand much uh, as a child, but I just asked him a question, why don't you want to sign up for the party? And he said, because they don't believe in God, he retorted. That was a very beautiful picture to have, that um, educated me. And the third picture is this. I am a lecturer, I'm standing in the church in this lecture, but I'm reading the gospel. So I'm a person who's got a power in himself and uh, this sacrum and this fortitude of gospel. And this is the picture that really firmed me up. I have never I have never uh, lived uh, through anything or I never experienced anything closer to that um, feeling that I had. So sacrum you can experience only in, uh, in church. So the family is such a sacrum and people try to take it away from us. Uh, power and A, B, C, D and so on. With the family is teaching us something, not by telling us anything, but by uh, watching those things repeating. I know that many people, the young people, depart from the church, and I am very sorry for that, but I think that, the, that Christ and his teachings will never get old, will never be obsolete. So I think, to me, Polishness is a source of incredible pride. I've been a Pole and I've never been ashamed of it. And when I hear that some representatives of my intelligentsia are ashamed of speaking Polish uh, abroad, I don't understand what they're talking about. We should be pride. They try to subjugate us. We should have been speaking right now German or Russian. It never succeeded. I was listening to Professor Novak in one of his interviews. He said the following about Boleslav Robert, the Polish first king. He wanted to be alone. He wanted to rule alone himself. He don't want to be. He don't want. He didn't want to report to the Germans or to any other power. So speaking about my Polishness. This is about the feeling of your identity, of your own value, what's your worth, based on history, based on Catholic faith, and the person who has the sense of his own value is a strong person. That cannot be broken. You can kill him, but you can break him. So I don't like to be sentimental like this, but we are never going to lose those values if we hone them. So Polishness is something very private, intimate to me. I don't know if you can grasp, capture Polishness. We should thrive nonetheless. It's like chasing the bunny. We should be vigilant. We want to change the definition. Anyway, I'm very happy to have a poll. Thank you. I think that the response of the audience has been the best testimony to the value of, the, of that lecture. Now, okay, moving on to the next topic of our discussion. Let's move to those more political questions, geopolitical.
issues you've been co-shaping the public debate. The professor here is an EP from the ruling party. Mara Kurek is a former politician. And our editor here is a journalist and owner of the information of an information portal. So the next question is why we should f um, look for advantages. This question goes to Professor Krasnodemski. If you look at what's happening in, the, in Europe uh, from the geopolitical point of view, these processes are quite apparent, although sometimes very difficult to capture. But something is in the making, something has been changing recently. So in your opinion, Professor, as a country, as Poland, where should we look for advantages in that changing world or changing Europe? Right, excuse me, if I may, before I give an answer to that question, I should digress, perhaps. For the sake of time, Polishness is a phenomenon that we could probably describe from two viewpoints, a subjective one, like we are looking at the world from a certain point of view, from a certain vantage point. And the editor said that with age, sorry, the, the professor uh, Jurek said that with age, you are becoming more and more aware of that. So you are born in a certain place in a certain time that you were not free to choose in a certain societal environment. So from this point of view, Polishness, is something inalienable. There is a essay by Thomas Nagel who ponders on how is it being a bat? This is very difficult to grasp because it's a very subjective element. And if someone has no such experience like the one that we have, which is individualized, and it hinges very strongly on the time period when were you uh, when you were born. And if Mr. Shambovsky recalled when he was recalling uh, his childhood, I can still recall those or imagine those noodles and the rail railroad. Uh, but the person who is further away culturally couldn't possibly bring up those pictures in their minds. So there is suddenly a reflection that comes up about the place that shaped us and what is the particular in this context, what sets us apart from the others, especially when we compare ourselves with people brought up in a different context. I spent quite a long time abroad. I lived in Poland, but I, sorry, I lived outside Poland, but I lived in Poland as well at the same time. And uh, this is how we see things differently. Uh, this is also prominent in the European Parliament. Marek Rokita said that if people speak about freedom, they understand that we're differently. The same goes for the European Union. We do not reject freedom and democracy and uh, human dignity. It is just that we understand those notions differently. And overcoming those differences, we try to explain those uh, differences in perception to others. We also attempt to describe to describe this collective being of that Poland is. And I think the easiest way forward here is to tell stories about Polish history. But I pondered on how variable that might be. So to add some um, let's say bitterness to this conference. The editor here said a sentence that's very characteristic of the Polish people. You said eventually that you are proud 
of being a pole, but you said also something else that I can see very often from poles that I never had from paradoxically from a German or American. I am a Polish person, I'm not ashamed of being a Pole. So have you ever had about, uh, have you ever had a Spaniard saying, I'm a Spaniard, I'm not ashamed of it? Well, in my generation, well, I had German acquaintances who early in the morning, small hours, over the wine were telling me that this, this cursed fate to be a German and I wish I were an Italian or something, which has changed gradually. But when speaking about Polishness, we need to understand that all those traumatic experiences have built up that context. Our, all our fears we talked about objective perspective and subjective perspective. As I'm a sociologist, I'm trying to describe the, the features of that collective being. But there are also third parties who attribute something to our notions. Okay, we the banner of our conference is Polishness and Clash of Civilizations. One of my colleagues, MEPs, posed the following question. There is a cultural clash at the making, and there is a problem for Europe out of it, but why are we talking about Polishness at this conference? That is because we need to explain how our experience fits the European Union, fits the European Union. So we all have recognized that we have a problem with it. But this year something has changed principally. And Jan Maria Rokita told yesterday that in my generation, he is a bit younger than myself. Well, it's still a generation that experienced the end of communism, the solidarity movement, and the victory. He said that in my generation, we had been always, um, we had always believed that we belonged to the West at all times, or it is the European Union. And many people still believe that. I spoke uh, the other day about the, the threats or dangers coming from the West, and it was found a blasphemy. Professor Legutko said something in the parliament along these lines, and Gazeta Wyborcza uh, says or claims that he put shame on us. Okay, let me quote something. Please uh, be quick, Professor, because uh, we're running out of time. So a very prominent poll said, and we need to clearly define that we are Europeans. We must not commit ourselves to chaos in the East. We must become a fully fledged members of the United Europe. And we have to do the utmost that the borders of uh, the European Union is on the along the Bug River, and Moscow people are afraid that Poland supports uh, Ukraine's membership in the Visegrad Triangle. It will be uh, terrible. Europe is prepared to extend its privileges. Europe privileges over three countries. Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, but Europe uh, on the steps of Ukraine up to the Don River. I think European, uh, the Europe, uh, sorry, the Eastern Europe has or have their own problems and ways towards democracy, which are not our causes or our matters. It was a very Catholic editor or journalist. Right, sorry, we need to put a full stop here. We uh, we still have 10 minutes till the end of the panel. So please be disciplined and answer to the following questions. 
Why should we look for advantages when it comes to political processes in the European Union? When it comes to geographic or geopolitical processes, where are our strengths and how we should fight for our interests? For 30 years, we've been rebuilding and reconstructing the state, and I think we need also to rebuild the nation. In my opinion, there are two historical uh, notions uh, that uh, go hand in hand with Polishness, and I think they're intertwined. The first is the Polishness that we learned from the most prominent doctor of, Poli of Poland or Polishness, uh, Father Piotr Skarga, and his train of thoughts that permeates the Polish philosophy up to the contemporary times. He stated that the soul of Polishness were our Catholicism. Of course, with due respect to non-Catholic Christians, Piotr Skarga, the priest Skarga, was um, Catholic, and he was an, an, uh, an enemy of um, religious freedoms. And the second thing was that feeling or urge to fight for someone else's liberties. For ours and your and your freedom, and the legend of young Poland by Brzozowski goes hand in hand with that. That we just passed down generation only their home base values, domestic values. So I was told to speak briefly about this. Is a very vast topic. of the original Polishness, which is described for the first time in the uh, works of Piotr Skarga, and then returns in the teachings of John Paul II, requires those two components to be combined. Skarga said that the care of the true faith and self um, Uh, because the Poles were cared of uh, being a, a prominent or a, like to show it off rather than take care of uh, shoring up the defenses. So these things sometimes diverge. I always said that. There were always two extreme statements, Euromania and Europhobia. And I would I say that I'd rather support the work of the European nations in favor of the natural law rather than vote against you that rejects that rejected natural law. And most of those stories really came true. Well, people allege that uh, we should not reject the means, but I always said that it will end up with a political blackmail eventually. And this is what happened, this violation of the European laws, the mechanism, the uh, rule of law for money. Do but, uh, do bow to a uh, violation of the treaties. Abolish the flexibility mechanism, then you will get the money. I told well, years before that nothing will come free of charge. But let's put it aside. But this universal dimension of Polishness and political dimension of uh, Polishness sometimes diverged. And the public opinion used to be loyal to the political right, law and order, strong state. Then they were t to one another because the universal 
laws um, of Polishness, like indifference, sorry, indifference towards Ukraine. Our, mm, our authorities are very much interested and in make a point of of, of um, supporting the Ukraine militarily, like also encouraging Germans to do their share. And complete indifference, when we saw that first trip by Chancellor Scholz and President Macron to Kiev, and then two years thereafter, Yanukovych's um, convention needed to be ratified. Poroshenko never signed up this or signed this um, directive. Ukraine has been uh, objecting to this for 10 years and we failed to tell the Ukrainians that you have you are in the same position as the other countries that you have the same treaty uh, situation Ruta of Holland who was a great uh, the great uh, defender of the law uh, and uh, who f didn't go and visit his dying mother because the quarantine had been imposed meanwhile and everybody rejoiced. So this is something I wanted to work towards and this is what defined my political way. But this is one of the advantages of Poland. So we're entering the 21st century, and uh, this is the century when uh, when the national poli poli uh, politics will be will be realized and carried out in a different way. This in within the national structures, and so those national structures will, will depend on our our what we can uh, actually uh, uh, su suggest and what we, what we can offer. Uh, we have uh, the sovereignty roots, and uh, and we have those uh, traditions. Don't worry, but it's just a matter of time. And yet another topic: uh, um, Poland should be uh, the spokesman for this Christian, for this for Christian notions, and it should be reflected in political acts. Uh, uh, Political acts uh, that we sign up to. Uh, this we this it's it's Sunday today, uh, uh, so it's a solemn moment. But it should be realized and and present and visible not only on, on in this in those moments. So one thing is what we declare, and another thing is what we deliver. I have mentioned uh, Father uh, Piotr Skarga and his uh, his understanding of the Polish uh, identity. Uh, the Polish identity should cannot be and mustn't be reduced to, to uh, fighting for your or our freedom only, solely, because this is not the idea of our national uh, identity. This is the full stop here, um, Professor Jastrzemowski. Uh, Mr. Jastrzemowski, where should we be looking for the advantages in this changing world of politics? Before I move on to, to those advantages, uh, I would like to comment to uh, Professor Kasmandemski's words. Uh, uh, I fully agree that uh, that Americans would never say um, that um, I'm, I'm going somewhere, and I'm I'm always proud of uh, of being of uh, being an American. Uh, but we all know that there is no Gazeta Wyborcza in in the, in the U.S. Uh, uh, dissolving Polishness. Uh, uh, we have those, uh, we have those figures, uh, characteristic Polish figures. Uh, we call them Janusz. Janusz. Uh, uh, we are ashamed of. Uh, it's not about a joke. It's not. It's not a joke only. Uh, this is. This is really not a joke. It's an attack on on the um, on the Polishness and our proud. Uh, uh, some uh, some feeling of um, of, uh, of our pride. Uh, our pride is taken away from us this way. Um, this is where we should be looking for the advantage. Uh, struggling with this, uh, I'm really my eyes are full of tears when I when I follow the events in in Ukraine and uh, uh, and I see all those uh, Polish people accepting uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, in their homes. Uh, that's uh, that's that's absolutely unique. That's uh, something that is a proof of our our uh, significant strength uh, we are really unaware of. We need to remind ourselves of that. 
we haven't uh, we haven't focused on that yet. We haven't uh, uh, emphasized that uh, strongly enough yet. We have accepted all those refugees uh, to our homes. Uh, it's a unique thing. Our unique Polish feature, the Polishness, our Polishness. And uh, this is where we should be looking for our advantages. Uh, are we really, do, you really, do we really need uh, to look for those advantages? Uh, because looking for them may suggest that we lack something. Do we lack anything? We have to realize that this is a very, very good moment in history for us. Please observe our, our past some 30 years ago. Do you remember, do you remember the Pevex stores? Uh, for 50 cents you could get, you could get um, half a liter of vodka. Our salary, um, an average salary was $20 per month, uh, whereas nowadays it's much, much higher, as you know. So why should we be looking for those advantages? Of course, it's not. It's, it's um, a, a lot can still be done. The, the solution of Polishness, uh, the federalization of uh, of Europe. Uh, we don't want that. I don't want that. Why? Because I'm afraid that we will lose the the, the right direction. We will we will lack this moral compass. We will our lives will become too easy. I don't want my life to be too easy. I want my children to develop. Uh, I want my children to have challenges in front uh, head. Uh, whereas this new Europe doesn't suggest all those challenges, any challenges. We, that's what we need to realize. And this, these advantages are inside of us. Is there anything that could be added? Professor? Uh, professor? Yes, a lot of we still have uh, a few minutes uh, uh, given to us by the organizers. So, objective features of Polishness. Uh, how do you understand this uh, this uh, this term? Yes, yes, of course. But I want to address the question, uh, your question about the our advantages and where where we should be looking for those advantages. Uh, in my opinion, we don't even realize. Uh, how successful we have been over the last 30 years. Uh, Poland has become very attractive in this uh, stru struggle in Europe for Europe. Uh, a struggle uh, about that, that's the topic of the struggle. The, the, our objective is to reach a certain shape of Europe. Uh, we need to attract others to our ideas, to our notions. We have um, a number of followers, even representing other political, other political um, areas. Our country is very successful, extraordinarily successful. We sometimes do not realize. I remember talking to a philosopher, my colleague, a philosopher in Georgia, and he said. I visited Poland in the 70s. I was a student at that time, and Poland was no different from uh, from other countries. Well, a, well, so-called free country, but in, in, intellectually not free. When I when I came back to Poland in 2006 and 2008, uh, you were far far uh, ahead. Uh, whereas I visited your country two years ago, and I can see that uh, you're even uh, much further ahead. Uh, you are very close to achieving what our predecessors uh, lost. So there are chances in front of us uh, geopolitically, but still challenges and, uh, and uh, risks remain. I will come back to romanticism. Romanticism was about a word and a deed. A word is about communication. Communication, we lack uh, skills in terms of communication, in my opinion, but I also agree that uh, that uh, communication is about two sides, two parties. So, uh, in, and we don't know what will happen in this respect uh, within the next 30, 30 years, but I hope that the coming years will be at least as successful as the previous years. But in order to achieve that, and in order to follow this direction, we need to 
uh, resolve many of our internal problems. Uh, uh, we are uh, facing the elections in the next in the in the next year. Next year, and a lot of challenges uh, coming. Thank you very much, Professor. And a question to uh, to Marshal to Marshal Marek Jurek and the Polishness. Uh, a brief answer, please. Uh, I have I have tackled that. Uh, our Christian identity is our advantage. Uh, uh, this is our Christian vocation, I would call it. And uh, secondly, we are among maybe one Poland uh, and Hungary, together with Hungary, we are among the Central Eastern uh, European countries uh, with this continuity, historical continuity in sovereignty, in terms of sovereignty. So these two elements are very important, but uh, we need uh, some aware awareness, I may say. We need to be uh, aware and uh, sure that uh, we can preserve what we are capable of preserving what we already have. Uh, this is about our attitude uh, and it is uh, demonstrated by our attitude towards the uh, R Russian um, aggression in the East uh, because that's where the European spirit is demolished and uh, and damaged. Uh, um, we remember certain events uh, in uh, France uh, adopting a uh, pro-abortion law followed by uh, some um, similar events in the US. Uh, that's what we should observe very closely and uh, make, a, make a decisive stand in, in the last uh, the same question to Professor Jasnowski short, shortly. Poland, for me, is a spiritual strength and power that helps us uh, survive all those historical collapses and problems. Uh, it's not uh, instant all the time. We should work on a on a on this Polishness in the long term. Uh, our Polishness comes and stems from Christianity. If you, every Christian is a is a child of God. It is inside of us. Let's not lose it because that's where our power is and resides. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I would like to thank to thank all our, our speakers. Uh, I'm sure you could say more. Unfortunately, uh, this panel is uh, about to finish. Uh, Professor Jisela uh, Krasnolevsky, the, the member of, um, of the Law and Justice Party, Marshal uh, Marek Jurek, uh, the, the former MEP, and the Marshal of the Polish Sejm, and uh, Sławomir Jastrzębowski. A journalist and the owner of Salon of Register Storyper Portal. Thank you very much for all, uh, joining our panel and thank you very much for listening. And we will have now a short break and then we will have a short and uh, uh, the next uh, panel. And I invite you to continue the discussions in there. Thank you very much for uh, hosting this this panel.
So, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the second panel. Uh, welcome. Um, this, the time has come for the second panel. Uh, I'm, it's going to be a very interesting panel. Uh, I would like to welcome our panelists, Mr. Łukasz Warzecha, do rzeczy. And Marek Budzisz, um, Strategia w sieci. The topic of our discussion is as follows. Uh, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus uh, is uh, the, a new version of the, of the first uh, Republic of Poland possible. Yesterday we had long discussions. Uh, we uh, recollected yesterday about, about this, this topic um, and the strength, uh, the Polish strength uh, um, awoken um, at, uh, in the past. Uh, is the recollection and the reconstruction of this possible? Are we able to uh, to recreate the strength of the first uh, republic, uh, Polish Republic, uh, possible? Łukasz uh, Warzecha said that we are too much engaged. Uh, we're engaged too much in, uh, in helping Ukraine. Of course. Uh, uh, talking in simple terms, uh, I'm sure that uh, the two or two guests will be will present uh, their opinions clearly. Let us start with uh, Mr. Marek Budzis. Why do you feel that this uh, federal project uh, and this uh, profound collaboration um, at the territory of the of the first Polish Republic possible, and uh, how how is that possible? Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, so I know that this panel has uh, time limitations, so I will concentrate on very on some theses. Uh, we have the strategic uh, strategic calculation and a strategic uh, situation after uh, February the twenty fourth. My thesis is as follows: uh, the times. The times from before the, the Russian aggression, from before uh, February the 24th, will never be back. Uh, so we will never again be uh, able to function properly, um, uh, being at the same time indifferent to what is happening in Ukraine. After all those uh, all the sequence of activities and uh, all those events and decisions made by the Polish government, but also decisions and uh, decisions by the Polish society, as we could see this clear, uh, clear stand and opinion and position of the Polish society after February the 24th, uh, the 24th. Um, the times from before that date will never come back. Uh, we are now facing this new geostrategical situation in the region. Secondly, there are no signs showing that Russia treats this, this war as a one-time event uh, and one-time campaign. It's like a general, general clash with the West uh, that will last uh, uh, years. We remember proposals by Putin uh, of December the 19th last year. Putin wants the central, uh, the East Central uh, Europe uh, uh, to be turned into a buffer, um, uh, buffer zone uh, with no installations. Uh, NATO installation, Western and American installations. So these are very clear objectives of Russia. Uh, we hear them. Uh, we hear them on a number of. Uh, we have heard them on on a number of occasions. Uh, to uh, December the seventeenth, uh, to mention just one. And Russia, in the long run, uh, is aiming at uh, reaching this this state. Uh, uh, Russia will. We believe that Russia will never accept its defeat in 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 the war with Ukraine. Uh, another objective of Russia nowadays is uh, to have uh, some strategic pause and halt to rebuild uh, its potential and its military potential. Uh, Russia tre already treats Ukraine as a strategic hole. For, for many reasons, the experience of the of of the of, of the recent months uh, have shown that it's not possible to defeat Ukraine without defeating Poland. Uh, uh, in this sense, uh, if Russia wants to. Uh, uh, 
war to make uh, Ukraine subordinate. Russia will need and will want to change uh, the Polish politics and our decisions. And that results in the fact that we will have to change our, our system of securing um, safety. This is a long perspective. Uh, uh, you can't have uh, this system without the collaboration, military collaboration between Poland and Ukraine. The collaboration be between the two countries is absolutely in indispensable. With the, with the assistance of uh, possibly other countries, uh, uh, for example, the US. Uh, that's how we can get rid of Russia from Europe uh, by means of some military uh, actions and events and by um, tools. We are, uh, we need to overcome this fate of our geopolitical such situation, location, always being between Germany and Russia. We need to protect protect uh, uh, the Russian influence on the West uh, to protect our interests. That's yet another story. So this is this general strategic calculation that serves the, uh, the Polish interests. That's how I locate uh, my strong belief uh, that this collaboration between Poland and Ukraine is needed and absolutely necessary. And what do you think, um, Lukasz, uh, Mr. Wajecha? Maybe I will not be that concise, but I, I really want to do that. Let me start with the remainder. I've been following this great conference, and I'm very glad uh, to the organizers for inviting me. So I noticed that a very often tie, uh, sorry, light motif that we've had many times is a Polish romanticism. Not only do we have the anniversary of romanticism, but we also have, uh, celebrate the year of uh, Józef Matzkiewicz. I don't think he would have a street named after him in Warsaw. He said that only the truth is interesting. Let me digress to the previous panel. Apologies for that. When I heard Professor Krasnodewski saying, I'm not sure if he's there yet, uh, that people envy us our courage, I asked myself the question in the context of that interesting truth. What have we achieved realistically since 2004 in the European Union? What did we block? How did we step out or what did we step out of or opt out of? The registration, ban registration of combustion vehicles, um, national recovery plans with 300 milestones, all including our internal affairs. Okay, because shouting is okay, but what have we achieved realistically? So, starting with this very noxious. Uh, play or a noxious comment, I just wanted to prick this balloon that you've been inflating uh, since yesterday. I am often at loggerheads with Marek's statements, uh, but I'm thankful for him for his a very sound uh, stirrup that he, or stirring that he invokes. Well, I can't see continuation of your statement that you had uh, put forward a couple of weeks ago about the formal um, uh, union of Poland and uh, Ukraine. Uh, 
I understand that it takes time to be achieved, but if you're saying that we had the breakthrough, the long, uh, watershed moment, and I do agree with that, and when I'm thinking about this watershed moment, and yesterday you said that the watershed moment was planting on the king Władysław Jagi on the Polish throne, then I can't help but thinking about my favorite historian writer, Paweł Jasienica, who saw that Poland's turning towards east was the foundation of its uh, later defeat. So there's the clash between the Jagiellonian and the Piast policies. So when we think of whether it can be successful, because one thing is the current aid and help to Ukraine, I'm not going to uh, comment on that because certain civilization things should not be made conditional. We have common interest of in stopping Russia, but we aren't talking about something which goes further beyond that. And if so, I shall remind you that the first panel at this conference yesterday was about philosoph philosophy of connection and his classification of civilizations. I think those things become important in a strategic plan as soon as we start collaborating or we, we make a partnership. I'm not speaking about cultural differences because from the international laws as well federation this cannot be achieved because this would be an earthquake for our place in the current set of current arrangement. Confederation will be possible, but there is there are no confederations. Conf Swiss confederation is not a true confederation legally. So Felix Konechny put the Cossack country or Cossack land as part of the Turan civilization, while he put Poland and the Latin civilization. Has there been any change meanwhile? I believe that contemporary Ukraine uh, refers to that very libertarian model or freedom-based model and they claim that Cossack lands were one of the the symbols of, of it and they still belong to Turan civilization rather than Latin. So this is worth mentioning if we speak about a closer closer deal. I am putting aside the things such as destruction of a country, drop in GDP, which will probably uh, reach or will have reached 50% by the end of the year. So, on. so this would be a terrible burden for months. Another indicator that has ceased to exist, surprisingly, after 24th of February, that 2021, Ukraine was uh, um, placed 122 in the World Transparency Index, and that was a drop. Poland was at the 30th place, in the 30th place. Ukraine has improved from 26 points to 35 points, which is a um, an improvement on a scale of 100. And we were ranked 36th, sorry, yes, we were ranked 36th, says the speaker. So the difference in culture, institutional culture, managerial culture between of our countries was gigantic. And I could offer you more examples of that, of the differences between divergences between these countries, but what I wanted to say is to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that any form of um, lasting bond between the two countries means shouldering gigantic problems which will probably overburden us all. Another thing is the vision that Ukraine foresees for itself. There is a little resonance of Aristovich's uh, statements, who is a very close uh, advisor to Zelensky, who is a visionary, very interesting pos um, uh, uh, personality on the Ukrainian scene. 
And when Aristovich says that, okay, we struck a deal with Poland that we decided to put the uh, genocide topic on the back burner, maybe he's lying, but these are things that need to be also addressed in the strategic plan, because when we are speaking about the current uh, aid, I am absolutely opposed to making that conditional upon the historical uh, matters. But if Aristovich says that our plan after the war is that Ukraine has to be the tent of the region, the biggest magnet, and that will be the country which will attract everybody else. And also a statement by Marian Zabłocki the other day, very interesting uh, interview, by the way, where he draws up a vision of Ukraine of a uh, extremely libertarian economy, which I like right? because I'm economic liberal. But please juxtapose Poland with over advertising and all the rules that actually um, snare and snare us because of the European Union regulations and the Ukraine, which is unpolitically unstable and uh, which will play out its maximal extreme. Uh, economic liberalization, where would investments go? If we assume that the, war there, that the war has ended and the Ukraine assumed this model. So my question is this, if we look at it very realistically without any sentiments, what Ukraine is in the Polish interest? A very extremely strong dominating Ukraine or one that can defend itself against Russia, but without dominating us in Poland. So the follow-up question is whether it makes sense to think of any form of political union between the two countries. Thank you very much. Your turn, editor. How would you tackle those arguments? Let's put some things right. I have, I have been closely following Aristovich's statements, and he had a whole sequence of statements, not only the one in Jeshev, but he also gave an interview to Yulia Watinina and spoke differently about those. I think that uh, the statements of Aristovich indeed took place, but it was preceded by other statements, like without support of Poland, Ukraine would have not existed anymore as a state. Second, what he said was that we do the utmost at, at every expense to avoid the slightest, even the slightest um, conflicts with Poland. This is because some biases and synergy with Poland guarantees that of both countries will control of the space between Russia and Western Europe, the space between the Baltic and the Black Seas. So in this context, what Aristovich said was that facing the challenges and opportunities, invoking historical conflicts is not purposeful. And he said that he um, considers it a magnanimous approach by Poland that the Polish nation has not raised the Vowin massacre topic as a political kind of political theme. There is also a difference between what I said and what Łukasz Wazeha said. I am speaking about the geopolitical calculus of Poland. And Łukasz Wazeha told us about the geopolitical calculation of Ukraine, and these are two different perspectives. Now, reverting to uh, the uh, sorry, the, the potentials question. Of course, the GDP went down by thirty-seven percent, so it is now about one hundred twenty billion dollars. Schmehaus government when preparing the Swiss conference on the reconstruction of Ukraine, assumed an optimistic scenario of that country's growth over the horizon of 10 years with a GDP growth of 7% PA, which would 
allow Ukraine to revert to the 2021 GDP figure after 10 years with Pol uh, sorry, with, with the Ukrainian's GDP three times smaller uh, than that of Poland anyway. So the statement that Ukraine stands a chance to dominate Poland economically, I believe it is not um, right or is it not uh, justified. The free market reforms announced by Vice Prime Minister Sviridenko may very very um, favorably affect Poland in order to make Poland depart from over regulation. Because I do agree that Poland is over regulated. And together, the, the Prime Minister of Poland, Lithuania, and uh, I believe Ukraine signed the declaration of the Lublin Triangle the other day where the Lithuanian and Polish businesses will be under special care of by the Ukrainian government if they wanted to invest in Ukraine and open their, um, their uh, divisions there. So this is a very favorable overture to an ally that definitely Poland is for Ukraine. So putting aside the strategic calculus, the statement that Ukraine may be a burden will not revert the whole situation because if Ukraine is left to their own devices and they will not win the war and they will not reconstruct themselves enough and Poland will not be involved and Ukraine remains a corrupt country and destroyed country. Destroyed also by the process of absorbing throngs of veterans that need to be put back to civilian life. So in a nutshell, a Ukraine that is not able to rebuild its potential so as to be able to object to or stand up to Russia in the f in the future going coming for going forward we assume that there will be an internal change in Russia and Russia resulting in Russia not willing anymore to attack Ukraine which is overly optimistic I believe my question is what happens if Russia is back in the game in five or ten years time American experts say that 75% of the um, of uh, the Russian losses is the equipment that entered into service before 2011, so it's quite obsolete. So the two most serious American think tanks, CNA, number one strategic think tank for the Navy and a Center for American Security, that is the back of, intellectual back office of Biden's administration, they believe that those losses can be compensated for within three to five, perhaps seven years. But Ukraine without Western support will not be able to rebuild its potential even as of the 24th of February. So that means that in a certain period of time, we'll, we'll not have a border on Russia or to Russia in the Kaliningrad region only, but it will be a bit much longer border, which will absolutely change our strategic situation, regardless of whether Ukraine is a um, corrupt uh, state, unable to object or stand up to Russia it will be definitely detrimental for us. So this is what is the basis of what I'm saying about the collaboration with uh, Ukraine. Now, I mean, especially the military alliance with Ukraine. Uh, they, well, Ukrainians want to have 300,000 strong an army and we want to um, have 350,000 armed forces supported by the US. So these are the countries to want to involve themselves, commit themselves to Eastern flank without negotiating Russia. This is the main objective and this is the main reason why I am saying about very close partnership with Ukraine and military in other terms. 
we could have agreed to Putin's proposal on the 19th of uh, December and asked the Americans to withdraw from Poland and Central Europe, uh, Europe at large. We could uh, request Americans to pull back their nuclear installations from Germany to Italy and Holland because this is still on the table, that proposal. So what Ukraine gave us in with the fighting is a strategic pause that we need to exploit by preparing ourselves, bracing ourselves for the future conflict with Russia. So in this construction, Ukraine, their problems are of course very important, but in my opinion, it is much more important the situation that Poland find, found itself after the 24th of February. Thank you very much. And then to Mr. Vajah, question to him. The same question that Mr. Bujic answered. Weak Ukraine will mean sooner or later an assault on a weakened Poland. And Ukraine is not going to be strong without Poland's commitment. So what's, what's your take on it? Now, I will definitely answer that, but a few comments before that. I am not surprised that Adestavich is happy that no historical questions are raised that would encumber the Polish-Ukrainian relations because the fault is on the Ukrainian side. Now, as we speak about preferences for Polish businesses, it's unimportant to me what the policy of the Ukraine will be like I oh, let me refer to an interview uh, with that um, Supreme Council deputy who said, you are not going to discriminate against any source of capital in Poland. There is a conviction or belief that our business should have a share, fair share. And the, um, and the answer is there will be no discrimination against uh, the criteria of the business only and every investor is welcome and uh, the rules will be uh, the same for everyone except for Russian based companies. So I've been following Ukraine's policy for many years and it's very pragmatic and they give a gift to everyone. If uh, they have to tell something nice to Poles, they do it. If you have to invite Chancellor Scholz, you will invite him and uh, also tell nice words to Americans as well. Let's see how it pans out in the future. But unfortunately, Polish politics uh, is very often based on the belief that if someone tells us a few nice words, it's tantamount to a signed agreement. Coming, uh, coming to the words of uh, Mr. Marek Budzic, the first thing is, what perspective uh, do you mean exactly? Uh, because uh, our forecasts, uh, our forecasting anything uh, for the next decade is very risky. Also, in terms of what is going to happen in Russia, we simply don't know that. Having those long uh, perspectives without short perspectives, having any plans uh, uh, in the short run, in the short run is very risky. What do we mean by this short perspective? What is this short perspective for Poland? Uh, there should be one, I believe, uh, uh, developing our own defense uh, uh, capabilities, uh, absolutely uh, the most important. What do we need in order to do that? Because it's nice, uh, it's nice, uh, it's a catchword, uh, uh, defending our our um, uh, defending our country, uh, writing down while well, the paper will accept everything. So uh, we can have it written down nicely, but in order to have this to these uh, this army, in order to have those tools, we need money. That's how the world is arranged. Uh, and please, please observe the public fine finance. Uh, Finance, uh, 260 billion Polish news lottery uh, pushed out of the of the budget and allocated by the prime minister in certain funds outside the budget. Please observe uh, the interest rates uh, of uh, the Polish bonds. Uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, to maintain them at the level of nine percent um, uh, abroad, uh, now seven percent, I believe. Uh, uh, 
but there was a there was this moment that we needed to offer nine percent, otherwise they wouldn't be they wouldn't be attractive at all, or we would have to denominate them in dollars with this uh, exchange rate risk. This is our reality, and our reality is about. Uh, and this reality is combined with all those funds spent on Ukraine. We, we, we have this dilemma that we have to resolve. In my opinion, and this mid-term perspective, we need to have an army that will, uh, will, be, uh, will be quite skillful in deterrence, will be, will be able to, um, to do that. Uh, in order to achieve this, we have to concentrate and focus on ourselves so that we have the necessary funds, money to reconstruct this army. Have we done enough for uh, Ukraine? Yes, I believe so. I think we've we've done more than uh, we, uh, we could or we should have. Uh, you may disagree. And in my opinion, uh, following on the same direction in the future is very risky for us in terms of our defense. Uh, and I'm still trying to catch another another notion in this discussion. Uh, I'm, there is something missing. Uh, when you take the military collaboration, uh, Marek, you use this um, uh, military alliance. What do you mean by that? Uh, do you mean here some bilateral agreement, uh, signing some bilateral agreement? That's very, very, uh, that's, that's very, um, for me, um, subject to, should be subject to a discussion because it could be quite risky, because it could be quite problematic and, and, uh, and hot for us. And there is also this uh, another notion that I believe was supposed to be the topic of this discussion. Uh, some plans for some political union. Yes, uh, that's what I am uh, talking about. Um, you may feel that I'm, I don't, that I'm addressing issues and questions um, that have not been asked during this discussion. Marek, you are just moving smoothly um, from, from the military uh, co collaboration and some other collaboration. What other collaboration? Do you mean a confederation, a federation, a, some union? What do you mean by that? I, you don't formulate your ideas clearly enough for me. I feel lost. Okay, editor, could you please address that? Well, well, my impression is just, just, just the opposite. I'm, I believe I'm very concrete. Uh, uh, whereas you, the, the observer, your observations are quite general, in my opinion. First of all, uh, the commission, um, uh, by uh, Yermak. Uh, uh, the chief of administration is Zelensky, uh, and the, together with the secretary general of uh, of NATO, uh, also invited to two Polish representative minister for Tuga and Ahmad uh, Adam Ed Everhal, and they have uh, come up with some uh, ideas and and uh, proposals uh, described as. Uh, Kiev security compact with a certain uh, security vision, regional security vision. This vision is uh, 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 has some foundations quite right, in my opinion. Ukraine still wants to be a member of the NATO pact. Of course, this document is long. I'm, I'm talking about it briefly. The Ukrainian politicians, uh, similar to Polish politicians, realize that it is not possible to have Ukraine in uh, NATO due uh, to, uh, uh, to lack of consent by some uh, of the members. So this immediate uh, accession of, uh, of Ukraine to the NATO is not possible. So we need some we need some um, some transition stage and some uh, some solution, uh, especially as uh, especially as uh, as uh, Ukraine keeps uh, fighting with Russia. And uh, the question is not to win the, this uh, this uh, war, but to secure peace in the region. Uh, this system of uh, the peace, of, um, peace deterrence uh, uh, started in on February the 24th collapsed. We have a proposal of bilateral uh, 
military alliances between parties willing to join such alliances. Of course, I mean here members of the of the NATO Pact. We uh, we hear from Ukraine talking about Poland, uh, Baltic states, uh, the the UK, uh, Tur 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 uh, Turkey. Uh, not that much, but uh, we don't hear Germany or France uh, as uh, um, suggested uh, parties to those alliance, those uh, um, agreements. So we have a certain project, an open formula that requires negotiations uh, between parties to this agreement. Um, so when you say that Poland is to be involved in the war and that Poland, uh, Poland uh, has obliged itself to send troops to this war is not justified. We have no, we have had no agreement, formal agreement to do so. And the starting point of this concept is uh, that uh, uh, that Poland and Central and Eastern Europe cannot be in this vacuum. There must be some contents to it, because this vacuum is very, maybe dangerous. When you ask me about uh, assisting Ukraine, I want to say that uh, we helped Ukraine because of altruism. We helped uh, and assisted Ukraine due to uh, to follow and to fulfill our Polish interest, uh, uh, as we didn't want uh, this vision of December the 19th uh, presented by Putin to come true. Putin, uh, we, we, we hear from Putin open statements about, uh, uh, about uh, economic uh, uh, collaboration and uh, this uh, idea. This is the Russian plan. We don't want this scenario to come true. And that's why we uh, support uh, the struggle to win the war and to secure peace in Ukraine. But in order to do that, we need a stable military system. Otherwise, we won't have any capital, um, any, any investment uh, available in Ukraine, and that will push uh, Ukraine to the margins uh, of, uh, of uh, development, economic development. Uh, and uh, that will not affect in no way, uh, that will uh, affect in no way France uh, or Germany because they have this buffer of Poland. They don't, they won't feel it. But I agree with you uh, when you when you question yourself, do we have a potential to, to support and to help? Uh, I, I, I don't know if there is this potential, but do we have any other choice? Can we uh, stand still doing nothing? Can we let Russians dominate the Central and Eastern Europe? Well, I don't believe we can. So for me, it is a guarantee our actions, guarantee the securing of the Polish interest. Of course, uh, you can choose one way or another to deliver the final outcome. But we have to observe and follow our Polish interest. We know that uh, all the parties to this conflict uh, have their particular individual interests uh, and they want to maintain their positions and they are open to a certain agreement. Let's take Germany, for instance. That's very true for Germany. But in my opinion, this is not realistic, uh, even though, uh, though uh, an easier way. So for me, there are two directions and two ways. And that was decided on February the 24th by Putin. One is dangerous, full of uh, challenges. Uh, 
for the risks. The war to create a system of stabilizing the Central and Eastern European region with Poland as a central player and uh, the other one is not to do anything and to wait for Putin or his successor to start what to start another game that he started on February 24th without this buffer of uh, Ukraine. But then, the, uh, then the process may be less advantageous for Poland. And then it is now. So there are two ways we are ahead of. And there is this uh, clear problem that we have to exceed our potential. I would like our GDP to be at the level of Spain, of course when uh, uh, joining some actions but we have we we don't shape uh, this uh, perspective this landscape uh, putin did that in december and we have to adjust uh, to this thank you i would like to step in to this discussion as politicians uh, should listen to experts uh, please editor Editor Budrish, uh, I remember uh, the arguments of uh, uh, Editor Vajecha and three areas there. The first area is um, about the complexity of the project. Uh, it's quite a bitter observation. The Polish, the, the Polish political, uh, the, the, the Polish po Polish politicians are incapable of dealing uh, with with number of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, the second uh, area is our weakness, uh, economic, economical, uh, economic weakness. Uh, and the third area is the unwillingness of Ukraine to follow on the, uh, this, uh, to follow this dire the direction. So let's address the last one. Yes, you can. We don't know anything about uh, about the future um, attitude of the um, of the Ukrainian public. However, we still have to um, work to maintain the state of odds, the state of uh, the, the situation, the current situation. We have. Uh, we know now that uh, over fifty percent of the respondents to questionnaires uh, uh, want among Ukrainians who want close relations between Poland and U Ukraine. 18% uh, want a federation, as, um, meaning a, a solution on a national level. Let me put it this way. Please don't use uh, fixed uh, solutions to what is now, uh, is now being shaped. Uh, the European Union itself uh, is a uh, is a living organism adjusting to uh, various challenges. Uh, some things have need reformulation due to uh, new challenges. We mm, don't have to agree with all the directions that the life takes. Uh, but life does not subject itself to our definitions, formal, legal definitions. It's just the other way around. With this uh, phenomenon, I mean, I observe the same kind of phenomenon this way. So in my opinion, we will see a new system, a new, a new, pers new landscape. Uh, addressing the second uh, area you have tackled, uh, I, um, I represent the generation that represents the 80s. Poland uh, used to be uh, one of the poorest uh, uh, countries in Europe. The GDP per capita were poor. We were poorer than uh, Turkey at that time, even though Turkey uh, was not uh, was not a dynamically developing country at that at that time. Uh, over the years, with a huge effort of uh, the whole Polish society, we have. Uh, we have um, we have reached the second position in the world in terms of the dynamism of changes and development uh, uh, with China at the top. Uh, 
So you hear a lot about China and their advances and, uh, and their development, their dynamism. You don't hear about Poland, unfortunately. So I believe that uh, we're, we, are, we can do it. I remember in this Republican character of politics. What do I mean by that? The Poles set the framework for the political class, uh, the, uh, the landscape, shape the situation, and uh, the framework of uh, political behavior. And the Polish society has shaped, uh, has given the shape to uh, to this uh, assistance, Polish assistance to Ukraine. I sh of course, I'm, I share this skepticism whether or not we can address and uh, meet all the challenges. But I'm talking about the Polish uh, society and I appeal to the Polish society and I hope that we will be able to see the situation as a challenge and an opportunity and a chance not as an obstacle because for me it is needed because it uh, motivates uh, the effort uh, of, uh, of our young generations. That's what I base my uh, con conviction on, that we should follow this direction. We will see the finally in 15 years. Maybe it will be a union, or maybe some military alliance, Maybe we will have uh, yet another formula that we don't even know yet, don't we even have yet, but from demographic, uh, military, uh, uh, security-oriented points of view, the Polish position uh, um, within the European Union, from those perspectives, I believe this is the direction we should follow, because it's realistic, we can prepare that, we can develop that, uh, and uh, uh, this, those directions address the existing problems. Uh, we uh, don't. We don't want to call it uh, uh, Ukraine fo files. That's how I perceive this. Uh, uh, these issues. Editor Vajaka. Um, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Uh, talk about the, mo the, main, the main arguments. Okay, so um, we, we have some historic arguments and our published experience. I remember, Yashin, you, I remember you talking about Yashinitsa and the Aguilonian politics and the problems that it resulted in for Poland. And, but but uh, coming back to the 14th century, the Yagyar War. I hear those uh, voices. I can see certain similar similarities, uh, historic similarities to what is happening now. On the other hand, uh, we, uh, we have this huge potential of joining forces with the Ukraine against the Russian power. We remember that from the history. There are others who believe that the accumulation of Polish, the climax of the Polish uh, problems uh, date back to our quarrels and arguments with China and Ukraine. This problem has been generated by the Poland's, by Poland's ruling class. Now, if we translate it on contemporary times, if we created a project like this, we would have to face the um, economic uh, problems of Ukraine. But if Russia attacks, uh, then uh, both our countries with uh, I don't know, 38 million people and Poland with the same number of people plus the military capabilities, they have a lot of experience accumulating a great deal of equipment equipment, so this would be definitely a benefit. On top of that come demographic questions. 
and also the economic problems. These are the flip on the they are on the flip side of the coin. You would have to see the potential problems in terms of food supply, and Ukraine has a huge potential in that. And Poland can offer access to the EU common market. So history didn't always uh, or wasn't always negative. Sometimes it was quite positive. So there are pros and cons in this story. And Mr. Buji is also sad that Ukraine without us would have fallen. And if Ukraine falls, we'll have a plenty, a great deal of problems. And then. This question goes to Mr. Vazak. Okay, we can always dream on and uh, try to visualize the Haja Union coming to existence, but it did not. So, to oversimplify things, Pavel Yashchenitsa says that if we didn't have to deal with Moscow, if we didn't turn towards east. That's oversimplification of my part, by the way. But since we have arrived to this point in our discussion, my belief is that we put it outside of context, as if we were based on this famous book of by Ambassador Lukashevich from 1938, Poland is a superpower. Poland is not a superpower, and uh, basically the question is who is taking part in this war? We are not free to maneuver, neither can Ukraine do it, but Ukraine sometimes enjoys much more leeway than Poland can, as we could have seen in the problem in Trevodov and the Ukrainian missile that fell down, there was a difference in opinions between the White House and Kiev. So who participates? Who's playing this game? The US, China and Russia as a partner that is basically plummeting down. It used to have been Russia versus USA and today it's USA versus China only. And I believe that our decision-making capabilities, being realistic, I'm sorry to prick that balloon, the ability to carry out large projects hinges solely on the support by the US for those projects. Some of my opponents, Rafał Ziemkiewicz including, who spent a very beautiful vision of Poland in his book, uh, more believe, uh, believe that the US policy in this part of Europe has been unwavering, has been set firmly and will never change. When I read this, I can see those pictures from evacuation of evacuation of Saigon, those helicopters taken off from the roofs of of the buildings with poor Vietnamese trying to actually uh, capture uh, the uh, the parts of the helicopters. It was really a terrible picture to see. So we should not be convinced that we are laying our hopes on a super firm foundation. We used to have concerns before about the US policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine in uh, the light of the congressional voting. We found that it's not that bad and the Republicans um, uh, outnumbering Democrats in the Congress has not been so big. And let's see, let's assume that the Republicans keep their uh, margin in the uh, House of Representatives and a Republican president prevails in the next election, can anyone assume firmly and surely that the foundation that we base our 
deliberation and so on, uh, will still hold on because I'm I'm absolutely unsure of that. What should be the prior priority for Poland is what comes from the old adage: if you can count, you should count on yourself. So we should focus on our own economic capabilities and do the utmost for those capabilities to give us a strong armed forces going forward. The next question of uh, bilateral alliances that can draw us into the war or actually deter an aggressor, because that's the flip side, and it's also possible, is uh, a something going forward very, uh, very many years into the future. The hegemon has a very important front to cover, namely that in China, around Taiwan. We cannot develop that topic because we're running out of time. But I believe that the uh, Communist Party of China's Congress and the next uh, term in office of Xi Jinping were absolutely fundamental things because it sets the stage uh, the world politics for at least a decade. So we don't want, we don't uh, know what China does and how they would preoccupy the US if in Beijing a guy comes to pr prominence who's got the biggest power since the time of Mao. All right, I think we should wrap up now. Uh, so one minute to summarize. To summarize. I'd say that there are definitely converging points between us because I do not um, question uh, the overall assistance to Ukraine. I wish that Ukraine wins the war, but I, uh, we need to define victory in that conflict. But I would be in favor of realism. We should not hope that Russia collapses within a couple of years ahead of us. Of course, we should and we must support Ukrainians. We should keep fingers crossed for them. But when I'm reading how many of my fellow colleagues, Ukrainians, say that I am in favor of Ukraine, I would say I am siding with Poland instead. And the final word from Mr. Budzic. Well, I repeated several times that I side with Poland too, but I, do, I read the Polish interests slightly differently. Count on yourself means, in my perception, the it means striving to a certain security system that guarantees that Vladimir Putin is not going to stand alongside the borders on Poland, which are now the borders of the Kaliningrad region and the U Belarus and Ukraine. We don't have much time left to reinforce and to strengthen ourselves. Therefore, we we'll need to overplay our hand, so to speak, slightly at least. But it is not due to the fact that we are guided by romantic spirit, but it results from the original calculation that Vladimir Putin changed dramatically on the 24th of February. And even if Ukraine wins that war, uh, there is no guarantee that scenario materializes. There is no guarantee that Russia departs from the political vision that Putin had formulated. And if he is not in power, a successor would follow it through as well. So this is the biggest problem that we confronted with. So this is the problem that we need to address and resolve. Because this threat will determine our ability and the time frame for us to become stronger. 
So my conclusion is in order to uh, pursue the policy that is closer to Wokash, we need to realize the consequence of this current calculus and not the other way around, because in Moscow and other capital cities, people will do the utmost to prevent Poland from making that quantum leap and becoming Uh, or playing the same league uh, as uh, Italy or Spain when it comes to well-being in Europe. Now, I've been following uh, politics and I devoted the whole chapter in my book to that. I mean the American politics. Even though the US politics is fluctuating and I am of the opinion that those fluctuations are not that big as some journalists would wish to see. I would say, I would argue that America is not going to relinquish Europe because having done that, they would not be able to construct a new a security alliance in Eastern Asia. This is because of the Saigon memories. Nixon have relinquished, has relinquished his strategic allies in Asia, and now America needs to restore or build its credibility as an ally, which means that uh, it will not give up Europe, although it may be forced to fight onto France. So before that happens, we need to make uh, to utilize the time fully and to build armed forces strong enough that are capable of repelling the Russian aggression when it, the time comes. Can we do it hand in hand with the Germans or French? No, we can do it only with those who evaluate the security situation in a similar way they have who have experienced army and have people who are willing to fight. Thank you very much. We had Lukasz Wojcicki and Marek Budzisz on the stage. Thank you for a tremendous discussion. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me to the conference on the clash of cultures in the EU by Mr. Patrick Yaki, MEP. The topic of the conference is a very important question worth discussing in detail. This is because today in the EU we have to measure up to many challenges, and one of them is the question about the future of the EU. What this future will be like and how Poland could co-shape it. Can we see it in the bright colors or are there still many problems and challenges ahead of us? Can Poland find its place in the changing European Union that, uh, and with some of those changes being detrimental from our point of view? I believe that European Union is worth fighting for, and I think it is worthwhile to care, to care for the future of the EU. I believe that the place of Poland is within the European structures, but if we speak about when we speak about Poland strong Poland in the, the EU and the, about the EU supporting our interest we need to work very hard uh, and I would call it even a fight we see many unfavorable tendencies and within the EU 
some of them are the federalistic tendencies that is imposing the will of stronger countries over the weaker ones and uh, imposing e egoistic interests. On the other hand, we perceive a culture offensive promoting an ideology that has nothing in common with the roots of the European Union, an ideology that undermines dignity of every person and uh, especially undermines uh, the dignity of life from conception to that. It also destroys social cohesion. So this is something we should uh, counteract. But our answer to neither of those phenomena, including the attempt by certain countries to impose uh, that vision of Poland using sometimes economic blackmail, this is something we cannot accept, but we cannot leave the battlefield, given it to the opponents. Today we see a in-depth conflict about whether Poland is capable of pursuing its own interests and rights. Can Poland enforce what the treaties and then undeniably allow Poland to do? Can we achieve that in this conflict. Today, it is not possible to give an answer to that question yet. But if we want Poland to counteract those unfavorable processes within the EU and put up a fight for our own interests, we, not, we must not give the battlefield. We cannot withdraw, we need to put up a strong fight, even if we are fully aware that on the other side there are institutions and, uh, and bodies that respect all the uh, rights and, and duties and behaves fair towards us. Over the past, where Poland defended Europe and at the end of 16th, uh, sorry, 17th century and in 1920, we have not asked whether our enemies are playing a fair game. We put up a strong fight instead. And today it's again the time where we have to put up a fight for our interest and in diplomacy delineating clearly the borders prescribed by the treaties and we cannot give up the battlefield the battlefield responsibility of every politician who is in favor of the polish interest is to do the utmost that the obligations that the eu undertook are enforced next year we will see elections in Poland, and we must not allow that the EU institutions decide uh, about the outcome. Such decisions must remain in the Polish hands, so it is definitely worthwhile to, to put a fight, and this is what we're going to do in the EU. We want to put up a fight for the brilliant future of the European Union and the fair position of Poland in this international institution.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next panel. We will talk about the future of Poland in Europe. Uh, in Europe, uh, Dr. Marcin Kędzierski. We also have remote uh, um, panelists, uh, um, Mr. Andrzej Kędzierski, um, on the added entry of the uh, Rzeczy, uh, Paweł Lisicki. Welcome. We hope that, yes, it's now we can see our guests. Uh, <clears throat> the first uh, doctor, I would like you, I would like to address you with the first uh, question and uh, the Polishness, the question about Polishness. Before we start talking about the future of Poland in the European Union and in this part of the of the region of the world, I, I would like to ask uh, for your definition of Polishness, uh, maybe some objective criteria, uh, a brief answer as a starting point of our discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, so you want me to warm up the audience. Uh, it is very difficult to define something that is uh, self-evident. Uh, if you ask anyone in the street uh, what Polishness is, uh, we feel that it's something uh, obvious, natural. Defining that, then, therefore, is uh, a difficult uh, task. Uh, but uh, for me, Polishness is a community, uh, is being together in history, in tradition, in mentality, behavior, the way we think, the way we act. So you can see various uh, various uh, aspects of uh, of this uh, of this term. That's what makes us a, a single nation with separate uh, communities within. We know that countries are, are composed of many nations sometimes. Uh, so the, but uh, at the end of the, uh, of the day, we all call uh, ourselves Poles. And we live uh, at the Vistula River. That's how I would define that. Thank you very much for your definition, Doctor. Dr. Lishitsky, uh, Editor Lishitsky, I, uh, could you address this question and the thing we discussed yesterday? Can we talk about Polishness uh, in general? How do you perceive uh, those notions? Can, do you, are there any criteria of Polishness? Well, for me, this question is very hard uh, because this is a question about uh, the essence of a nation. And there are many such factors. Uh, we can name them and uh, try then to compare those two uh, the qualities and features of other nations. So we have two um, instruments, two tools. Uh, we can try to define to define the Polishness and then compare this definition to other nations. And that's how we get to the essence. Of course, it's a hypothetical action. What distinguishes us as Poles? Uh, our language, our culture, our roots, memory, and certain values. The values that Poles uh, perceive as theirs values identified and rooted in our culture, the freedom, the freedom of speech, the freedom as a virtue, a worth losing in battles, worth fighting for, and worth um, struggling with those stronger than us. Uh, we can't forget about Catholicism. Uh, the Prince uh, Paulan Mieszko uh, to baptize, uh, and, uh, was baptized from Rome uh, with the intermediary of Czech and uh, Germany. So in this, res in this uh, respect, uh, uh, there are Latin elements, G Roman elements uh, present in our Polishness, uh, 
and the influence of our eastern and western neighbors. And uh, that's how we come up to the idea of what characterizes us as Poles. Uh, and then we can compare ourselves to other nations, uh, uh, to Germans who were present not only in the west of Poland, but also historically in the north of Poland, in the south of Poland, in various formulas. Uh, and our eastern neighbors, Russia, then there is this religious dimension and our uh, and our attitude towards uh, uh, towards the uh, rulers. We don't have uh, the time for a lecture, but let's just take uh, uh, the uh, representatives of Germany, Kant, Hegel, um, at the time of the Polish partitions. They said that there was some freedom in Poland, but this freedom was not very powerful. One of them even, uh, even uh, once said uh, uh, something even further. They, they perceived Poles uh, from the perspective of our approach towards uh, freedom. For them, those strangers, it was uh, it was uh, some we were different uh, the Tsar Russia uh, they, um, uh, at the times of Catherine the uh, second uh, those uh, uh, represented this uh, superiority uh, approach towards our values. Uh, so our opponents perceived some per, perceived our values of, as uh, as our weaknesses, elements of chaos n that needs to be uh, dismantled, needs to be that needs to be uh, improved or got rid of. That's what I would uh, say. Dr. Kędzierski, how do you perceive the issue of Polishness? Can you end up with uh, any objective definition of that? Well, it depends what Polishness you mean, because uh, well, the definition will vary when you, depending on which generation you ask. Uh, the inhabitants of which part of, of the country you, you will ask. But uh, the common denominator would be the language and, uh, and our um, historic herit uh, in inheritance, heritage, uh, flexibility, anti-institutionalism, adaptability to be euphemic. And that distinguishes us uh, clearly from countries such as uh, Germany, but not only, also other Western countries. Uh, our, the way we treat freedom, the way, so let me repeat, the language, the anti-institutionalism and flexibility towards procedures. Thank you very much. Uh, let's let's not now address the issue of the future of Poland. Uh, of course, we want the world be. We want we we all want Poland to be wealthy and uh, rich. Um, Dr. Krajewski, could you share with us your opinion on uh, the possible future of the power of Poland? Uh, in this dynamic geopolitical, uh, on this uh, dynamic geopolitical arena, what can we do uh, to to invite uh, this well-being to our country? Okay, this is a this is a um, this is a very important moment. Uh, February the twenty fourth has set the uh, has is a turning point of our history. Everything is going a different direction uh, compared to what we thought a year ago. 
um, a great uh, opportunity on the one hand and a huge challenge on the other. But I would go beyond. And the dimension Poland should go in the future, in my opinion, first. The European Union was uh, created based on two internal, uh, two internal uh, risks and one external risk. Uh, first of all, the, the common the community, the European community in the beginning and then evolved into the European Union, was created to stop the military ideolo and ideological expansion of the Soviet Union and uh, to make sure that, uh, the, that Europe is, stands uh, st strong compared to, uh, the, to America. And uh, the other reason was to avoid uh, some military expansion. These are the sources of the creation of this uh, community. And now we have this uh, quite strange déjà vu, as uh, certain scenarios are repeated, even though not so directly and not so precisely. We have a threat from the east, uh, from Russia, uh, that can be pushed far to the east. Uh, the United States uh, uh, entered into the internal matters and affairs of Europe very much. Uh, and thirdly, for, for several years, uh, the position of the European Union has uh, been improved and strengthened. By till 90s, uh, till 90s, uh, France, uh, France was, had a decisive voice. Uh, in uh, in the subject matters, European subject matters, it is now changing. And then after after 1990s, uh, after 1990, Germany had a decisive voice. So it's a turning point right now. Um, the European Union or the Community European Community, I, will, I prefer this term, is much broader. It is. In our Polish interest to come back to the roots, to weaken Russia, to to bring back the equality, to bring back the equilibrium in the community, coming back to the roots, to main directions of uh, our actions. Poland should be a conglomerate of uh, of, uh, of one economic body and bringing back the balance of power uh, and securing securing a decisive uh, decisive voice uh, for Poland when it comes to the eastern politi politics okay when you talk about Russia it's self-evident now but uh, we hope that uh, the business as usual policy will not be repeated, but how can we weaken the influence of Germany? The Visegrad group, what do you mean by that? Maybe otherwise, um, because Germany is uh, the strongest uh, state within the European Union. Um, and. Uh, it is not uh, certain that uh, Germany will stay weak uh, for long. Of course it's not, because Germany is very strong economically. But the decision-making process uh, in the European Union is a very complex structure. And what uh, matters here is that the main strategic decisions uh, based on the treaties uh, uh, are made um, in, the, um, uh, in the European uh, Council. And the majority, I, I, I don't, I can't uh, quote the, to make the European Commis Commission, Commission do something, you need a given majority. So you have to have an alliance with uh, Germany or with another state uh, to uh, secure the right result of the voting. So, so we believe that uh, 
uh, that its majority can be can be won with the participation of uh, of the central and eastern uh, European states. Uh, uh, we know that the interest of Germany and France is very uh, similar. Well, not necessarily. Yeah, but I know that the structure is quite complex. Um, uh, Editor Lishitsky, uh, could you address uh, the issue already mentioned uh, that Poland uh, can can use this geopolitical um, environment uh, uh, and take in the processes uh, occurring for a uh, several several months uh, with the involvement of uh, the United States and uh, and a certain bankruptcy of the of the policy of Germany how do you perceive that from are you an optimist or a pessimist uh, when it comes to the Polish future how can we struggle for our interests how should we Act assertive in, a, in an assertive way, or should be rather defensive. Before I, I answer this question, I, I want to make a comment. The European Union was created to, to make sure to make sure the right position to secure the right position of uh, Europe against the United States. Yes, uh, uh, Seal and Coal uh, Community. Uh, yes, the, these are the beginnings. Uh, but please don't forget that it was an American project uh, uh, carried out in uh, in Europe. The first head of uh, what we call now the European Union. Walter Hallstein was not only uh, not only the um, uh, the Wehrmacht uh, German Wehrmacht uh, lieutenant lieutenant, but then he was he was he was a lawyer engaged in the Nazi movement, and unfortunately he participated in all those projects of creating new Europe. But then. He returned in 1945 after the denazification process was finished, and he was sent here and to head the university in Frankfurt, and then became the first uh, chairman of uh, of this European project responsible in front of the United Nations. Uh, so, actually, so, so in fact, this was a. American project. Uh, it was funded uh, uh, funded uh, uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation. The money get, went to uh, and it was supported by by American various um, American forces. Uh, so it's the European Union or European Community, as you call it, uh, was originally an American project. Uh, let me quote uh, one thing. Jean Monnet's uh, memoirs, uh, the main creator of the European Union, uh, uh, written down in 1976, uh, at the very end of his life, uh, showing perfectly well what the European Union was supposed to be and what the objectives in front of him were. He once wrote, was I clear enough that the community we have created is not the, uh, is not the, the objective itself, uh, because we need some new area for solving and resolving our problems. It's just a stage, a stage in formulating our future. So you can see, you can from this perspective, you can see that so the European Union was a global project serving as an instrument in delivering a greater project. Uh, and therefore, the description of uh, reality uh, true for Poland and dominant in Poland uh, uh, when that claims that uh, that the European Union is only uh, solely a German creature to oppose uh, some some political um, and international opponents. Uh, and, uh, well, honestly speaking, is is for me is um, is not uh, justifiable and not real from the very beginning. Let's follow the figures. Germany are 
supported by the US. Germany hosts the Rammstein, the, the biggest uh, um, naval, uh, the biggest air base. So, um, so I think that what you are presenting is not very real. It's like like a Polish concept. Uh, uh, control, uh, uh, the control, the the German and American control uh, over uh, over the European Union is quite is quite strong, whereas uh, I don't follow certain of some of some of the some of the claims uh, here. And now coming back to your questions, my question whether the war, or rather more of aggression by Russia and Ukraine poses new opportunities for Poland. Well, I don't see that. I believe that the EU utilizes or uses um, that war and to enforce on Poland departure from the vestiges of sovereignty. Poland exceeded the EU in the belief that EU is a project entailing uh, the Europe of homelands, which will support economic exchange and so on. But whatever is important for Poland, namely the national identity, remains firmly in Poland's hand. That has changed, though. The tendency that Jean Monnet in his memoirs uh, is predominant now. It is the federative federative project that Brussels tries to impose on everyone and uh, this conflict in Ukraine serves not to um, on the sorry the, the support the Polish identity but to use it as a leverage on Poland even stronger and also bearing the cost of refugees as used by uh, the EU and instead of granting us what uh, Poland has the right for, namely the structural funds and uh, national recovery plan, is uh, treated as a leverage. So I am afraid that Poland is not benefiting from this war in the European Union. Now the final question is what to do in this situation. What kind of policy should we pursue? To me, it seems that whatever we attempted to do in the past two years make it make those years a waste. We try to build a sovereign position and to find allies against the German Franco domination since February sorry since December last year this policy disappeared Poland subscribed to all the demands of Brussels the most important of that was money for uh, the rule of in exchange for rule of law that equipped the Commission with mechanisms that it didn't have previously. The second thing was that fit for 55 that all Poland also subscribed to, which uh, makes Poland depart from our greatest strength, namely the coal based uh, power generation and therefore also energy security. And on top of the statements that we are going to defend ourselves, I don't see any sensible policy being made. On the contrary, the last three years I see as a string of concessions. The capitulation, dragged in time capitulation of Poland and bowing to the demands of Brussels augmented by the current war in Ukraine. Can we revert this process? Can we make a U-turn or uh, the only thing we can do is to slow this process down? Because we see the ongoing discussion about the national restoration plan. One group, well, one group says that we need to oppose it vehemently and the other one only the concessive Politic policy 
can bring us benefits. So given your opinion on the EU policy, which is which can be summarized as um, in the words of the of the German uh, AP, hungering Poland, can we revert this process or is everything lost? No. In politics, nothing is lost forever. First of all, however, you need to define your objectives. What is the Polish goal? I base my opinion on various official statements of the Polish authorities. And if the Prime Minister says, and I heard uh, quite a string of those statements concerning the NRP money to the effect that, oh, by the way, they are con contradictory one to another. And the last year ago, Prime Minister said that Poland is about to receive a huge injection of money t for Poland to build its well-being on and uh, even he used the words a second Marshall plan. Later, he said that Poland does not need that money. Poland can do without it. They, this, that money is uh, not important. The next statement was that everybody who undermines the sense of Poland as, uh, 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 sorry, as uh, receiving that money is a national traitor because we need that money as oxygen. So my uh, wish is to know how Poland is faring, what situation are we in? Because over the past two years, we have had absolutely contradictory statements by the Prime Minister. If Poland were able to acquire that money without a major economic disruption, that would mean that our leeway is much greater than we have assumed. That would mean that we have committed a gravest error without, uh, by not using uh, at least two veto mechanisms, for example. But in other um, portfolios like taxes and politics, the EU seeks support by Poland. So we should define the areas that are very important for Brussels and to consider if Poland indeed possesses uh, the force, the strength to make Brussel, Brussels yield to Polish uh, demands. Nothing is ever closed and we should also seek other countries' support for the Polish Polish interest. Thank you for that. Next question goes to Dr. Kędzierski. What is your take on the future country with respect to the processes that we have described? The war in Ukraine, modernization, also federation processes in the EU. And the follow up question how to make this future brighter? so that we have a absolutely opulent and well of country. Well, I think that this question um, mandates a lecture rather than 10 minute statement. What is very important that Mr. Lyshitsky said that were the memoirs of uh, Jean Monnet, but the most important thing is that Brussels is evolving in the EU too. And back in 2004, it was a different being than it is now. But the, quest, the, the, the point is that it ceased to change by means of treaties. The last treaty, Lisbon Treaty, transferred a lot of competencies from the intergovernmental level to the European Commission and other institutions that are supra-governmental rather than intergovernmental. So a new elite was formed in uh, the EU that sometimes acts counter to the interests of, of the European states. So I believe that the question about who is stronger, Germany or France, is uh, unimportant because the EU started to become an independent player. 
Also, Germany is growing weaker. We can see it, we could have seen it from 2017 after the uh, Brexit. Now, the war in Ukraine and uh, severing uh, the lines of supply of cheap Russian raw materials is another thing. Also, Beijing is going to push out the German industrial products, uh, i.e. cars, from the Chinese market. So the two sources of wealth being in Germany has been severed. severed. So I believe that this would result in chaos in Germany going forward. And if we look at German politics right now, it is quite chaotic already. So I, uh, to the question, about the directions of the EU, I would say that it is very uh, much dependent on the institutions. Uh, the President von der Leyen spoke about building uh, the EU's geopolitical position. Although the EU has no strong cards in their hands, it could still have, uh, it still has some instruments, some thing like GDRP that we, or GPRD directive, that we've seen uh, enacted or caused the Americans and the Chinese to observe this regulation. Also, the carbon duty that was imposed makes the Americans and others to adjust to the EU climate policy if they want access to the EU market. The same goes for the Poles, though. But if we look back at what happened in the past two years, we can conclude that the pandemic and also this wartime turmoil and the increase in profitability of uh, bonds and the ability to acquire money outside of the EU market uh, shrinks the leeway for the uh, for the um, for the uh, European countries. Um, Prime Minister Maloney concluded that she cannot afford anymore to go to war against Brussels because she needs money. Now we see also Prime Minister Morawiecki's statement, which I think is uh, very much connected with the situation where bonds that could not be couldn't be floated and suddenly we did a u-turn and uh, conclude that we need that EU money desperately so i would say if i would if i were to bank on the um on the future of the european union i think it would be a core with uh, western europe with two peripheries southern and eastern e the the east sorry the southern periphery with which will be more important. And with one periphery, there might be no room for the other. So this is what we have seen since 2015. From the Polish perspective, according to researchers, it seems that the researchers who propose a model for development for Poland this model that Poland pursue has been a dependent model. The Polish exports exports went up, but as well uh, did the, um, the the revenues of the uh, foreign companies located in Poland. So the profit, the revenues from that exports, two thirds of the export revenues. Uh, goes to the foreign companies in Poland. Now, this process increased in, in importance. Prime Minister Morawiecki attempted to conduct a more sovereign policy, but according to the data since 2018, the level of dependence of the Polish economy of uh, foreign internationals increased and I think that we cannot depart from that road unless we decide to actually deteriorate this condition of our economy which the Poles will not agree to. 
So economically, we are fully dependent on access to the EU market. 80% of exports go there. If we, if we um, made pull exit, we would have still comply with the energy policy of the EU. Even the Americans have to comply. So the question is what to do. I think we are going to carry to shoulder the costs of the EU climate policy, but the only thing that is left for us is to acquire funds from the EU. So coming back to the beginning of your statements, if the EU becomes a international institution, it must also fund it on the perception that it has some say. Therefore, Poland's government will not have any chance to obtain the RNP and structural funds. The EU Commission, the EC, will do their utmost to exert the pressure to change the, the uh, authorities, to change the party in power in Poland. And when that happens, we will receive the funds. Excuse me for interjecting. And what happens if the, there will be no shift in the authorities and the, those in power? What happens, in your opinion, when the united right will reign for the third term in office? Blocking the NRP and also the structural firm will strengthen anti-EU positions in Poland. Well, I don't want to draw comparisons to the e, uh, the Great Britain to the UK, uh, but if this happens, namely the funds are blocked, uh, anti-European sentiments will arise in Poland, and I think it will be very disadvantageous for Poland because even outside the EU will have to pay the carbon duty, but without being compensated for this in form of EU funds. Of course, there is the question of sovereignty, and the Germans do believe that sovereignty is the ability to pursue their interests. And if something curbs our interests, our abilities to pursue our interests, and also curbs the ability to follow the politics, engage in politics, I'm not going to say that the EU is about to change our power structure. I believe that as long as the United Right is in power, those funds will remain blocked. I believe that only the shift in powers will unblock those funds. So that's the, my diagnosis of the situation and the description of the relations between Poland, Warsaw and Brussels. So I believe that Commission is uh, playing into the hands of those who want to Poland to exit the EU. Excuse me, I want to comment on what the previous speaker said. I think we could describe it fairly, uh, what we can also describe it similarly, are the behavior of the Polish people under the Prussian uh, occupation. Prussia was the biggest economic partner, and uh, all the policies that ran counter to that were, were, det were detrimental. So any attempts uh, thinking in the categories of freedom and uh, independence and liberties would have been out of place at those times. From your analysis, it seems, that's how I read it, that the uh, European Commission is going to decide about the composition of the power of Poland's government. And it seems that it is in the Polish people's interest to accept that. Well, I don't see any difference uh, from the situation in the partitions. Why do we need elections at all? Why should Poles bother and elect anybody if it is the EU which decides who is going to be appointed? And if we don't like it, there is the only wave in front of us, namely the poll exit, and we are going to lose out on it.
Dr. Krajewski. Uh, we are about, uh, the, the time for the discussion is about to end, but we still have a moment. Doctor, how do you perceive, what do you think about the, the what do you think about those uh, opinions uh, and uh, um, the, Euro the European Union is changing. We uh, we know that we know so notice this. Uh, Poland is changing, of course, too. Uh, how do we play? What rules do we follow to uh, to make our interests come true? And do we need a coalition with France and or Germany? Uh, on the maximum uh, prices uh, and gas prices, so we uh, we could block. Uh, uh, our partners, uh, uh, are we doomed to play with the, with those partners? Is there any other alternative, or is there is, isn't there any other alternative? Uh, I would like to address many 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 issues here, but I know that we don't have enough time. Since the very beginning of uh, the European, uh, I I've, I clearly see that we disagree uh, in terms of many many things. Uh, the visioners' opinions uh, from the past do not shape the the, the, the the picture now, and the European Union the, the European Union shape was was uh, determined uh, was by, by by De Gaulle and and other pol politicians, uh, so that France did not have to be did not have to be in the in the background of Europe uh, uh, to make France influential. Uh, in terms of the European politics. Uh, but let's leave it aside, because uh, we may keep talking about that, and the, the, the tale would be very long. Uh, Poland uh, cannot find itself in the European Union very well. You can, you can see it clearly. We feel uh, hurt. Uh, we believe that we deserve the funds. Of course we deserve the funds. We should get the funds uh, uh, due to the provisions of the treaties. Uh, but there are some nuances, uh, uh, things uh, that, uh, that uh, accompany the, the national recovery plan and the, the budgets. Uh, for the coming budgetary uh, term were all results of the Polish policy. policy. Um, you can find uh, provisions written down in the treaties, and that's how it works. Uh, so this uh, foreign uh, foreign policy, uh, policy is not very, we're not very fluent and sm it's not very smooth. Uh, so do we find our way in the European Union? Not very well. We feel uh, we feel hurt. We feel that we do not get what we deserve, what we should get. Uh, um, on the other hand, uh, there isn't this potential uh, in Poland to come back to negotiations. We just uh, defend it. We we'll leave the negotiations. We never come back. Uh, uh, whereas the the cost the cost of this is very huge. Uh, one thing remains. So one thing, one 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 direction remains: playing by the by the existing rules, but playing efficiently by the existing rules. Uh, we have some concrete uh, concrete uh, principles governing the elections and and the voting, and that's something we can't change. So we can play by those rules. But are you sure? Are you sure those rules really exist? Uh, maybe maybe there are there are some frauds here. Yet another thing, but these are technicalities. The European Commission uh, has much freedom in action, and the European Commission is now uh, is now is, is now a, a an institution that plays a major role in uh, executing, uh, hours, and, but acting in collaboration with the European Council. We have the example of, of example of the the of the gas prices limits, very, a uh, very, very, uh, a huge coalition of European countries has uh, need wants uh, the limits to be there. There are some opponents like Germany. Uh, Austria and Hungary and the European Commission applies obstruction. The European Council has the majority, but the European Commission has some tools to sabotage this process. It's a, um, it's a process of uh, forcing certain things uh, by small steps. And the European Commission 
The European Commission is supervised by, by another body that is composed of uh, heads of uh, states composing the, that, that the European Union consists of. Uh, we have two ways to choose. We can look for allies in those touch points. Um, let's take France. Uh, there are certain subject matters we agree on with France, uh, so nuclear power, plants, uh, the prices of oil, to name just a few. Um, our relation with uh, Russia and the France, French, uh, French opinion in this, in this, in this actually evolves is evolving now. The, we know that France and uh, and uh, France and, and Germany uh, used to and still do rule the European Union. Agility, yeah, but every agility also has its limits. Because agility is about being co building coalitions, but uh, uh, when developing any coalitions, you will you will find uh, some uh, some uh, obstacles. Uh, we can see voices from from um, from Germany, uh, and uh, for example, the European Union wants to eliminate the veto, the right of veto, the right to block anything by smaller countries. Um, Bigger countries will have more, more power, and smaller smaller states within the European Union will have less influence, less power. We need to find our way in this. Uh, otherwise, we'll be degraded. Our role will be really degraded. Uh, Dr. Lish, uh, Lishitsky, editor Lishitsky, are there any chances for us in in the European Union uh, in of this of this shape? Uh, if if uh, this uh, this principle of the European Union was uh, eliminated, are are there any chances for us uh, in the new reality after two thousand and four, or present and in the future? A small detail before I answer your question, but I would like to. Uh, Jean Reno was no, no visioner. He was he was uh, he was nominated by one of the French generals, uh, and uh, uh, he was responsible in France for for the foreign uh, policy uh, that was created by Schuman. He was no visioner. He was a politician. Uh, he involved in the process of creating and shaping, uh, developing the European Union. I find it quite uh, find this question very difficult. Your question very difficult. Uh, the Polish policy towards uh, the European Union uh, since 2004, our accession to the European Union. Please remember that uh, we acceded. Uh, I acceded the European Union on the following different terms that there was there was the Nice Treaty. Poland wanted to defend its uh, position. Uh, we had some power uh, stemmed from um, related to the our pop uh, population uh, similar to Spain. We uh, adopted the Lisbon Treaty that weakened uh, this sovereignty composition uh, position of Poland. And that's what is happening, has been happening recently. I mean, since 2019, uh, when we have to compromise our sovereignty. sovereignty. So I wonder, uh, can we, um, can we, can, uh, how can we deal? How should we deal with all those uh, compromises uh, uh, with our sovereignty? It's difficult to find uh, any any uh, reasonable solution. Why do we systemically agree for that? Uh, one more comment. Uh, very often in such in, in a debate like this, uh, when uh, uh, when presenting a criticism on um, on what is happening 
um, and you will hear very often pole exit, pole exit. Uh, but pole exit is not the only the only solution. There are other instruments we can go for. A veto, for instance, uh, fifty or for fifty or fifty for fifty-five. The veto would be used following every single principle of uh, governing the European Union. And the veto was developed uh, to make sure that uh, weaker states and Poland is among uh, those weaker states compared to France uh, or Germany or the conglomerate of northern states. Uh, uh, so uh, the veto uh, instrument was developed uh, to allow uh, to allow states such as, such as uh, Poland to to have uh, to have a voice. Uh, so my notion is why don't we use the instruments we already have that the European Union has given us. Uh, Every such a debate makes our positions weaker, position weaker, because uh, because we give up uh, still more uh, more tools and instruments. Let's make a full stop here. Uh, Dr. Kandierski, I hope you will excuse me, but this is the end of our debate. Thank you very much for for this interesting discussion, for your observations and thoughts. Uh, uh, we hosted uh, Dr. Andrzej Krajewski, a historian uh, related to working for the Star Gazeta Prawna. Uh, Dr. Editor Paweł Lisicki, Do Rzeczy uh, Weekly. And Dr. Marcin Kandzierski, the co founder of the Jagiellonian um, Club of Analyses. And now a short break, and then we will.
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, yet another panel uh, coming. The future of the European Union is my great pleasure, and I'm very glad to welcome our Prime Minister, Bata uh, Szydło. The Vice President of ECR uh, in uh, the European Parliament, Herman Teres, a Spanish uh, journalist, politician, an MEP, and the Deputy, uh, the Vice Chair of uh, the Council and an author to the letter of a letter to Adam Michnik as a former friend from the opposition times. So Herman, the opposite is for you for this letter. And Ladislav Lichit, the um, leader, MEP, leader of the Cross Party. Welcome. We will ask our future what about their perception of the future of the European Union. We know that it's a breaking, unbreaking point. Uh, let's start. Let us start with uh, with Madam Prime Minister. What is a future in the European Union going to be like? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me to for this uh, for this event. Uh, it is a very important conference. Uh, I believe that we all realize that it's it's the time of change, uh, changes in the European Union, and we um, we wonder which direction the European those changes will take. We have had in the European Parliament this uh, this important conference, uh, uh, the debate on the future of the European Union. We also participated in this conference as. Uh, as uh, as a group, I uh, represented uh, I represent I I represented this group in the debate, and it was my impression that this discussion should be based on arguments, uh, addressing all all possible points of view. But finally, it turned out that this vision of uh, Europe that. Uh, uh, resulted uh, from this conference is uh, more liberal and uh, leftist uh, without actually the presence of any other points of view. So this shows that uh, and this proves uh, that all that all activities uh, made in the European Commission in the European Parliament are uh, defined uh, uh, as just one single vision, the vision of the European Union um, following uh, the liberal uh, liberal ideas so representing the majority in the European in the European uh, Union, uh, but not necessarily so in the member states. Uh, let's take Italy and maybe. Uh, in the future, next year, in the, the Spain, we we hear from those uh, those states that this uh, that this vision is not uh, predominant there, and is not dominating in a certain um, in certain circles. Uh, whereas uh, what we see is that uh, the European Union becomes a bastion of those leftist uh, leftist thoughts and leftist notions. Uh, we have some forecasts, but uh, the, the question remains what uh, should be done. I listened to the previous panel discussions. Uh, we heard uh, about the recovery um, uh, fund. Uh, is Poland uh, efficient in the, in the European Union? And the, and the answer is uh, Poland is uh, just as other uh, member states are, and the Polish nationals uh, decide who will rule in Poland and who will rule uh, in the European Union. And there is no reason for us being uh, uh, representing conservative uh, parties uh, and that uh, our, our nationals can find uh, the, the fate of our country in, the hand, in, in our hands. So there is no reason for us to be not to be proud uh, and not to fight for our our national rights. Uh, what should be of the utmost importance? Uh, 
uh, because we all have uh, similar duties and similar responsibilities and similar rights in the European Union. So the, the contemporary version, the emerging version of the European, of the future of the European Union is uh, is a liberal leftist vision and liberal leftist ideas. Poland has a conservative government and we should state that clearly and openly. I fully agree that we should be we should be able to stand up for our rights and veto what is not in the interest of Poland and we will not follow uh, what is not within our vision. It's not easy, of course, uh, and uh, Poland may be supported by Hungary, because so we have the support of Hungary and Hungary only, but we hear still more voices all around, uh, but we are still hopeful that uh, that Italy will try to address uh, the proposals um, in a slightly different way and we hope that Spain few, next year will, uh, will provide a clear signal for that. Um, we haven't lost that battle yet, not, not uh, so. Uh, it's not that we want to leave the European Union, but we cannot subject ourselves fully and without uh, any ob objection to what is uh, being uh, um, suggested now. We want to to um, point uh, to uh, various new and other perspectives. Uh, let me let me emphasize it again that Poland is. Uh, I, uh, we are just the same kind of uh, state as any other state within the European Union. Uh, we um, offer a lot. Uh, we are very efficient in using European funds. Uh, yes, it's, we need the funds, uh, the funds from the National Recovery Plan, but not. Uh, but there is a certain certain. Uh, limits that we will not go beyond. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Prime Minister. Question to Herman Tarraj. One of the leaders in the um, European Parliament of the waxing party called Vox, for which we keep fingers crossed and congratulations and a round of applause. Herman, What's your take on the future of the European Union from your perspective? Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to only say I'm, I'm very glad to be with you. Uh, I couldn't be in Warsaw because we have uh, today a very important day in Spain. We had a huge demonstration just now here in Madrid, and there were demonstrations all in the provinces, in the capital of the provinces in Spain, against this government against a, a government which is a uh, bringing us into a, this leftist communist alliance is bringing us to an impossible situation uh, in 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 spain um, that's why i have very 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 little time and i'm sorry about that uh, i wanted to say we are we are uh, confident that things are changing and we see that the commission and we see that the majority is nervous, which confirms that things are changing. We had this important, very important news from Italy, but we had very, very important news from Sweden, and we have it from other places as well in, in, in Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, of course, I am very confident that the force and the unity and the national spirit of conservatism in, the, in, the, in Eastern Europe will help us in this in this battle this battle is not lost no but this battle is uh, in in what is important to know is this battle is not fought we haven't fought because there was a center right uh, parties in whole europe which used to get the conservative vote 
to make leftist policy. And that is one of the dramas that we have had in, in Europe, in Western Europe, and that's why the mainstream suddenly is really social democrat, even socialist in a Marxist militant uh, way. We have to fight against this development, which is the mainstream in this moment. We see it from the CDU to the, to the far left communists of Spain or of Greece. I mean, they are voting the same in the ideological, in the ideological questions. And that is a farce for the conservative voter all over Western Europe. And we have to correct that. And Vox is there for correcting this a part as Giorgia Meloni is doing in, in Italy. And as I say, we are, we are very hopeful. We are very hopeful that the changes occur in many spheres in many services. We have on, from one side, I think this, the Ukrainian uh, war of heroic, Ukrainian war of resistance against the Russian aggression has changed things also deeply in the perception. I think the nation is again there. The nation is seen as main force for the, the self-defense of, of the people. Uh, uh, without uh, everybody knows that without the national reaction to the aggression, the European Union would have left for uh, Ukraine, and the the uh, the Western part of, in any case, the Western part of the European Union, specifically uh, Paris and Berlin, would have been glad. If in three in three days or five days or seven days, Putin would have achieved his uh, his uh, all his objectives and uh, would have uh, taken uh, over uh, Ukraine, and they, they they would have protested as they did with Crimea. After some months, we would have had Borrell traveling traveling to to Moscow as as man business as usual with with slight with slight sanctions. Uh, the thing is that ha didn't happen. We have, a, a, we have now a solid reaction of all the northern and eastern, uh, eastern governments uh, and, and, and nations. And I think that is the, uh, that is the driving force for change in, in Europe that makes one thing obsolete which we have seen just now in this in this month very clearly, and that is the end of this um, hegemony of the of the axis of Paris Berlin. Paris Berlin is a, has had a force, a disproportionate force inside the European Union, which they will never recover after this war and after the lack of confidence in Berlin and in, in, in Paris uh, uh, for, from the rest of, of Europe. And, and this is, I think, a capital change in our perspective of changing the European uh, Union. They are very nervous, as I say. I think the, the correlation of forces will change and will change in many, in many countries a lot. And I think the, uh, the next, uh, the next uh, parliament in the European Union and the next commission in the European Union uh, will not have uh, the possibilities even, maybe not even the will, but in any case, they will not have the possibilities and the room of maneuver for doing what they are doing now. That means implementing or imposing socialist ideology all over the places. Uh, and and trying to make social engineering with this green pact and with many other laws which go directly against the interests of the nations of the European Union. I think, uh, as I say, there is a reaction. There is a force reaction. I'm coming now from this from this uh, demonstration, as I say, in the in the square of Colón in, in the center of Madrid, and uh, I can tell you. I mean. Uh, the the the, per, the perception of of the of the commission uh, has dropped dramatically. Uh, the critics towards the European Union, as it is, uh, is growing increasingly, and it will be 
uh, it will be also a, a, a solid factor for for the vote for Vox in the in the next elections. In this sense, I am confident that we are in the beginning of this turning turning of the of the uh, of the direction uh, that we had, and it was a very perverse, as I say, socialist uh, uh, ideology with all this. Uh, myths about about climate, about gender, about uh, manipulation of history, and so on that we have seen in the last in the last years, and that we have to fight uh, uh, to to abolish and to and to defeat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladislav, the question goes to you. Herman is looking very optimistically out, uh, looking for changes in the EU. What's your take from Croatia on this matter? So first, um, thank you for the invitation. You know that Croatia and Poland shared a similar history um, I don't know if you knew that uh, just three countries, Poland, Hungary and Croatia, got the name from Holy See, Ante, Ante Murale Christianitatis. So like we were the ones who defended Christianity from the East and maybe in these times we have to defend Christianity from the West too. Concerning my optimism and changes, I have to say first that we are not the ones, the only ones, who want some changes in European Union. There are, from the perspective of the government, a strong force which want to uh, change European Union in a super state, so giving much more power to, to Brussels. And that is one reform I would mention. So this structurally reform of European Union, shall we have super state or shall we have more subsidiarity um, in the same time i would also speak about a reform of european union considering uh, the content of its policy policies um, i will mention three first is the um, green transition then migration and then gender ideology which is also very important but back to the first reform or possible changes concerning, concerning the structure of EU, I have to say that uh, it is not sustainable, this direction, uh, uh, which gives uh, much more power to, to Brussels. They speak about equality and equality is a lie. Equality doesn't exist. I, 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 I am aware and I, I always promote equality in dignity. So we are all equal in dignity, but we are not equal. And that is a, a crucial difference. And um, uh, say using equality uh, without indignity uh, means that the, we shall have a lot of consequences, a lot of bad consequences. And that is connected with the uh, appreciation of, of uh, subsidiarity, what, what we've seen concerning uh, Poland, Poland and Hungary now, and we shall see what will happen with Italy and maybe in, with Spain in, in, the, in the future. So I think that this is not sustainable, this more power to Brussels, because if, you, uh, if people of uh, our nations, are, if our, 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 our people don't um, feel, don't see that um, uh, they can be part of that, so, uh, and in Croatia, you know, people don't believe that they can influence decisions uh, which are brought in Brussels. So it means that even few, fewer people will going to the polls next time and so on. So, so it means that giving more power to Brussels means less democracy. And this is not sustainable. But I would add just a few sentences about this content. So um, this green transi transition and this uh, dogmatic uh, approach to this, which we can see in all our committees in European Parliament, uh, which puts actually uh, the planet in the focus, not people. Uh, what, what, is a wrong, what, what is a wrong approach? 
so we can see now that you know they would uh, ban coal they would ban um, gas they would ban of course nuclear then they would promote uh, heat pumps but it's very good but then they would uh, ban f gases in heat pumps and without f gases heat pumps are much less uh, efficient uh, you know so this approach brought us to this uh, energy crisis we which we have today because you know that uh, energy crisis began before the russian aggression to ukraine uh, the next thing i would uh, the second thing i would mention is migration which is also not sustainable because uh, you know we shall change it it is not realistic it, uh, realistically that people from who have very strong identity who are for example proud to be muslim proud to be sunni proud to be from this tribe proud to be from this family proud to be for example men you know uh, to expect that they will assimilate to some western society where people so to say don't even know which sex they are it is not a realistic approach and the third connected to this is the gender ideology which uh, is contrary to the natural law i, I cannot spend too much time uh, describing this but connecting to this is our demography which is awful which is not sustainable so all in all, I think this reform of EU, not just by structure, but also by the content of um, our policies is necessary. And I will at the end mention that uh, today we have the first Sunday of Advent, Advent, how you say Advent. Uh, so it means that every year we have to consider the reform we have to make in our own lives so that we have to open our hearts to something what is good to expect the good and to reform ourselves so even when we speak about poland which we all of us from christian perspective uh, see as a role model so i think that also poland have to rethink and always try to reform try try to think what is good uh, and what is better and of course european union so uh, we always need uh, reforms uh, otherwise we shall go to a um, uh, wrong path wrong direction and i think that european union goes a wrong direction with this super state and with these poli policies which are not um, which are not realistic so if we want to be sustainable there is a path there is a light we shall uh, turn on more and more candles during this advent and symbolically we, we have to we have to turn on more and more light uh, on on the path of european union which is a good project which we need croatia cannot play alone at the global field so we need each other but on a different way we have to respect our differences and just with this subsidiarity uh, european union can be a successful project thank you great many thanks now the final round of questions to the prime minister let's wrap up shortly before the audience would ask a question. Now a question to Herman, please. Ladislav said that what is important is to put up a fight against those crazy ideologies, both when it comes to power generation, like elimination, of the possibility to, to buy combustion engine vehicles then with respect to men the german sorry the gender um, ideology and this rampant atheism and the ideological terms if i were to summarize what ladislav said i would call it reverting to the roots and spain used to be this 
um, cradle of our civilization. Is there a chance, Herman, that Spain returns to the position of being a cradle of civilization and, the, uh, and Spain will be the birthplace of the new renewal? Well, we have uh, we have been we have exported Christianity when we I was hearing my friend Bradley Svav uh, speaking about the the the, the, the wall uh, of defending Christianity. We uh, we brought Christianity to the other continent and expanded it and made so Christianity universal in this sense. Uh, but I must say, we have been forty years uh, now in absolute uh, defeat, ideological weakness and defeat the conservatives had because after after Franco's after Franco's regime, uh, we had su there was such a complex of trying to connect one thing uh, the the regime with the with the right to, with the conservatives that the conservatives didn't uh, were as I say, too afraid to defend the positions, and everything was everything what was common sense, and the left didn't like was considered Frankism, or fascism, or even Nazism, and so and so that was the way of really imposing in the schools, in the lit, in the culture, in the communication, in the in the in, the, in journalism, of course. Uh, but also in university and in, in and in the education in general, to to bring this to a leftist hegemony, which is a uh, monstrous in Spain in this moment. That's why the fight of uh, Santiago Abascal from a very little, tiny group, uh, as was Vox five years ago, uh, to this uh, position today as the third party of Spain, is a heroic uh, fight. And and I consider it will uh, continue as as long as we are not in in power and 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 beyond that. It is heroic because the entourage and the social culture in this moment is is very much spoiled by the left by this hegemony uh, of the left. Uh, we are breaking taboos since uh, years, and that is changing many things. There. Are, Many things which had not been said in Spain. For an example, the, crimi the, the, the criminal uh, Second Republic, which the, the left in Spain always portrays as an impeccable regime, a democratic regime which was interrupted by Franco. That was not the case. It was a socialist, communist anarchy where the opposition, the conservative opposition, was murdered and 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 where where the the coups were staged by socialists and which was a a, a regime of of terror when uh, when the militaries intervened in July 36. In this sense, what is the the manipulation and the manipulation of the history has been has been enormous, and the lack of courage to fight by the center right party Partido Popular has been capital for giving this hegemony to the to the left we have in, in this sense we have lots of work to do because we are fighting a, a, a it's a fight we should have started 40 years ago and it has not been waged and fought uh, we we are we are in this we are in this fight and we are confident as i say we are confident that even in this situation in which we are now, we will uh, we will bring conservatives voters to vote conservative and not to vote a party which is is systematically betraying this, the conservatives and giving them the votes to a mainstream to a mainstream left and social democratic policy like the EPP in Europe. And like the PP in 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 Spain, in this sense, I know it's a very tough work, and it is a dangerous work because the left in Spain is turning a South American in the sense of of criminal. Uh, we are not speaking of, of decisions. We are speaking about uh, traitors against the law, and people who are really uh, without scruples. 
uh, are really ready for everything uh, in in the old traditional way of an uh, anti-democratic left. We are not speaking about uh, Felipe González anymore, which you could like or not, but you know you knew when he was going to beat it, he would go. We are speaking of people who are far more similar to Hugo Chavez than to Felipe González or to, let's say, Kreisky or Billy Brandt or, or this kind of, of left that we have in Europe. In this sense, you have to be aware we have a very dangerous enemy. Thank you very much, Herman. Uh, you may know uh, our colleagues uh, from Vox are physically attacked by the leftist uh, uh, representatives of the left. Uh, we know it from books, uh, uh, from the time of communism and Marxism in Poland. Uh, um, only the disguise is different. Ladislaw, now uh, I would like to come back to you, and then well, I will come back to Madam Prime Minister. Vladislav, you are known for promoting Christianity. Yesterday, we talked about Christianity a lot uh, as a as a root of the um, of the root and the, the origin of the Western civilization. What does it look like in Croatia? Uh, is it similar to Poland? Is is Croatia is also subject to this pressure to a uh, like pressure, or do you have many defendants who defend God and who defend the foundation of our civilization? What is your opinion? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. So um, we have, so to say, a strong church. So pretty much, pretty ma many people going to church, and so so we are on that kind conservative. But uh, in the same time, we have the same problem as um, Herman Terch mentioned in Spain that uh, we have the very strong EPP party who is. Uh, uh, always in the government and um, so uh, they are uh, they pretend to be uh, christian democrats and they are not you know and so they they promote uh, you know like istanbul convention gender theory and things like this so uh, this uh, spirit modern spirit so to say progressive spirit with with gender theory as i mentioned for example we have uh, more than 1,000 uh, increase of uh, gender dysphoria, you know, so young people who want to change their sex or, or gender, as they say, you know, so they, we have a lot of, a lot of this. But uh, I would say that um, maybe the leftist, so to say, boiled the frog too fast. So, um, so now people, uh, so they, they, are, they were very sure in what they are doing. And they thought they can do everything what they want. And so they went so fast that now we have um, people who say, you know, gender theory, you know, and that I can say that I have a male's body and that I'm actually a woman, you know, something's wrong in this, you know. So uh, so people uh, who, are, uh, who were following the, the mainstream, uh, understand that this concept uh, is not good and uh, that uh, we have the problem with uh, birth rate, um, we have the big problem with uh, people going to Germany, so we have lost 10% of our uh, inhabitants uh, uh, mostly going to Germany and Ireland and some other countries. And uh, so uh, people uh, realize that uh, we need more sovereignty. We need more um, care about our value system because um, Christianity, and when I speak the, about Christianity, I don't expect all people to be believers, but I speak about Christian culture, you know. So uh, Christian culture is something what is tested during uh, history. And we, uh, so Christianity is not just our faith, but uh, as Pope Benedict XVI said, that Christianity is also a proven way of life. So when we promote, I don't know, marriage, family, having children and so on, it is something what is historically proven as a good way for, for, 
for the society. And now uh, gender ideology, which is promoted, um, doesn't, we, we don't have uh, any results of this. And, and results we are receiving now is these results are not good for the society, you know. So we have the lack of people then, as I said, uh, uh, some European countries want, want to compensate this with migration, with migrants, and then they have problems with no-go zones and so on. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, I'm an optimist uh, because, um, you know, as I said in the introductory speech, I think that only the this uh, way of life, this Christian way of life, is the only sustainable. So, so uh, even when we speak about some uh, values like freedom and equality, what I uh, what I mentioned, you know, uh, so in European Parliament that these values are promoted are, are, uh, as values uh, from the Enlightenment, uh, some so, so moving further away from the religion. But also these values are values which have roots in Christianity, because, for example, that we had that we are equal in dignity. It is a Christian idea. It is not, for example, from some religions from the East, which have castes and so or, or for example, freedom is also Christian idea, free will, which we cannot find, for example, in Islam. So. Uh, these are values also uh, uh, which are which are the, the roots of Europe and that's why I'm optimist that at the end people even who don't call themselves Christians will come to these values because these are the only values uh, uh, which can uh, bring Europe to the, to the future and just one sentence about Croatia and political situation so we have this strong epp but in last four elections we had more than 20 percent of votes who go which goes go uh, more to to right-wing parties so to say more conservative parties which are so to say more to the right than had than epp par party but the problem is that we are not united and i, I hope that we shall find the wisdom to go together and to have the same uh, scenario which we have now in Italy or on or or in in Spain or for example Poland even better. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your observations, Ladislav. And the last question goes to Madam Prime Minister. Um, we have been discussing it for a number of years, uh, so we, this, this European culture, uh, the European culture is to replace the national culture, so that's why we discuss Polishness. And my question to you, Madam Prime Minister, what Polishness is to you? What does it mean to you to be Polish? You can use just one sentence or you can make a lecture uh, on that. Uh, it's a huge topic. We should all observe and follow what is happening in our uh, lives. When we want to answer this question, uh, we uh, need to follow all the events in our life. Uh, lives. Uh, what Polishness is, is my, it's my history, my culture, the soil that uh, I live on, the place, uh, um, the place I live in. Polishness is all that has shaped me as, uh, as uh, a citizen, as a politician, Polishness is uh, my family, my faith, uh, and Polishness is Poland. But what does it mean? And what can uh, we, the politicians, do with it? Uh, I have this impression when when observing some some um, some politicians uh, of the European uh, arena. Uh, the MEPs, uh, 
and the Polish politicians on the European uh, scene uh, who are supposed to defend the Polish, uh, the, Polish uh, the, the interests of Poland. Uh, so I have this impression that uh, they are sometimes ashamed that they are come from Poland. I have heard from one uh, Madam MEP elected in Poland, they are ashamed of speaking Polish, for instance. So my question is, uh, if, you, if you choose not to speak Polish uh, in the European Parliament uh, as an MEP, who will do so? All the languages are equal. Polish. Polish is one of one of the official languages of the European Union, and uh, this you may find you may you may find it uh, you may think that it's uh, it's obvious, but it's not. We still have MEPs elected in Poland working for Poland in uh, the European Union who are ashamed of Poland, Poland who believe that uh, what is European is better, uh, that uh, and what want to, who want to adopt uh, European values much more than and who uh, who value the European values much more than the Polish ones then. So we're, we still have such uh, politicians, uh, and then there will be no end to uh, and a difficult, many difficult situations uh, that we're confronted with um, in the European Union. And if we want to have the Polishness present in the European Union, if we want to defend our interests uh, against uh, the interest or in Spain, in Croatia and elsewhere, we need to eliminate that. It's like a, uh, it's, it's our attempt to creating this European superpower. But so uh, what do we need this European superpower for? in order to secure the interests of all the member states. Uh, does that mean that we should be somewhere in the background and then and we should just follow um, follow the opinions of other states uh, without any reflection whatsoever? New elites are now being created. Uh, unfortunately, they are very often ashamed of their cultures, of their languages. Uh, they are ashamed of. Uh, uh, they are ashamed of uh, of demonstrating their faith, uh, and they are marginalized, actually. And the elites from Brussels will dictate what we are supposed to do. Please uh, remember that those elites try to dominate in Europe. They, their objective is to create a new world. This uh, struggle is going on, but still more and more member states of the European Union tend to realize that you cannot give up in uh, preserving your nationality. We must be critical in front of uh, uh, European ideas. We have our place in the European Union, and I would like to quote uh, Saint uh, John Paul II, who once said that Pol Europe needs Poland, and Poland needs Europe. Europe needs Poland even more than before. Poland is necessary, is needed. I have heard it from my colleagues. Uh, we have shown a way to achieve that, to fulfill this vision. We have shown how to uh, how to work with, uh, how to work out uh, a safe reality for our nationals, how to act otherwise. But it does not mean that we want to leave the European Union. We criticize the European Union very often. Yes, we do. We know what's, what is happening in this organization. And the recent months have shown 
that uh, we are now living uh, in the very, very uh, bumpy times. Uh, and our safety matters even more. And it is our duty and responsibility to act so. It is our responsibility as a member of the state to talk about it openly and to improve the situation, to offer, to suggest a solution. The more Polish we are in the European Union, the more chances we have of surviving. We want to serve the uh, European elites, uh, the Polish elites, not the European elites. Uh, it is our responsibility. We must be proud of uh, being Polish. We must be proud of uh, being members of the European Union. We shouldn't have any, uh, any complexes. We should be determined, especially as uh, we have arguments, the necessary arguments. And I would like to finish by saying that Polishness, for me, is one of the most beautiful things that may happen to us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Herman, uh, Herman Teres, uh, Ladislav Ilic, and Madame Bata uh, Szydło. Thank you for participating in this panel discussion.
mathematicians, uh, we have heard uh, from intellectuals and from um, from journalists, and uh, now we will hear from, from, from the politicians themselves, uh, and the Minister, Minister of uh, Justice. Uh, uh, member of, uh, of Parliament, Krzysztof uh, Bosak, um, and a member of Parliament, uh, member of Parliament from uh, Federacja, Krzysztof uh, Gawkowski, um, uh, the member of uh, Parliament, uh, uh, will join us uh, in a moment because he's, he's stuck in the traffic jam. Thank you very much for accepting the. Uh, thank you very much for accepting the the introduction. Uh, I would like to start with a general question: What Polishness is uh, for you? How do you perceive Polishness? Uh, what do you feel about uh, Polishness, um, Mr. Bosak? Would you like to start? Welcome. Thank you for having me uh, in this discussion. Well, I think it's, it's, it's impossible to define shortly. Polishness is a set of experience, set of values uh, stemming from our history. And that's why I believe that reducing, reducing it to just one quality, one, 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 one feature, and one mechanism what uh, people tend to do is very uh, improper. Polishness is, Polishness is about our whole uh, legacy, cultural legacy uh, represented by our ideals uh, and uh, represented by our history, well remembered, but also some critical, critical events uh, uh, we refer we refer ourselves to the uh, ID to the identity of other nations, uh, and uh, by means of uh, and we end up with a contrast, uh, and that's how we end up with a definition of Polishness. Uh, there are differences between civilizations, but you cannot uh, add hierarchy to uh, to that. You shouldn't do that. Uh, but without doing that, you can't boast of. Uh, of what is yours, uh, historical accents, uh, some details, some some folk detail. Uh, we should be always uh, convinced that um, the set the set of values that we follow and have in our in our historical mem memory is closer to this universal ideal that is worth uh, copying than others. Much more. Um, within the grasp, within the reach, so you can switch on your smartphone and you immediately discover what people at the other end of the world think and what they do, bad things or good things. Now, when it comes to citizens, we sometimes make Polishness a, a very hollow thing, we hollow it out. We put white and red jerseys for sports events that are so emotional. And this is the simplest way how you manifest your Polishness. However, there are also good traits that we Poles have. They include being realistic and rational, rationalistic. In our private lives, we are capable of evaluating situations very quickly that we are not going to bring down a wall that's impenetrable other things we put on the back burner and revert to them if 
of the need arises or if the circumstances have changed, but also repeating the very same expectations all and all over and over again will lead to our partners rolling their eyes, turning their backs on us and uh, ceasing to listen. So we'll need, we, we have this capability of separating the achievable from non-achievable and in public life are also looking for opportunities, windows of opportunities. That it works in the public life a little bit worse. If you look at a politician who is tasked with uh, making sure or, or caring for the well uh, being of uh, the state, not his own, he or she should think of the raison d'etat at all times and work incessantly without letting it go when you have uh, become a minister or something uh, or some other position of the authority. You should rather work on advancing Poland much further than it used to be. So to wrap up my little bit lengthy introductory remark, I wished we were able to Uh, recall of the ideals that you can rally your colleagues or partners around, but the thing is that if those ideals are hollow, they will never translate into actions. That what makes conflicts among Poles who focus on a apparent and not a real uh, problem. Sometimes we quarrel about little things without noticing that big things are passing by. And I'm afraid that we are inclined to rally in ideological babbles, looking at all others as enemies rather than opponents, without noticing much more important things passing or going by. Thank you very much. The same question goes to Minister Kaleta. Minister, how do you feel pollutionness? Are there any features that set us apart from the others? What is pollutionness for you? Indeed, uh, Krzysztof outlined the components of Polishness, of this multifaceted experience and heritage of tradition that all converge in us feeling Poles. But there is always a question emerging which we heard in your question about politicians. What is Polishness for politicians who uh, operate in the public sphere? Because Polishness may be very superficial, be confined to the things that are common for of us like language and territorial community. So as uh, we all rejoiced when Poland won the football match yesterday, if people who speak uh, Polish and uh, sing the Dombrowski's Mazurka the national anthem and put the white and red jerseys on football matches, that's one thing. But the other thing is the intensity of Polishness in the public sphere. Here is where difficulties arise. Here is my personal experience. During many panels yesterday and today, speakers gave us great good outlines of Polishness, 
all of, of them in terms of the Polish interest. Now, that Polishness defines and affects the position of Poland internationally. So I believe that the first difference and the ways how you implement Polishness in the public sphere is how strong Polishness is in a given political environment. That applies to parties, that applies to politicians. Is it a luggage that's a burden or is it a luggage that's a treasure? And to me, Polishness, that luggage, is uh, is a treasure. But other political, political circles call it a burden. So this is why those circles try to put Polishness in the context of Europe, European culture. So this is the main axis of dispute and the Polish politics. Those on the right hand side accuse the left hand side of lack of patriotism. This is because the left parties put lower standards for Polishness and we are never going to achieve the same understanding of Polishness if we pursue this. So to point out something out, Polishness is about the pride of roots that our community stems from. And appreciation of all those parts of the Polish history that have been brushed aside, as Mr. Zimkiewicz, the writer, said, that Poland, against the backdrop of other cultural, uh, other um, countries in our cultural circle has no experience that led up to wokeism today. We've never had a historical experience that are now the reason for concern, because we all share the same trait of religious and other tolerance, and this is where Poles should build up their strengths and argumentation. This is the backdrop against which we should build up our identity without biases, without complexes. Let's not fear speaking about Poland, putting it as example. Only this way we can effectively and efficiently pursue our interests abroad. This is what makes Poland Polishness stand out. So if I may stir the discussion first, I'd like to say that the key thing in understanding Polishness is that certain political circles and ideological circles believe that Polishness is a drawback rather than a benefit and compare it to this with this mythical European mess that has never existed and uh, that no other European country you know countries have ever achieved thank you minister for that voice Krzysztof Gawkowski uh, chairman of the left party joined us meantime it was no coincidence that I asked you about your personal experience with Polishness because I assumed rightly that your emotions translate later and do course into your political decisions. And it's difficult to separate the public and private uh, spheres because you are definitely guided by your private beliefs. Now to Mr. Gavkowski, what's Polishness in your opinion? How do you perceive it? And since Minister Kaleta broached this issue, 
Is Polishness a treasure for you or rather a burden? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for my being late, but this was due to my parliamentary obligations. First of all, I'd like to thank for inviting me here and thank Patrick Yaki for organizing, for hosting this event, because it's very rare that we can meet and discuss uh, various things despite our differences, what we have uh, what we have common as a DNA. So the common denominator is Polishness. We all want the best for our country. Well, this is because we're born here, we are patriots, and it's a part and parcel of our DNA. We want to represent a country which is proud and open. Sometimes we have divergent visions of how to get there. I didn't hear what Krzysztof said, but I heard Pavel and, and uh, Sebastian. I do agree. This is no point of departure for me to start um, a dispute. I think that being in line with your personal hierarchy results from your experience, and we are part of a European community. So to answer to your question about Polishness, it's about the pride of my country, of uh, my people, whether I am in Bilgosz or anywhere else in, in the world. I always am always able to boast with my country and incessantly try to build a good um, renown of Poland. I think we feel Poles everywhere, but not everybody can imagine what it means. Regardless where I am, I always speak well of Poland, trying to point to contexts that are important for Poland. That's a country that has been in Europe for many centuries and has some interests and problems that we are able to um, to resolve ourselves. That is what brought us together in 1918. This overarching goal for everyone was regaining independence that bonded many generations. Although people saw that in, uh, in from different perspectives, regardless of the party affiliation that our ancestors had, they talked about what Poland should look like. So this is what I would call as ability to adapt to the environment overlaying with uh, your identity. Because regardless from where you come, there are no colors or shades in patriotism. And there is no purpose in defining those shades in political terms. So the foundation for me is that there is no difference between a patriot from the left and the patriot from the right. I think to have as much patriotism, respect to the flag, and to the Polish blood spilled over the course of history as any other politician. That will, used to be my firm belief always. And I'm not telling you because uh, it fits the purpose of this meeting, but I also wrote that in my books and I try to publicize this. I try to incentivize people with that. My urge would be to avoid drawing from the politics topics that are a matter of dispute. I think that patriotism is the same virtue as the ability of drawing up Polish interests. For me, speaking about 
whether Poland should have the right amount of patriotism sounds like an abstract to me because Poland is and will always be our common home. And Poles who live abroad are also part of uh, our community with the same interests. We want to be a country that is appreciated and recognized abroad and one that is able to leverage its positives in relations with other countries and also uh, capable of using uh, its own resources. Speaking of patriotism, it is important for me that we do not squander our resources. And this is why I'm saying that we need a strong European Union. But I believe that power of Poland in the European Union is very important for the Poles because I believe the right place of Poland is within the European Union. Strong position socially, politically, economically is that. For example, today's ghastly attack of Russia on Ukraine, we showcased that we are able to accept refugees, that we're a country which is socially responsible and proud in the face of this disaster for millions of Ukrainians. So this is for me how I would say, how I would look for a point of departure. It's not like Gavkovsky from the left three that deals with patriotism differently than the others. No, I want uh, patriotism. I want Poland to be strong. And I think that gestures such as with uh, what we did with the Ukraine, oh, sorry, with the refugees is one of the fundamentals of patriotic Poland. Thank you very much. So let's start a second round. I'd like to follow up because you mentioned uh, you referred to several interesting things because it seems that um, you quoted certain out of ordinary things for the left. You said that we should resolve our problems inside Poland and there are many um, proofs to the contrary. And you said that your patriotism equals others, but we can remember various uh, statements from the left towards the right about the brownish things, about uh, allegations to fascism or Nazism. So could you please elaborate? Well, emotions in politics will always be present. And if we tried to make a poll amongst the politicians of the leading parties, people said various things. And I've been in this business for 20 years and I heard many things despite the political affiliations of the parties in power, blue, red, white or whatever. And I would say that the MEPs and also members of the Polish parliament said very many things about I believe that you should guard your tongue if you're abroad and not to blubber but here what is more important is that the interests that show up in the parliamentary debates should translate into action and I believe that as political class, we show, we display uh, the responsibility in the times of trial. So the last seven seven months uh, represent what uh, what uh, what patriotism is for uh, for politicians. I have some certain reservations uh, as to whether or not to um, to in, in increase the fund funds for. Uh, for, um, for, um, for, for, for 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 the army, uh, some of you may say yes, yes, some, some yes, very much so because strong army is very important for our defense. But uh, but in but by increasing the funds for defense for our for, for our army, um, we get involved in this in this war. Uh, is it uh, should we? 
well, should we develop our army? The 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 left uh, the left wing had no reservations whatsoever, and no doubt in this in this respect, uh, they 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 think so. And but uh, what what are our, our ideas about about refugees and uh, and helping refugees? Well, you you won't say it was it was otherwise. These are the moments of uh, these are the moments of trial. This is where when the patriotism occurs, uh, you uh, come united. Uh, we uh, understand that there is only one objective in front of us, and uh, it is <coughs> to be united and to defend the interests of Poland. Um, <coughs> this is the business of uh, of uh, a, any politician because. Uh, a patriot will be judged not not by by their words, but by their decisions and their influence on many future um, generations. And uh, so, in the moment of trial, where were you on the right side or on the on the on the wrong side? So, the decision making moment uh, is very important here. Uh, and so I would. I'm very. I'm very proud of of our politicians. So when I observe and when when I analyze uh, the decisions, the decisions before February the 24th and after February the 24th, uh, Christoph, you have uh, taken notes uh, and some sub uh, some uh, a surprise on your face uh, when it comes to the European Union, but. Uh, but coming back to the question by Minister Kalata, quite a rhetoric uh, question. Um, Polishness, is it a treasure or an obstacle? And could you refer, or could you comment on what uh, Mr. Gafkowski uh, uh, has said? Yeah, uh, we don't have the necessary time limits to do all you've asked me to. Uh, to because I would uh, um, 18 minutes uh, are left till the end of this discussion, so I don't have enough time to discuss everything and to comment on any, everything. Uh, we do, we do not uh, support uh, patriotism 100%. Uh, uh, well, um, we support some of the ideas, uh, patriotic ideas of the left, uh, but not all of them. Uh, uh, I, I believe Mr. Krzysztof Gawkowski is right uh, when he says that there is this ideological convergence between the left and the right. Uh, there has been so recently, um, and uh, we have uh, been boasted by by some leftist po politicians that's just uh, mentioned Mr. Zandberger. But when you ask me about Polishness, um, yeah, one of the things I haven't said before, uh, and especially during the first round, uh, would be that um, Polishness. And Polishness is not an idea; it's an ideal. An idea and an ideal are two different things, in my understanding. It's an ideal that is very, very demanding. Uh, Polishness is very demanding because uh, because it uh, contains uh, all that uh, we uh, perceive as valuable historically. From his, from Christian point of view, Western point of view, and our individual culture, it's a unique ideal, uh, and nobleness and just justice. Uh, that's what I would. Uh, that's how I would define it. Uh, being generosity in front of our opponents and being just. Uh, very unique values, uh, not very present and followed uh, nowadays, uh, these days in the European Union. And uh, uh, when I've, uh, we, we've heard uh, representatives of, uh, from, uh, from abroad, uh, international guests, uh, uh, and we heard from them that uh, their nations their conservative, uh, their conservative parties are very, very, uh, uh, are very uh, well. They're weak now because they are experiencing a crisis, uh, because uh, their opponents question whatever they can. Uh, uh, if 
uh, if you are a patriot, you have to question whatever is uh, whatever many elements of the of the of the tradition and, and from from the history. So we do not follow this classical understanding of Polishness, uh, and uh, and we now experience a a huge conflict, a cultural conflict conflict in Poland. A good example, the United States would be a good example. We have two fractions, two fractions of and two understandings of what culture is. Uh, and, uh, and this conflict is either present or already won by, by the left. And there are many notions which are questioned. Uh, uh, the elites, uh, uh, the elites uh, defy the, the the terms, and uh, uh, and it's uh, very difficult to uh, to uh, well to affirm this this Polishness. Uh, if you take the end of the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, those who didn't take our ideals from Christianity took them from from like uh, culture and humanist human uh, humanistic uh, culture. Um, and these were like ideas, but somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, this whole system of values was reverted and. Uh, uh, those uh, uh, those who were uh, followed the the like of values and principles changed and uh, uh, changed their opinions and they started presenting uh, Christian ideals or at least um, opposite ideals. Well, so when the the two uh, the two sides were completely uh, were completely well, completely different. Uh, uh, here we encounter com, uh, contrasting systems of uh, value, and it all boils down to uh, where you take your moral conv convictions from. What is good, what is wrong? Uh, traditionally, it was religion, maybe philosophy. Uh, but the problem remains that it's not transparent. And especially those who question the uh, the 1,000-year-old 1, 1, uh, culture of values are not transparent. They haven't been what well, they were during the, the communism times, but now they are not transparent. They want to eliminate Christianity, replace it with the Marxist uh, the theory and, and philosophy. It was just uh, in the past, but now it's no longer like this. We are presented with some liberal values, pluralism, uh, whereas this uh, tolerance uh, masks uh, this new cultural hegemony. But those uh, ideologists of of the left uh, know what they what they're talking about and claim they know what they're writing about. Uh, Pavel Ponsilius uh, and Sebastian referred to uh, some di so disagreements and uh, arguments. Uh, arguments were have always been quite uh, quite strong, not because there were two different ideals, but uh, the, it was this was the tactics of uh, and strategy of reacting to historic uh, changes. Uh, in a tragic, uh, tragic uh, historic situation, when when no ideals could be promoted, how to minimize the losses? Uh, so uh, there, I'm not very. Um, yes, there there have there have always been uh, quite strict uh, disagreements. It's normal. Well, no, I don't. I don't follow that. Uh, uh, you have to remember what the disagreement and what the agreement disagreement was about. Uh, uh, and the last uh, word about uh, about the state, patriotism, uh, the, against the background of the state. Uh, you know, the European Union is now developing by reducing the existence of our state. Uh, if you want uh, the state and our nation to uh, keep existing, to uh, to function within uh, or as uh, a local region of the European Union should be should be fair and should state it openly, and then we can discuss it. But if you say that you want a strong Polish state, a strong 
European Union and, and can't see any, any clash between these two notions existing at the same time. And while I, I find it problematic because these two uh, exclude one another, cannot exist together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I got distracted a little bit. Uh, not only me, I'm, I'm, I believe. Uh, I'm, I'm coming back to the question. You and I would like to hear from um, Mr. Pansilius. What is this disagreement about? This argument about? Uh, what is this um, uh, disagreement about? Is it? Uh, do we argue about Poland and the to do there are, as um, there are two different divisions or many different divisions of this of, of this Poland or are we in the sandpit of uh, uh, lacking lacking some fundamental fundamentals uh, uh, from your perspective? A disagreement. It's uh, we disagree about uh, we argue about uh, about Poland. Uh, qualities, uh, promoting our decisions and our ideas, being the very one who uh, who knows what to do, uh, whom Poland needs, uh, and the, the quoted uh, historic uh, disagreements, uh, uh, all of them uh, have always been about Poland. Uh, uh, just how we can achieve this uh, this uh, this uh, well-being of of Poland uh, today uh, the world uh, is much more demanding and uh, one nation not that numerous let's be honest cannot face uh, those challenges and we uh, are we need formulas such as NATO the European Union but also other formulas uh, in uh, particular areas uh, where we are looking for for models of communication with other nations and states so that we can we can uh, develop uh, the power. It uh, in, involves uh, a competition between uh, other nation between between nations. This competition is needed because it's needed for the discussion and for the development. Uh, it's it's been said here that Poland has always been co uh, characterized by tolerance. Uh, well, uh, I I would put it this way: Poland, Pol the Poles, uh, uh, the Polish love freedom, but it has various uh, well, representations. Uh, uh, let's take the democracy. The Polish are very hospitable, open. This is our national quality. It's not common. It's not uh, present in Scandinavia. Uh, you may not believe that, but there is a barrier uh, to this hospitality, to the hospitality there. Other nations are not that open, are not that hospitable. We are, we are ready to discuss. We appreciate the readiness of others to discuss. Uh, uh, that's why we all, we uh, start from this high pitch. Uh, and uh, this communication is, uh, and this dialogue is very often difficult and uh, becomes even physical sometimes uh, and offensive. Uh, sometimes too many words are said so out of so when I when I mentioned those uh, those national our national virtues uh, tolerance freedom I would treat them as, as a promising land because we there are positive sides of them uh, but also difficult sides of those of those virtues because they cost uh, problematic situations in history. Our respect for tradition and history cannot uh, represent the talking and talking only about the successes, the historic successes of, uh, of uh, our people. Uh, on the other hand, we can't, 
we 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 don't we can't endlessly discuss the influence of uh, of the partitions on our on 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 the dialogue, or when when you take tolerance and the respect for democracy. Was there any after 1935? Uh, was there any respect for democracy? Take the postcards uh, uh, of um, regional landscapes uh, from after 1935, and uh, uh, so the, the 30s are not only about those postcards, but also about some about some dark sides. Another thing that I wanted to mention, and referring to what Krzysztof, uh, Krzysztof you have said, uh, thank you for, for your observations. Though there used to be some Christian values, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, and then there was some nihilism. But please, please uh, observe, uh, please observe. Uh, um, viewed as yet another stage of our civilization, a civilization that values and appreciates everyone, even a disabled person. Uh, please, please uh, recollect the uh, decisions regarding disabled people from the 30s of the 20th of the 20th century. What was the participation of disabled people in uh, in the uh, in the work, workplaces, uh, schools, universities, uh, uh, at that times, and those times, uh, maybe we're one step ahead, one step for we appreciate every individual, and every individual makes uh, their own decisions uh, um, as to what they want to do. Abortion. Well, this is is a discussion. Yes, uh, engaging many people in our politics, uh, and then, but then uh, distracts us from uh, more important uh, issues. Uh, what we should pay attention to now is the well-being of. Uh, of every family in Poland, we want every family to be to to, to be able to afford a, 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 a normal life, a decent life. Uh, there are certain ideas we can uh, we can discuss and we can um, consume our energy on and spend our energy on, whereas it's will not, it will not translate into anything that is uh, practical for the well-being of the Polish uh, Polish people. We need to find um, our operating mode, <clears throat> saying that everything that comes from the European Union is bad is not helpful because it's, it's as if you were at the, at the, on, the, on, the, on the shore trying to resist uh, uh, a uh, very high waves uh, by yourself. Uh, we can't wait uh, for the wave uh, to come and uh, will destroy us, uh, and we will not be able to resist it. Allowing this isolation uh, against uh, uh, the international, against the global issues is not a solution, uh, Mr. Kaleta. Minister Paletta. Thank you. What I re referred to in my first opening remark was that no Polish politician would ever claim not to feel Polishness. But the real thing is how important uh, you think Polishness is. That's about our tradition and the source of pride, as opposed to it being an encumbrance. I think that Pavel, you corroborate what I said. Well, squabbling over who is more patriotic doesn't make any sense because everyone who has been elected by Polish voters, 
for example, as the member of the parliament, he or she will always claim that they do what they do um, in the name of Poland. But you actually put a equal equal sign between Polishness and European culture or civilization. So I think this is a very important point of conflict about our place in the world. When you said that Poland equals EU because the presence in the EU, the membership in the EU, gives certain guarantees to Poland and that we should do the utmost to stick to this to that concept now my personal idea and my uh, circles that i represent are skeptical about that because they believe that european membership is a, a means to an end rather than uh, the goal itself when i look back at polish history and the polish political thought from the point of view of the statehood, I do not have a sensation that Poland should make itself vocal in the matters that are a problem for the West. If the West persecuted, uh, sorry, prosecuted um, homosexuals, and now the people try to put it up on their banners as uh, uh, in claiming that the Polish state uh, does the same now. This is something that should not happen because we have never done that before. So it is not that the civilizational achievements of Europe are tantamount to the Polish ones. So this is something that we should build our pride up upon. We have our legacy, our um, achievements that can, we can be proud of in this whole international conglomerate. People, all, everybody claims of themselves being patriotic. But the question is how you outline your patriotism. For many Polish intellectuals who shape the vision of Poland inside and outside, influential people also through the cultural um, works, if you showcase uh, the things in the history of Poland uh, that should be shameful and you actually use it to argue that this is the true history, that this was very popular, that uh, Polishness is about school ghettos for Jews, or Polishness is uh, the Yedwabne massacre. This is the story told around Holocaust and so on. I believe that the opposition between the two extremes of the political parties, despite claiming that patriotism and Polishness is important for us, it's not the case. Some people try to cure themselves of Polishness, and others believe that our history should um, shape positive uh, postures and behaviors in us going forward. So looking at all that from the perspective of the relations, relationships with our countries, uh, the question or the statement that Polishness is tantamount to Europeanism is a pitfall. Because we then try to translate that um, equal equality into on to the other countries. For example, German ness will not equal to European ness or Polish ness. So we should also look at that perspective also, sorry, at that topic also from uh, that point of view. There is 
very little time left, so comments from uh, the two gentlemen on my left hand side. Right, I jotted down certain things, let me see. Concerning uh, the EU, it's, uh, it would be the waste of time to enter into polemics. We are now looking at the wave of elevating the standards. The answer is, of course, it is okay, but only in certain things, and you should not undermine such a certain achievements. So you can as well build an elevator for the disabled, but at the same time upholding your system of values. System Kaleta said, I would um, something, I would uh, so I would take, take this division. If pogroms happened, then whether this is a part of Polishness or not is about our attitudes to it. It does not reflect Polishness in itself. So there is a huge difference between the cultural left and cultural right to that. The cultural right would seek to actually firm up the ideals and find new facets of it to remind people of the things where this ideal manifested itself. The other extreme, the, uh, the left would argue that political criticism is more important based on the Marxist teachings. You should thereby um, undermine or even uh, explode the traditional system of values because those values are bad. So all the negative facts are an easy prey for progressive liberalistic uh, journalists or politicians because it allows them to delegitimize the valuable things in our history because as long as these uh, valuable things exist and have not been removed, there is no way for the left uh, forward. I believe that Mr. Gavkovsky is not uh, uh, very well aware of your formation is for, because your role is to actually destroy uh, what we are defending. I've been always uh, in despair where the right uh, hand the right side politicians try to tell the left side politicians what they think. And it's not like this. Let me rectify things using easy examples. I have I know no politicians who would be uh, crazy about Polishness, and neither do I know a left side politicians. We are all patriots, and that entails taking tough decisions. Despite of your DNA, let me remind uh, my remark about the necessity to arm ourselves and uh, uniform all across the board support by the left parties for the ruling party's decisions to invest in the armed forces. I think that 18 or even 10 months ago, nobody would. Uh, say that the left and uh, the left side of the political spectrum changed their views on the army so dramatically. But this results from our responsible attitudes to the state because it is only when the crisis happened, when it occurred, and you have to take decisions and you can wave the flag of patriotism, only then you can be evaluated for your deeds. 
If the cultural left tries to perform a coup against patriotism, this is not only unjustified, unjust, unjust. This is a co cosmic, nonsensical idea without any uh, any foundations. Poland should bring its patriotism and advertise it by showing that we are very real and credible partner. And this defines the place of Europe and uh, uh, of a strong Poland in Europe. So this is the cultural attitude to patriotism. So we do have a difference, and uh, the difference stems from our perception of the social perspectives. To me, a patriotic society is one that is eligible to take decisions without uh, imposing a yoke, ideological yoke. We should not forbid anything to anyone because of ideal, ideals, ideological differences. But imposing such uh, tight regulations is something unpatriotic. And this is what the patriotic, uh, sorry, what the political class should avoid. Sebastian, Krzysztof and Pavel refer to Christianity several times or to Christian legacy. I'm not approaching that issue, not because I'm out of, uh, the, out of a different DNA. I'm a Catholic, practicing Catholic, and I'm not ashamed of that still being a left party representative. So it's not that we draw division lines to be able to classify people easier. No, a person on the other side of the spectrum are also people, but such who have a different sense of political aesthetics. They speak differently because they matured and they came to a certain conviction that other people may dislike. So to me, it is the ability not to take other people or, or to take the right to speech away from other people. And Mr. Bosak, I'd like to rectify a, a thing because you cannot be a practicing Catholic. Um, uh, uh, sorry, pursuing the current left uh, program. This is called uh, heresy. I, it's the first time that the right wing politician persuades Konovic, uh, so it tries to persuade a left wing politician to apostasy. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Krzysztof uh, Wąsak, National Movement, President of Confederation, Paweł Poncelius, Deputy President of this uh, civil platform, and Mr. Sebastian Kaleta, Solidarna Napolska, Minister of Justice. Thank you, gentlemen.
A warm welcome to you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the next panel entitled Poland, a key player in Europe again. What strategy should we choose? And I have a great pleasure to host magnificent speakers, uh, Jacek Bartoszak, the head of strategy in the future. And on my left hand side, Dr. Jan Paris, former Minister of Defense, politician, and columnist. And straight from Kiev, we have Dr. Adam Eberhard, a forum, former director of the um, uh, Eastern Studies Institute, and now uh, the director of uh, uh, Think Tank, European Studies Institute, I believe. First question, which goes to Jacek Bartosza. Can Poland become a key player in Europe again? Thank you for inviting me. A very difficult role and a very difficult question. The counter question is, have we ever been a key player in Europe before? That's a bad way again. Uh, sorry, the word again. So in order to set things in a context for you, I'll try to outline my answer in the following way. The, this question is difficult to answer, whether we're going to be a key player in Europe going forward, but the current situation, as we see it, poses great challenges to the to Poland's foreign policy that used to be over the couple of decades ago. It must not go on autopilot anymore. We should actively think how to secure our geopolitical environment. And it seems that in our geopolitical and strategic culture and thinking, something started to move. And we are facing a very difficult decision who we are going forward. This is what we need to define. And I think that this fits very well the program of your conference, because this is the question that we have to answer in detail, and only then we can formulate our role by the authorities, by the government in Warsaw. However, even though the mole would assume that our role should grow, but the Polish government has so many flaws especially in the field of of execution, which is still lagging behind in terms of modernity, so that it will be very difficult to fill up with content and thousands of people that void uh, that happened after this change to allow us to play a more important role. I'm pessimistic here, and I would say that the political class should change immediately in order to leverage that role. But it may not, might not happen for many reasons. I just don't want to cover that in a preface. If it uh, depended on you, uh, Doctor, what would the strategic plan for Poland be like? Well, I believe that there was a collapse of uh, the security order and it comes from imbalance. In other words, we have an imbalance amongst the players with the contradictory interests in our part of the world. Now the police state must understand that it has to join the fray and play for equilibrium again. And I think in the past, uh, the, the thought belongs to the past, that it's NATO which will take care of our uh, safety and security. If NATO fails to adjust to the new uh, chaotic situation in the East by um, uh, membership, accepting uh, Ukraine's membership, it will be difficult. Or NATO go uh, continues to exist, but Americans allow certain co coalitions balancing Russia out, then we'll wake up in a completely different world, and the old mental maps from the 1930s will not operate anymore because the safety security system is there to.
prevent war, and this current system has not prevent, prevented a war, the biggest war since 1945, and we cannot find the resolution of this conflict yet. Neither party of that conflict are interested in finding that solution. So that means we are very far away from um, this balance, this equilibrium that is necessary to restore order and to prevent any other war going forward. So this is our task to find that, strike that balance uh, by modernizing uh, armed forces, but probably we'll have to find a common solution with Ukraine, be it with the military alliance, which will be risk uh, risky because Poles go to uh, believe that uh, a military alliance is only thing where we take things rather than give things. And in an alliance, you also guarantee safety or security to others. And we have not, um, we are not accustomed to that thought. So this is where we need a debate. I am very, um, I'm very uh, concerned that we may commit the same error where the Cossacks representatives came to the Polish parliament asking for a greater autonomy. The story was to give them the opportunities to live as they please and in exchange they would balance out Moscow. And today the situation was the same as it is now. The arguments were the same. They don't deserve it. Why we are too weak to uh, allow the uh, Polish Commonwealth to become three parties. So there are tremendous challenges, and we should open a discussion and calculate the pros and the cons because it will be otherwise very difficult to recreate a stable security infrastructure that was uh, destroyed by by russia without including without taking ukraine on board this is what marek budget previously said i, I presume so we need to gear ourselves and the americans up to allowing as part of NATO this to happen. And that makes the situation completely different than it used to be over the past two decades. And the political class should have broader horizons. Uh, military reform needs to be completed. We'll have to also put money, as money aside for this because this is going to be a bigger uh, structure than the free riding that we uh, were doing in the past decade. Historically, we, we, uh, as we spoke today and, and yesterday, the rejection of this Cossack or Cossack uh, suggestion was, there was the beginning of the end of the Republic of Poland. Maybe right now we are in a, in a much better situation. We have discussed that uh, in question to Dr. Jan Paris. The same question to you, Doctor, about this concept of Poland. Can Poland still be again? Can be again a key or an important player in Europe? Uh, thank you very much for this question. It should be it should be stated clearly. When addressing, if we want to address this question, we um, we are going to talk about the foreign affairs and the foreign policy. And uh, as a word of introduction, I would like to quote one of my uh, conversations with uh, the leader of uh, law and justice. Uh, I tried to explain to him that uh, law and justice should uh, devote more time to foreign affairs. I heard, uh, well, you don't win the election with the foreign affairs. It's true. Well, the foreign affairs will not make you the winner in, in the general election, but with a good or bad uh, foreign affairs, uh, uh, foreign, uh, foreign policy, uh, that state, uh, you may find your state and your country in a very bad or a very good situation, political situation. So uh, I want to show you how difficult it is to improve and to um, uh, to, uh, uh, to improve our foreign policy, uh, to make Poland an important player in this game. 
it should be openly stated that, uh, in my opinion, we can't, uh, we are incapable of using this, these positive times well. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a disaster for Ukraine, but uh, but there are two variants we should we should consider if there is uh, the peace and uh, the war is finished uh, uh, we will lose our uh, current position because our position has strengthened uh, since uh, february the 24th uh, these, uh, this position has been uh, leveraged by uh, by a ukraine by the situation our our situation is now different our position in 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 europe is different. With the defeat of Ukraine, we will have the Russian army in Podkarpatia region at our borders, uh, at our border. And this solution is very disadvantageous for us. Uh, what, uh, what does it mean for us? Uh, we should be able to use this advantageous situation and position for uh, for the benef our benefit in the spring of uh, this year. We had the, the uh, visits uh, visited by many uh, many um, many important uh, political players. The, the Secretary of State, the Under Secretary of State. Uh, Mike, I have a simple question. Uh, at that time. Have we, did we achieve anything? Did we achieve anything apart from uh, shaking hands and smiles? Uh, in my opinion, no. no. Uh, do you remember the, the NATO summit in June, a few months after uh, after uh, after the, the the beginning of the war, uh, nothing was achieved at that time either. Please re recollect, 2016, we went to this, uh, this uh, uh, anti-missile um, uh, uh, installations, but, and uh, we got consent for. Uh, for thousands of uh, troops to be to be relegated and uh, to be deployed in Poland, uh, is our diplomacy uh, efficient? Is it uh, is is it uh, is our diplomacy useful? Uh, for me, no. Uh, the head of uh, of uh, the foreign uh, affairs um, minister, ministry is in a very good position has three uh, major assets and no when uh, not in the hands uh, in the hands of the of the polish government before uh, we are going to have uh, a big NATO base uh, near Rzeszów. Uh, we uh, we we have we have uh, uh, we have commissioned uh, 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 the, the um, weapons uh, uh, worth, of, worth of millions of uh, dollars. Uh, so this situation is very advantageous for us. And what have we, what have we achieved? So, uh, bearing in mind those those big contracts uh, worth millions of uh, dollars, with uh, we should have the natural offsets for for Poland. Uh, I've, I'm afraid that we haven't achieved anything. We are not able to use our assets even if we have them in hand. This is my uh, answer to the question, can Poland be uh, an important player? You need to be skillful to do that and you need to work to do that. Uh, for conditions for requirements need to be met uh, for Poland to become an important player. But that I will share with you in a moment. Kiev, uh, Dr. Uh, Adam uh, Berhardt. A similar question. A question about the strategy for, po for Poland so that we become an important uh, or maybe even a key player in Europe. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you. I'm, I'm very glad that you have changed the, the the shape of this of this question slightly because uh, being a key player, this this term, a key player, may be very difficult to define. What does it mean to be a key player? If you are a key player, then you you have this key influence on the 
in the, uh, the situ on the situation, whereas we know that uh, it's very difficult to obtain, to achieve. Uh, uh, that's what we observe in, in our policy towards Ukraine after February the 24th, and not only due to geographical location, but also to some other other reasons and other factors, uh, um, and with the social exceptions, to, to mention just one, we may be uh, a key player in some regional issues uh, when, the, um, when the economy is right. Uh, uh, but uh, we are the fifth uh, um, member state of the European Union. Our, our GDP is uh, uh, six times lower than, than the German GDP, and Germany is becoming more and more nationally egoistic and are supported with uh, by by France uh, and my impression is that uh, that their actions uh, tend to be more and more systemic uh, France will not leave and uh, uh, will not uh, um, will not leave the, uh, the the policy. The central eastern central European policy will not give up uh, this policy. So uh, coming back to your question, uh, we uh, I believe that we have the necessary potential to play this important this key role uh, in certain areas. Uh, there are other areas uh, in which we will never be uh, key players, uh, but our position can be leveraged. Uh, over our, our real potential. I have heard on a number of occasions here uh, the Cossacks uh, uh, against the background of Ukraine and uh, events in Ukraine. After all those uh, years, uh, um, dis the, the dissolution of uh, agreements uh, uh, representing gigantic, a gigantic chance for Poland uh, and starting new relations between Poland and Ukraine. And uh, I believe that those relations uh, between uh, our two countries uh, should be should have their roots not only in the in the contemporary conflict, in the, in the present conflict, but uh, I believe that our uh, role should naturally be in intense. We should develop uh, the necessary tools. Uh, to strengthen our relations and collaboration with uh, our Ukrainian partner by some social links, by influencing the Ukrainian elites. For 30 years, we, we, haven't, had, we haven't had any pro-Polish uh, uh, parties in Ukraine. It may change. It is uh, changing, and there are certain instruments, uh, uh, tools which uh, can be used uh, to influence even to influence the, the Ukrainian army even Ukraine is uh, is sometimes perceived as the Turkey of uh, of, uh, of 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 Europe and or uh, we should follow the the shape of the structure of uh, certain treaties uh, uh, to use what has already been uh, established uh, and we should use this foundation of collaboration uh, and to add uh, some economic relations to that. Uh, I'm, right now I'm in Kiev. Uh, our institute is engaged in the, res uh, the, re uh, the reconstruction plan for Ukraine. Uh, tomorrow in the center of, the, of Kiev, uh, despite the attacks by the Russian, uh, we are about to, uh, to talk and discuss uh, very concrete instruments to promote uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian reconst the reconstruction of the Ukrainian um, economy. Uh, we are now developing and will be developing uh, the necessary tools to start the reconstruction process and to continue it when after the war has been finished. So I believe in this economic foundation of our presence in 
in the east, in the central and eastern Europe, this region is very important. We have defined it uh, as a as a region of tri tri seas uh, region uh, with uh, certain links uh, with uh, uh, with Europe. Uh, we should add this uh, uh, north uh, south uh, axis. Uh, um, and uh, to, uh, to in order to develop a certain hub, uh, we should also add uh, uh, some um, IT and digital uh, digital flash to this structure, and that's how we are developing uh, developing hopes uh, for uh, for structures here uh, where Poland should could uh, play an important role in. So, so that's how we try to influence and change the, uh, to strengthen the uh, the role of Poland on the public, on the European uh, arena. We hear from many uh, observers that uh, Poland uh, engages uh, engages in assisting Ukraine uh, too much. Uh, uh, Whereas uh, when the war is over and the reconstruction process in Ukraine starts, Ukraine will choose Germany anyway. So do you believe uh, being there and studying all those issues, also as a head of the Eastern Studies, uh, do you believe that uh, that Poland can be the winner of this of this peace, uh, Ukrainian peace? Well, of course, uh, Poland will be much more agile. Sorry, Germany. I'm sorry, Germany will be more agile uh, and will be able maybe to offer uh, much much more uh, in terms of uh, the construction, um, in terms of uh, the reconstruction of of, uh, of the military. Uh, that's something we lack. Uh, our potential is not that uh, great. Our potential is weaker there. Our companies uh, from this sector are weaker there. Uh, but still, we could establish relationships with our partners, such as uh, uh, such as the U.S., such as Japan, even. We, but we also, it's our role to make sure that uh, that the reconstruction of Ukraine is not a top-down process, but a bottom-up process. Uh, we uh, don't want to have uh, international companies uh, um, just landing, landing in Ukraine, providing their services, issuing their invoice, and leaving the Ukraine and leaving, leaving Ukraine. Uh, we uh, count on uh, something more. Uh, we believe that uh, it's possible to engage weaker companies uh, in this whole process, and that's where the potential for Poland lies. Uh, uh, thanks to some social capital, our our um, existing links, but also by B two by means of B two B contacts, uh, the Polish and Ukrainian business. Uh, uh, some time ago, uh, we uh, we hosted a big conference in Warsaw that was attended by 1,300 uh, participants, uh, that aimed at creating those uh, the, at network, aimed at networking and starting links and creating developing the collaboration. That's how we, that's how we perceive our role. Uh, we will never be a key player there, but we can earn on that even more with our existing potential. I would like to come back to Dr. Jacek Bartosiak. What, should, what would have to happen uh, uh, in terms of the strategic, uh, uh, strategical culture for Poland to win, uh, to become the key player? How about a strong army? Is it important? Uh, it's, you, you said it, it's, it's happening. It was happening. What else within this Polish strategy? What else would you add uh, to this strategy to make us uh, successful? Uh, we should start by what was pointed out by Minister. Mm. Uh, please remember that the election is not uh, the most important uh, because the international economy uh, will change and the uh, the politicians will be replaced by other politicians. And uh, uh, why? Be because of because of hyperinflation, for instance. So, 
Everything may change due to due to war, due to the war uh, on our national market. It is all very hard to, because this is this this brings us to the way of Western uh, Western countries. Uh, that's how the democracy functions in the Western countries uh, right now. The Polish political class. Uh, uh, was like uh, was in this auto mode uh, for a long uh, for a long time, and now they have to change it, and that's that's what what this is all this all is about. Uh, you, you need to add more. You have to shape uh, the geopolitical uh, environment uh, surrounding your country uh, by, in my opinion, opening those business tracks. Uh, uh, with Ukraine business links with Ukraine by strengthening strengthening what Ukraine cannot exist without uh, after the war in the time of the reconstruction let's forget about the European Union the European Union doesn't matter here we have to we have to state it openly Ukraine will understand that we should open our com a completely new chapter in terms of our relations uh, with the US uh, and their, pers their understanding of their role should change and will change to Please do well. This incident with a missile is is the best example. I I don't want to discuss that in detail. What doesn't matter what happens there, but uh, what it uh, what it resulted in is what matters. The problem is that we should use this moment to uh, force uh, some guarantees from the Americans, uh, security guarantees uh, from Americans. I. I'm not convinced that Poland has used this opportunity 100%. Uh, we need to be we need to be coherent, and the response from NATO also needs to be coherent. Uh, the Polish state, uh, as uh, Polish uh, Polish citizens, the Polish nationals were die were killed. Uh, uh, the Polish state should act and should react, uh, not openly, but uh, Americans need to pay for. For such mistakes, let me quote the mistake uh, mistakes committed in on the first uh, Iraqi war, and the uh, and the, and the attacks. Uh, uh, Israeli were uh, were actually uh, a war rewarded by the by Americans not to respond to attacks. So Americans control were in control of. Uh, of various uh, various uh, actions there, and Americans are actually accustomed to paying for uh, for uh, for what they want to be involved in. Uh, it's very normal for them. It's just an example of uh, what the real strategical culture is about. Uh, we all have to remember that we all have our interests, our national interests. We should absolutely open a new uh, chapter and, uh, of our, uh, well, in, in discussing our relations and collaboration with Americans. Uh, otherwise, we, we can talk about the lack of strategical culture. Israel could have uh, this potential to respond uh, and could escalate uh, the conflict uh, um, but for the American intervention, uh, that did not happen. That didn't happen. So we adopt some modern uh, concepts. We have a real uh, uh, strategic uh, strategical concept, uh, and uh, we are really capable of uh, entering a uh, opening a completely new chapter. Uh, Dr. Eberhardt has mentioned that in the context again in the context of Germany, uh, there started a debate in in the US uh, about uh, maybe the end of uh, the end of, uh, of of a certain era maybe Russia is already f well tired of this of this chapter maybe maybe a new chapter of peace should uh, be introduced please um, let's hope that Germany will will not have to rebuild and reconstruct both Ukraine and Russia because it's quite a uh, quite a uh, probable and it could happen or it would happen if uh, Poland couldn't uh, present uh, uh, its full potential in front of uh, the Americans well as I, as I said uh, our geopolitical model uh, 
requires from us uh, a greater involvement than we are able to offer. But we can offer professional concepts, professional reforms, uh, not only purchases of, uh, of military equipment. And, uh, and please add, add to it our ability to talk to uh, Ukrainians. This is, this is our potential, and that's what we could tempt the Americans uh, with. Uh, so it's not only uh, it's not only uh, copy paste. The NATO doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't make any deals in, in the Ukraine. Uh, I hope that it's a it's a lesson for our for for us too. There are many more examples, but may I just focus just on that and the economic context. The Polish government as any governments and the other governments do they go and negotiate even how the legislation is written to one protect the Polish interests and two um, uh, support them today we see the globalizing happen there is a discussion between the US and the Europe about competitiveness and it's nothing wrong with putting uh, those uh, matters forward in such a way. For example, Germ Germans are doing the same because they are globalizing their industry. So let's not repeat the empty statements that, uh, that, that don't work anymore in, this, in those difficult times. To the minister now, question a ball into your court and the backstage I hear that we should not demand put overly demands over well, too many demands to Americans because they will perhaps leave us and let us let us go I think a good foreign policy starts with a diagnose it's not sufficient. It, is, it does not suffice to say that America is our natural ally and Europe is our natural economic environment. Whether we like it or not, the main partner in Europe is Germany, both in terms of politics and in terms of economy. So we should therefore become aware of politics around us, be it in Russia, Germany or France, not a resulting from bilateral relations. It doesn't matter anymore. For example, the policy of Germany versus Poland is a function of relations that Germany have been building with Russia and the US. So you have to understand that our relations are a result of a complicated game that uh, other countries, those other countries play in Europe and they, they have a different perception of our role in Europe. We are not going to improve our bilateral relations with Germany unless we have actually agreed on the role of uh, Germany in Europe. Today, uh, relations have been zeroed, reset, and even they're in a negative uh, area because we are looking at a political and financial war of Germany with Poland. But it all results from Germans perceiving their role in Europe differently than we are. They want to be a hegemon and we want to safeguard to protect our sovereignty. So the fundamental thing is to understand that with our nation state, with its location, potential, diplomacy is not a uh, some of bilateral relations that you have to look at it from a wider perspective and let me put it bluntly the German diplomats are nodding yes that's exactly what it is we cannot uh, strike a deal with you 
in any detail because we differ so much in the fundamentals about what Europe should look like. And when Polish politicians come and they demand that they want this or that, the Germans are indifferent. Of course, when you run foreign policy, you become inevitably in conflict with the interests of the stronger countries. To manage that, you need to have a stronger economy because only then you can be assertive without the ability of imposing anybody uh, anything to on anybody, but at least you can refuse to comply. But it's a little bit too little. If you want to object to imperial demands of uh, the Germans, we need to look for allies and you have to work hard on finding them. If you analyze the activity of the German politicians in uh, 2019 in the US, you will see it was a fantastic accomplishment. The throngs of them went there, lying or not lying, and Americans believed in many lies. And please count on how many times our delegations visited the US. It was hardly ever, so lack of activity on our part. Now, to make strong relations with America, there must not be unidimensional and the military terms only. They have to be supported by trade, by economic cooperation and many others. Also, you have to invest in your foreign policy. It's not about investing in the budget of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not at all. Without, there is no political influence without foreign investments. We are too small a country to invest anywhere, everywhere, and promising and to invest in China and South America and everywhere in Africa. It's an empty promise. We don't have a sufficient economic potential. I do agree that uh, trade marum is a very important thing. But that means that we should have strong investments in all the three Marum countries. That every Polish investor in Lithuania, in Hungary, Croatia, Romania should obtain very strong support by the Polish state, by the Polish banks. And this is what is still missing. It's good that we construct power lines as part of the trimerium or pipelines or whatever. That's good. But please ask how many times a minister of foreign affairs or finance or economy and development met Polish investors who have already set foot abroad in those countries. And I will tell you, you none knows not a single time over the past seven years because they are indifferent. They don't understand that at all. And there have been very um, very strong uh, ways how to do it that has been said many years ago. and. Polish investors are being pushed out of certain markets without enjoying support of Polish diplomacy or the Polish state at large. So I do agree that Trimarum, Poland needs Trimarum, Trimarum needs Poland, a strong and active Poland, and not Poland that smiles and signs declarations on behalf of the prime ministers, because this is not how you build Poland's position in Europe as a player. Right before I give the floor to the doctor, Mr. Bartoszak wanted to comment. Yes, indeed, this is a very important thought that you uh, said, uh, Professor, in terms of strategic culture. 
there is a fundamental difference between Poland and Germany in terms of strategic culture. The German state is about the chains of supply for the German industry that the political class in Germany supports and maintains. And this is good because that is sound for Germany. Therefore, they achieve margins. The um, German workers are happy and Bayern Munich plays good football. Now, we don't have any industry of ours anymore. We don't have strong capital anymore. So the political class is actually uh, high in the air and the political void or vacuum rather than uh, with their feet firmly planted on the on, on the ground so if we want to put up a fight against germany want to consolidate uh, the position in europe uh, you need to be aware of the fact that we are playing ping pong they're playing tennis uh, because uh, germany have not been leveraged out of ukraine the true position is where you have where there is money and who decides where this money flows and not a theater I'd love this yet to be a value a currency but it's not possible uh, only if the Americans say that Zeshev and Yashonka is important then it will be important for the time being and unless we are able to build up a true economy where the political class makes sure that our political cycles and margins are important and that the political class uh, performs a subservient role to Polish business, we will say the same thing every year all over, the, all over and over again. The political class's duty is to support business and not the other way around. But, but the problem is the noble culture, nobility culture in in, in Poland in the previous centuries where the nobility was not involved in any business. And if there is public money to spend, even better. So I spoke to politicians who felt ashamed that they were photographed with a businessman. And it's exactly opposite in Germany. And if time comes, it won't be Poland to re, uh, rebuild Ukraine because we have not we don't have the potential. Polish business tries to make a wide bird around the Polish embassy because it breeds problems only. So if you want to become innovative and uh, leave this uh, medium income petfall or trap, the political class needs to change the habits how they operate sorry for my interjection a lot of those flying anointment i'd say to summarize them, I'd say that Poland has a tremendous momentum and a window of opportunity opened wide, which is which remains unused. Do you agree, Doctor? Well, I hardly ever agree with the statements that are unequivocal. Of course, there are many shortcomings, but if you look at the Poland's capital expansion the previous three decades in Central Europe, we did investments that supported our um, long sightedness, such as presence in the bank sector in Ukraine or investment in the refineries in Lithuania. It was not that Poland, Polish state failed to pursue any policy. Let me quote a certain unorthodox example. Since we speak about a small country, I am honored to have supported the prime minister 
and Moldova in terms of Polish involvement, and I believe that several things were quite successful. It's not uh, the credit is not mine. It was thanks to various officials from many ministries who were busy implementing projects, such as supporting the power generation industry in Moldova. Financial support we have. Uh, triple the, the development aid in Moldova and the development aid it is basically a political instrument dressed up in beautiful disguise we have Polish advisors in Moldova and the various talks are underway about our capital expansion there is a mechanism of combined loans where the Polish companies entering Moldova to set a firm foothold they're using this financial instrument and I would say yes that active pol uh, foreign policy costs money you have to invest first for a small Moldova it is much easier than in Ukraine, it's more difficult there, especially that uh, have been some objective problems on the way. Ukraine used to be a deeply or oligarch and corrupt state where every decision about investing capital was uh, encumbered with high risk. And PKOBP and PZU have lost quite a lot of money in Ukraine, were, uh, which are now occupied by the Russian Federation. I focused on the infrastructure instruments in my speech because if there are roads and if there is a traffic on the north-south axis, it makes it easier for Polish business to decide to commit themselves. If we had been able to create to erect better infrastructure, roads, uh, power, and uh, border crossing points, uh, with Ukraine or Ukraine would have been much stronger in um, standing up to Russian aggression. Poland would have made more money on its export, and it's not the negligence of the Polish authorities that was decisive. There was an instrument to build a more user-friendly border of $100 million, sorry, Euro. But Ukraine was indifferent because uh, no bribes were offered, basically, or could uh, have been offered. So I'd like to put some shades to this black and white picture. I believe that the Polish office tradition in Poland is not very conducive. Uh, the officials are not very much committed as they should be. But it doesn't mean that the diplomatic missions are absolutely indifferent to business. And I believe that business should commit themselves, really, using the aid instruments as well. Of course, the war will reshuffle the security infrastructure. This will be combined with the costs for Poland, because thus we have become a frontline state. And Russia has uh, great instruments, powerful instruments to actually uh, de de destroy and demolish uh, the infrastructure. I am in a hotel which has a generator, but the rest of the city is covered in black. There is no electricity for many hours. There has been no electricity for many hours. and. We have, we can't appreciate the results of those bombardments. But I believe that the confrontation with Russia will speed up decoupling with China. It's going to proceed much faster than we thought it will be. It would be possible. 
we see the so-called nearshoring, where the European companies transfer capital back to Europe, perhaps to the Central Europe, where it would be much safer against the communication or the traffic or strategic risk. So I believe that this is a big opportunity for us. Being a frontline state, we will have to spend more on defense, at the same time gaining more because of a strategic location on the map of Europe, which will become more important both for our American and European partners. So we need to actually take actions to squeeze as much of it as possible. I would like to uh, I would like to ask all of you to make a wrap up statement. Two minutes for each of you, uh, gentlemen, please. This is a completely new opening. Uh, there is this uh, uh, severe uh, competition between the U.S. and China. Uh, we hear that. Um, the Americans, Americans and uh, the Chinese uh, uh, even have influence uh, on the shape of uh, this uh, of the the shape of, of this war, the Ukrainian war. This is like a, a like a Copernicus revolution. China is now much uh, more powerful than uh, they used to be. Uh, China, together with Americans, set the nuclear. And nuclear well, settlements, and, and they have great influence on uh, in many areas. Uh, uh, great chaos uh, is starting. This uh, global governance is finished, uh, and uh, we just already observe it. It will start uh, uh, social distress and uh, questioning a number of uh, things uh, certain uh, to us uh, previously, uh, like the European Union, for instance. This is the time that, uh, uh, this is the, the period that we're entering. Uh, the strategic culture is born in such times. Uh, great crises, crises uh, just like in human, human being lives, uh, a death, a divorce, uh, make us think and uh, come up with new ideas and new solutions. I hope that uh, this crisis uh, that uh, we are now in uh, will make our leaders, uh, our state leaders, uh, think and work intensely to lead this uh, country to a completely new chapter. For me, it is about to last. It is. It is to last about several years, so. and then we will see some governance, uh, some new deal. Uh, I would like uh, to say that uh, that Russia was defeated, uh, but uh, historically speaking, uh, Russians uh, Russians sometimes start uh, start poor. But then they end up in Yalta and Pochtamus and uh, and in um, on other pre they are present everywhere. I I hope this time it will be otherwise. It will be different. Uh, our country needs to work hard and needs to take the risk. Uh, I'm not sure if the political class is capable of uh, of uh, taking this burden. Thank you. Doctor. Mr. Minister, uh, the basis of our uh, foreign ministry is in, uh, in our uh, caring for, for our safety. So safety has always been and will still is our priority. It makes us different from, from compared to other European countries. You have to realize that. Even now, a few months after this war was started, uh, some European countries uh, keep uh, talking and thinking about uh, economic, uh, uh, economic uh, offset and economic uh, opportunities that this war brings. So whereas we don't uh, discuss the war in those um, in, in, in those aspects, and we don't we don't perceive the war this way. Uh, 
And there is this question, uh, taking the, the safety, uh, taking the safety is our, our utmost priority. Does that result in a certain, uh, um, is there any follow-up? Uh, I mean here the staff in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, its policy and its actions. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not certain, I'm not certain because uh, because uh, we still lack uh, experts who specialize in, uh, uh, in safety. You can't learn that uh, from books. Uh, you just need uh, to learn it. Uh, and you need to develop this ex expertise. Uh, let's not waste the chance and the opportunity that this, uh, this war presents and this crisis presents. And for me, this war is an opportunity for us. And the last word uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Aberhard. Well, I, I fully agree with what Mr. Minister has just said after exceeding uh, the European Union, NATO. Uh, we, many of us uh, uh, started believing that we are on the safe side. Uh, and that the East and uh, Eastern Europe is uh, no longer a risk to us uh, due to uh, our, our joining, uh, joining the, the alliance. Uh, we have had the war for nine months in uh, Ukraine with very clear repercussions uh, for the safety of Poland too with uh, repercussions and, and economic consequences. So we don't know who will win. I'm deeply convinced that Russia uh, in the long run uh, will lose, but at what cost? And uh, what, uh, how much uh, Russia, how, how, how much of, of the global governance will be ruined by Russia in this war? We need to get ready. We need to be prepared for difficult uh, scenarios, and we uh, need to multiply the, our funds on, on security. We need to develop our, 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 our links with, uh, uh, with players. Uh, in the Western Western Europe, our position uh, has become stronger. We are now treated uh, as a key uh, key um, player and key partner to uh, Ukrainian uh, political elites. It was not certain from the very from the very beginning. It's not only because of the geopolitical location of uh, of our country. Um, we complain about about our foreign policy, but please uh, uh, take the Romanian foreign affairs. Uh, uh, what has uh, Romania done to improve and to strengthen its position in this conflict? To become a conflict? To be able to to deter Russia? How many uh, red lines has this country crossed uh, for the for the last nine months? Uh, we have done that on a number of occasions uh, for the nine months. And we know what should be done to support militarily, uh, what should be done to support Ukraine mili in, militarily. But we need to invest in our economy, we need to invest in our presence. Uh, we need to uh, set set up new structural uh, links. Uh, we need to develop our links to central uh, central uh, European states, and these should be our uh, priorities for the coming years. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacek Bartoszak, Minister. Jan Harris, uh, and from here, Dr. Adam Eberhardt, thank you for participating in the, uh, for, the, for the discussion. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, let me invite you to the next panel. Poland, Poland as an idea. Poland as an idea, can it still be attractive and uh, attractive? And I would like to introduce our panel, Professor uh, Romuald Szelemietiev, uh, welcome. Jacek Karnowski, uh, uh, the Sheci Weekly. Piotr Trudnowski, uh, the Agilonian Club. My name is Jakub Maciejewski, and I also represent Krakow, so we have a nice representation of, uh, of the true historic uh, uh, capital of Poland. Dear gentlemen, let me start uh, by this imperia. I have, uh, I have come back from, from Ukraine, from uh, Kherson. I have been there for 150 days. I have been there in Kherson, and, uh, and I, I, I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, the city uh, full of, uh, of, uh, of happy, happy people who, despite they don't have the electricity, they are uh, bombarded by, by, by the Russian attack uh, from tanks uh, after eight months of, uh, of uh, occupation. Uh, uh, is the city that lacks infrastructure is deprived of electricity and deprived of many many um, very basic things is still happy and uh, there isn't there isn't anything there but there are no russians there neither at Kherson, uh, november 2022 and this uh, magical magical moment uh, poland as an idea on my vest uh, on my on my uh, uh, bulletproof vest you have uh, you have um, our flag uh, uh, it's a it's a, it's absolute uh, crazy craziness uh, me myself uh, and this flag on my on my bulletproof uh, vest uh, uh, well, raised so much enthusiasm among among the inhabitants of Kherson, and the Polish state is doing so much for for the Ukrainians, uh, for the Ukrainian. Uh, um, there, there is so much enthusiasm. I'm even I'm, uh, flooded with it. Uh, I, my picture, my picture, my photo was uh, uh, was assigned as as a, uh, as a survivor and uh, and, a, a, and a and a soldier who has spread uh, freeze the freeze the city from Russian occupation. Uh, it just reminds me of uh, some some words from from. Uh, uh, from uh, from newspapers that um, Andrzej Duda is a wonderful president of Poland. Uh, um, well, um, let's take the con concentration camps. I'm not talking about the concentration camps uh, of the, from the Second World War, uh, but the contemporary concentration camps. Uh, those uh, kept in those concentration camps didn't could did not want to talk about their their fate, their their, their stories. Uh, in, before they were they were uh, shown a picture with uh, uh, President uh, Duda, Andrzej Duda. Uh, our troops and our army is the strongest, uh, the second strongest after the Americans. Uh, it's not that the Ukrainians want to in, uh, in get us involved in this in this war. This is just the perception of our actions and of our, our soldiers. Uh, um, Ukrainians, together with with you, Poles, uh, will defeat Russia in three months. Uh, Poland is present in Ukraine nowadays, uh, uh, fully, absolutely. Uh, this uh, this reception uh, by Ukrainians is just overwhelming. It's really unbelievable. This soft power was was present and has been has been has been uh, present uh, for. Uh, for a long time, and this is what I mean by the idea of Pol Polishness. Uh, could you continue, gentlemen? Well, well, you've you've raised the bar. Hmm. Well, about this idea. Well, as you. No, already my name, my last name is Sheremetev. Doesn't sound nice. Uh, uh, 
You have invited me for this discussion on the Polish idea. Does it sound nice? I um, I'm in. I read the uh, Professor Novak's uh, uh, history of Poland uh, and the Polish Soviet uh, history, and I keep uh, encountering the name of one of the leaders, Sheremetyev's uh, uh, name. There, Sheremetyev. I used to be an important figure and has uh, been an important figure in the Russian history for uh, some centuries. And I once met uh, the ambassador of Russia and the Ministry of Defense and I remember talking to him and he said, he says, how is it possible that uh, you, Sheremetyev, is the Ministry of Defense of Poland? Well, you see, Mr. Ambassador, how powerful Poland is. Sheremetyev is a power and works in the Ministry of Defense. I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of my, my, my surname, but my father, my father was a Russian, but he uh, chose uh, Poland. And Unfortunately, uh, he never came back uh, in 1945. I was two weeks old then, yeah, then. And I remember growing up and the father, father of my mother, my mother's, Lubovitsky, persuaded me to change my surname. Why don't you take Lubovitsky as your surname? The Polish don't like those Russians. And then that's that's how you will always be associated. Uh, that's how you will always be, uh, well, perceived uh, as. Whereas I've never done it. And another observation is about my wife. My wife wanted to have a double surname when marrying me. Her name, uh, her surname is wonders beautiful. She has a beautiful Polish surname. And she didn't want uh, to have only Sheremetyev as a surname. And sometimes I get uh, a, a letter from from um, from my uh, from my wife. Uh, I'm talking about the past when I was uh, when I was in prison in the times of solidarity. And I remember and remember she uh, Isabella. Her name is Isabella. Isabella and double names, and double surnames, and and she once uh, told me at those times that uh, she finally, she finally wanted to, that she finally, finally decided that Sheremetyev was a nice surname and she would stay with only one surname, mine. And Polishness, what is it? Maybe the idea of Polishness will become more powerful. It's a difficult choice. Because taking uh, seriously what was written in the history books, uh, if uh, taking uh, that uh, everything that has been said about our values is true, uh, God, uh, honor, and patria, then it's very serious. You really have to understand it with your heart, not with your mind. When you view Polishness, from this perspective, you will see that being Polish and feeling Polishness uh, is very demanding from an individual. But when you take on this uh, challenge, then you become convinced and you realize that something noble is happening. As uh, Polishness, uh, the way I feel it, is noble. Polishness distinguishes us from uh, other nations. 
Also historically, it distinguishes us and that irritates others uh, around us internationally because they don't have this uh, experience. They don't have this history. And therefore, there are so many who don't like us so much and they try to prove to us and convince us that we are not that good, that we are not exceptional, that what we boast about is really is is not noble at all. They're, they try to convince us that uh, that we uh, that that we couldn't be German or Russian that we are not exceptional at all. Why is it exceptional to be a uh, Polish? Why is this Polishness exceptional? I follow in many uh, many discussions and uh, and I'm quite uh, and I'm quite curious about this uh, this uh, appro this attitude and uh, among some of the interlocutors. Uh, you keep saying, well, it's not that good, that, the, 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 that everything around us, around us is not that good, that it could be better. And though those Murphy laws, it won't work, it won't work. This kind of mindset is very, very present. Uh, this approach full with this uh, trace of pessimism is present, whereas uh, I believe that Poland keeps developing, uh, everything's going well. Of course, uh, we have some obstacles, uh, problems, and, but Poland is growing, is developing, is strengthening its position, and uh, all those events uh, happening also in Ukraine this makes our development um, make our development our development even uh, stronger. Uh, they say that uh, that uh, people are either optimistic optimists or pessimists. Um, it may be true. I'm an I'm an optimist myself, uh, and uh, I. I was an optimist even at the time of this uh, filthy communism. Uh, and I remember my my father-in-law uh, talking to me. Remember, come on, they will kill you. You won't you won't succeed. Uh, and after years, when I. Uh, when I uh, uh, when I had a first meeting with my father-in-law uh, after becoming the Minister of Defense, he said to me, "Well, I'm very glad and I'm very proud that you that you had never listened to me, and that's what I'm proud of. And I can't boast about that because I'm Polish. We keep existing, we keep doing well, even though our situation." our geopolitical location between the Russian and the German, uh, we should be non-existent. Professor, you spoke about optimism. That is of key importance in the Polish public debate. Do we stand a chance or do we not? I'd like to pass on this back to Mr. Karnowski about optimism, because he seems to be optimistic as well. I liked him. So may I start with the following comment. Uh, the name Sheremetyev uh, haven't sounded to my ears Russian at all, never. It sounded very Polish, so I thank you, Professor, for this very valuable 
House chair position and the debate on the selection of the leaders of the Second Republic. It was always painful to me because uh, many participants in this debate passed the border when to uh, the contempt for the Polish blood spilled begins. And uh, however, people who were at the helm of Poland uh, did uh, exercised the duty because a world war erupted. Uh, what they didn't foresee was the degree of extermination. I had a discussion with Hungarians once, and the lead of Fidesz with Prime Minister Orban the other day, and there were quite prominent people from the political uh, life in Ukraine. And uh, it was said, you always uh, Romanians, you are imprudent. You start uh, the help immediately without thinking. And I said, well, we have gambled in our history. We banked on unorthodox or uh, d uh, different, uh, sorry, difficult cards. But it was not because we were unreasonable. It was because we didn't have any cards to play. We had to prevent invasions or russification, of course. But you can see a large uh, cart, uh, sorry, a large Polish state is still on the chart. And you, Hungarians, are a very small country. Uh, in spite of your rationalism and uh, prudence and so on. So our choices have not been so reasonable. There was a debate amongst the historians about what uh, road, which road to independence were right and which were wrong. And someone said uh, all of them were right because we are sitting here. So to Jakub's question, there, um, there is some optimism and pessimism to it, and we should cast at it, a, cast a glance at it from historical perspective. And I think wise people and several generations will ask the question: Were you among those people who wanted to reinforce this opportunity? Because this is an opportunity, because the Polish state is still. Uh, in the hands of the independent uh, cl ruling class, uh, sorry, ruling class that favors independence. And also, as you might know, uh, the politics is out of possibilities, of opportunities. Sometimes you have to tack. And the question is whether we have um, grasped this unbelievable opportunity and or did we take a different choice because of personal reasons? So the question is, the question about the Polish idea is very important. Let me reflect on share or share an observation with you. There is a program in BBC Radio 4, a very elite radio channel called Inner Time. This a uh, 40 odd minute debate on contemporary history, on science and globe. It is moderated by Melvin Breck and all the generation journalists. It is uh, aired, it has been aired for 40 years now, every weekend. The topics range from Alexander the Great to um, landing in Normandy and so on. There was one um, program uh, about Poland, whereas uh, the 50 programs are about Russia. And there's one about Poland, the first republic, first Polish Commonwealth. So it was quite interesting, but it was only one. The other time where Poland appeared was uh, the program devoted to um, monk orders, like the German Teutonic Order and others. So it was the second time Poland has been mentioned. 
and the left wing say that this is the proof that you are hopeless and you matter nothing. No, I'd say, I would rather say that existence of Poland is not a natural state of Europe because the modernity has been shaped in the 19th century. All sciences, political and social sciences and economic science were born in 19th century and they adjust to the world where Poland was no more there. Well, there used to be five powers, now we have a different situation. So if we add on top of that the existence of our two powerful neighbors, I would say that as long as Poles want Poland to exist, Poland will exist. So this is what makes the, our will of existence uh, so important, because other countries may uh, actually exist by virtue of, the, of gravity, um, and we cannot. Well, every thousand years there is a change, of course, yes, you might say so. Well, that's not by coincidence that we rotate around the idea of a mission. Mission is very important, and we do have a sort of a mission. Let me recall something that happened three days ago. Professor Richard Legutsky, I know that many MEPs take the floor, and this is iconic what he did. At the 70th anniversary of the European Parliament, with a very hostile room, he proposed a creed of a resistance to what we, what hopefully will not turn to a new totalitarianism. He says, there is no demos. You shout about tolerance, you are not tolerant. You celebrate diversity, but you close yourselves in a bubble with uh, the very same. So Poland upholds the banner of objections and in favor of uh, prop, pro of tolerance and, and uh, fighting against totalitarianism and of common in favor of common sense. So we do have a problem, and I. And becoming very acutely aware of that when I speak with foreigners, there are journalists coming over and uh, they usually visit liberal media, but sometimes they visit us too for the sake of uh, prudence. And I sometimes try to tell them too much of our story. This is an error. This is not a single error of individuals. It is a gravest error of our message. Maybe our history is too complicated to be um, explained uh, in a very complicated manner. But we should, I think, come up with uh, nutshells that contain content that uh, are more di palatable for the world around us. Poland as the hobbits of Europe, something like that, along those lines. You should, I think, look for cultural associations that everybody understands. And also, we need to be rich. If you look at the map of Europe, wealth is an indispensable feature to be respected. It's not wealth for wealth's sake, but a certain material opulence is required, is needed. There are, of course, countries that are poor and attractive at the same time, but these are exotic countries. And in our cultural, um, let's say, uh, spectrum, this wealth is very important because it allows you to find stipends and scholarships and build business uh, tissue. So you offer the very good recipe from waiting out, weathering um, bad uh, environment, bad times, to uh, accumulating wealth because you cannot reinforce the idea of Polishness barefoot. And I think that some Poles have a contradictory, uh, I believe, uh, views on that. The Jagiellonian clubs 
Piotr, your voice, please. Thank you. I represent Jagiellonian Club that resides in Krakow, but personally I'm from Guru John's Gardens, and we are just uh, migrants from a middle town in the center of Poland who just uh, came to Krakow for for money, for sustenance. So thank you for inviting me, and I'm very glad to see the next edition of this conference happening because it's one of the most interesting events on the political scene in Poland. In addition to the question about the hope, I believe that this is a fundamental question. We are at a turning point in our history. When I look at my um, uh, environment and when I look at the Polish, sorry, at the political uh, uh, narratives, I conclude that there is little hope amongst the Poles about hope for positive changes. We have published text about hope that is juxtaposed with the post-Christian nihilism. And I'd say that every subsequent election meant a huge promise of change. There was those big stories of two big political parties plus other narratives of smaller parties where people rejoice that there will be a correct liberal economic rights wing and uh, there will be also smaller parties representing extreme left and so on. Now I think that we see the main political parties touring Poland claiming that this is going to be the most important elections in the past 30 years in Poland. And we don't know still where this hope is that both parties tell you stories about. And we are in a watershed moment. We speak about private things, about challenges for privacy, about public things such as energy supply, COVID pandemic and the war. This is where we all had to take care of private things. And um, we see history being rewritten as we speak. A new chapter of the history of the world is being written. For us, more than ever before, there is a hope rising that we are going to be better off than before. Of course, we can still lose out on it, but still there is a little hope. We, we don't have hopes, high hopes. Well, and uh, finally, a third thing. We are in a point in time where in 2022, great times in the Polish nation occurred. What happened after the 24th of February, uh, putting the Ukrainians aside, was a huge proof of the survivability of the Polish ideal and the Polish spirit, Polish soul. We are a nation that is able to self-organize, to self-federate, to take things in their own hands. And when the martial law or ex uh, extraordinary state is imposed, to make a tremendous, miraculous effort in addition or parallel to uh, the current authorities. And it was absolutely everybody who started running to help the others. People from lots of 
affinities. The women strike activists who organized two years ago radical protests on abortion used uh, capital, human capital, and organizational talents to transport people to a network of uh, apartments uh, offered by the local priest, the parish priest. So when extraordinary times come, Poland, the Poles need to self-organize. They have to pull up their socks and work together with a with an authority that is not despotic anymore. Because the whole nutshell, the Polishness in a nutshell, is demonstrating that the nation is something extraordinary rather than the authorities. So uh, the fact that everybody jumped in and started helping, that shows that we have one fundamental bond. Everybody is afraid of despots. Some imagine those despots as that you know, Brussels uh, animal. The others imagine that despot in the past of Jarosław Kaczyński. People are afraid of radical despots, hegemons and oppress oppressors. And once the war broke out, they have no doubts what to do, that they should object the despot. And I have a neighbor with whom we absolutely contradict. We stand in demonstration opposing sides. We put our heads together and started conspiring against the despot. So this is the narrative <coughs> that we need in order to come down to, to the roots. We need a common story that brings us all together. And I'm not talking about the kitschy, cliche thing like everybody dancing, holding hands. No, but we need a minimum agreement across the nation because otherwise we'll stop being one nation. What is very important, though, and I think uh, it's going to be also important for the liberal part of the political scene, that after 24th of February, we saw something that we couldn't have seen before, how a nation is born, and we saw it live. A, a people that were partially a nation suddenly came to existence, showing tremendous, inspiring courage. And I believe that many people would be convinced that if Ukrainians hadn't felt their commitment to the national ideals, then they wouldn't have become the nation, they wouldn't have resisted so great in the first weeks of the war, which we were, when we are so much afraid of them failing. So I think that this is the most living proof of when the crisis comes, the national ideal is of key importance. And I hope that in 10 years' time going forward, we may depart from those ideals. We may differ in terms of which nation we want to have, but indeed we want to be, to continue to be a Polish nation, and that Polish nationality is a value. Not only Poles here in Poland uh, uh, contributed to the assistance to, Euro to uh, Ukraine, but uh, others too. Uh, but all of them are quite quite courageous. Uh, I remember uh, I remember volunteers taking food uh, to uh, places already under the attack of Russia. Uh, so the inhabitants of those places, the the Ukrainians stayed stayed there, and um, uh, but still th this assistance and this help could also reach them. I, in Kharkov, I I remember hearing from from 
about a volunteer. I don't want to mention the ne the, the place uh, because it's it's not safe for them. So. A wife of one volunteer calls him, uh, and uh, she can, she can hear she can hear uh, the uh, the, um, the the bombs uh, and all those sounds, uh, and, uh, and and he convinced he kept convincing her that he's about to leave and that he's on his way back. Whereas it was not uh, it was not true. He lied to her because he was uh, hundreds of uh, kilometers uh, more to the east uh, still. Uh, so he was still there. So struggle, struggle, and uh, fighting uh, for, um, for freedom, independence is uh, is just uh, is just in, uh, imprinted in our in our spirit. So, so um, is is the situation superb? Um, is it also so good? So if it's so good, why is it so bad? If I may. Yes, please, Professor. Take the Polishness. And uh, we are right, we are trying to find the essence of this Polishness. And for me, um, uh, this is our thrive and uh, hunger for, for freedom. Is uh, constitutes the essence of this Polishness. That's uh, that uh, has its roots in our struggle for independence, our history, and historic uh, fight for independence. Uh, but also some civilization uh, uh, story. The civilization that Ukraine is now fighting for. The Ukrainians have understood and have realized uh, the value of freedom, why it is worth uh, worth fighting for, why it is worth uh, being killed for. And for me, the things uh, one's departing, uh, uh, one's uh, uh, stepping in between uh, the Ukrainians and the Poles, uh, the Polish, uh, is now a bond. There is also another thing I keep wondering about. This is the, pol the pol politics, the way you make politics, uh, how successful, how efficient this, pol this uh, how success, how efficient you are in making when making policy politics. At the beginning of the 16th century in, in Italy, there was a publication by Niccolò Machiavelli, the prince. Uh, a, he, at that time, he had already been born, but uh, it had been a huge, it was a huge success. And when you, when you read the introduction of, uh, of the prince, uh, you will see that uh, back then, in the 16th century and also in the 17th century, Poland had very close relations with Italy. Paolo, the Poles uh, uh, studied there and, however, however this, uh, this work by Machiavelli was not received in Poland at all. The Napoleon uh, um, appraised this uh, this work, uh, whereas the Poles no, Poles no. Why? What? Why not? Uh, because of the Catholic ethics. The Catholic um, ethics uh, believe believes that morality uh, steps in between makes it impossible to have efficient uh, see. I also read other authors, and I've noticed that uh, that uh, we are the only uh, the only nation in Europe uh, to give up the idea that. Uh, uh, politics can be immoral. And you can find in the sources that it's very, very difficult to make efficient uh, um, politics. Uh, uh, 
that is efficient politics that is moral at the same time. So we, the Poles, uh, sometimes prefer uh, inefficient policy, politics that is moral rather than uh, efficient policy that, uh, that is immoral. So that what distinguishes us from our neighbors on the one hand, and uh, I hope it will stay this way. Because, uh, because uh, this is where our Polish strength lies. You have uh, mentioned uh, you have mentioned some events from the 19, from 1939 uh, and my history and the, uh, the, uh, the position of uh, the Polish authorities in 1939 that I defend and the presentation by the minister back. Uh, with this, with this awkward and this uh, uh, nasty word, uh, honor. Do you remember all those, uh, all those bad words that he heard as a result of, uh, of uttering this uh, sentence, uttering this word? You may not know that. Uh, uh, that uh, there were. Uh, there were there, there were suicides uh, among uh, among, uh, among uh, distinguished uh, politicians uh, as a result of uh, certain actions and decisions at that, at that moment uh, uh, because they couldn't stand uh, some people couldn't stand the dishonor uh, of some of the decisions uh, I'm, I mean here uh, a prime minister one of the prime ministers one of the prime ministers com committed a suicide he shot himself uh, because he found uh, certain decisions of, of the, those times as dishonors um, back uh, fortunately did not have to commit a suicide because we decided to fight the evil in the person of Hitler. So being efficient in politics is what matters. Well, I hear sometimes that uh, uh, a different decision uh, should be made, should have been made, that uh, we should have done otherwise. I keep uh, remembering. I keep repeating that uh, we constantly take this uh, exam of uh, choosing the right from the wrong. Jerzego um, used uh, as a motto for all his preachings and sermons. Uh, the words coming from the, gos from the gospel, from the Holy Bible. Defeat the evil with uh, the good. The evil is always there. Whereas you can defeat the evil with with the good. Aren't we successful by defeating the evil in Ukraine with the good? This is where the power uh, resides. However, this practice is very hard to follow. Well, life is about ch making choices. And, uh, uh, Saint um, Max Kolbe made his choices. A traitor also made. Uh, his uh, or her choices. Uh, so life is about choices. I can hear, uh, I can hear from you this huge and intense love for Poland. Uh, it's very strange to listen to uh, to, uh, to such a thing uh, if someone believes that Poles are anti-Semitic. Uh, anti and, uh, and we are blamed of so many, so many foes. Uh, uh, 
into Paris. So many national foes. Uh, well, but so I believe that we can't we can't leave this stage believing that. Uh, we are the chosen nation. Are we a chosen nation? Um, maybe in the 19th century, uh, if we followed this, uh, uh, this path uh, of uh, or one path or another, do we become? Do we want to become? Did we want to become a victim, or uh, would we? Did we follow the uh, absolute? Uh, I still believe that uh, the choices of the past uh, represent our treasure. Mm, our debates may not be apologetic, but can be precious and. Uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, the, in terms of the power to uh, save us from making wrong choices and paying a huge price, uh, where anarchy, likes lack of discipline, resides. Minister Paris mentioned this uh, uh, this threat. Very important because uh, Poles, uh, just like uh, the Jews, uh, um, almost disappeared. Well, actually, disappeared. So these are serious questions. Uh, this uh, discipline, self-organizations uh, are indis indispensable. The existence, the presence of the right uh, political structures uh, must be there. The presence is necessary. They must; the, those structures must be there to secure our safety. So this is the politics of Weber. Pure politics of Weber that uh, realizes the consequences. Uh, even taking the the reservations by by the Polish. Uh, well, in Hungary we have the oligarchy, in Poland not. There might be, there, you might, you may find maybe one oligarch. Poland is a serious uh, thing. Uh, we um, quote some romanticism and romantic uh, thoughts and political ideas and thoughts and but I, I, I I'm saying that yes we have to uh, follow that uh, I also want to say that uh, after the after the war started in in February we still might may have uh, might have some uh, uh, some cons and I hear some cons, uh, and uh, um, and of course we argue, we disagree when it comes to um, whether or not it was uh, it was uh, it was worth crossing this those red lines. Uh, but without those decisions, uh, Ukraine wouldn't get wouldn't receive uh, three hundred tanks. Because everyone was afraid uh, of making making certain decisions, whereas the Polish government made such decisions, decided to go for those ta to to those tanks, even though uh, we risked being uh, being attacked with missiles. Not every government uh, would be capable of uh, making such decisions. Uh, take just uh, take just uh, those. Uh, anti-Russian uh, circles. Uh, 
we are about to finish this discussion, but, uh, um, but I would like to ask uh, all the panelists to, uh, to summarize uh, this uh, idea of Polishness uh, while pointing at some threats and challenges. Uh, we are now close to this Valente Pensky from the 17th century uh, who claimed that God addressed Adam and Eva and the paradise uh, in Polish. So, uh, Piotr, uh, P P uh, Piotr, when you mentioned the, this his historic, uh, historic meaning of the vision of Poland, uh, you are sometimes criticized uh, for participating in Trzaskowski's campus, uh, whereas others claim that uh, the Polish technology and Polish infrastructure should be offered to uh, Ukraine. Uh, would you uh, sign up for that? Uh, because it's very, very um, clear, a very clear political statement. Uh, yeah, I would like to address this this this, uh, this campus. I liked this campus very much. I attended it, uh, and I liked the youth. Uh, at the end of the of, of my presence there, there was the discussion between uh, Traskovsky and uh, Tosca that reminded me of. Uh, some previous uh, events. This discussion was was uh, was uh, dramatic, and uh, uh, it was frustrate frustrate uh, it frustrated me a lot. Uh, and I remember hearing voices from from the audience, uh, from the representatives of, uh, of young people, young Ukrainians studying in Poland, and they asked questions about. Uh, about the assistance, about the support. There were other questions about this, uh, um, uh, uh, about uh, electrical independence. And I could hear from those leaders that uh, in their, that, that they agreed uh, that the government, so the, the ruling party did well. So I, for me, the campus was a positive story. Uh, uh, Donald Tusk was was really uh, was really praised uh, uh, for by very uh, conservative politi politicians. Uh, uh, for his uh, deeds and for his decisions. Uh, so yes, there are moments when we realize how serious the situation is, and uh, my impression is that the situation is not as bad as we could hear from editor Karnowski. 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 And I would uh, also like to believe that uh, I'm very glad uh, that uh, that the, poli the policy of uh, of the of the government uh, was evident, and there were no uh, objections to uh, the, to this policy towards uh, towards Ukraine. Uh, do you, well, what would you say about the Ukrainian mainstream counting on uh, Ukrainian defeat in the first days of the of the of the of the war? We could hear that, right? That the bridges would not survive, that uh, that people would not survive that, that the whole infrastructure would not survive that, and uh, and they were wrong. No, I I am not following this uh, this path. Uh, I'm not an ally of uh, Donald Tusk or his team. Uh, but uh, I, but yes, I believe that there are, are certain issues uh, in which we can agree, on which we can agree. A few days ago, I read a text uh, 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 by Ludwig Dorn uh, uh, when after leaving um, uh, United Poland, uh, and this. Uh, 
text uh, was about uh, the year 2014 and what was changed in 2014 and why he, uh, he no longer believes in this clear division, political division and clear, clear structure, political structure there. Um, but he points, points uh, in, in this article uh, to a clear division of the political political scene in 2014 uh, and all the all the environment, all the surrounding uh, in all the surrounding events. Uh, uh, so against the context of uh, this year. We uh, we can see that uh, this this division on the Polish political scene is quite clear, and maybe maybe the Polish uh, foreign uh, foreign um, policy uh, should adjust to this clear division. Uh, you uh, cannot. Uh, you, you won't say, of course, that Ludwig Dorn wrote this text because he wanted to join the civic platform, uh, uh, because uh, that would, wouldn't be absolutely uh, not true. So the scenario for me is not uh, that gloomy. Uh, what we should do after after uh, February the 24th uh, is uh, uh, remembering and reminding that the Polish class, the Polish political class, uh, uh, used to be and well, has always been anti-Russian, and uh, so those sentiments were not shaped only in the on, in the times of uh, of the of the civic platform rule. A guy from the government of PIS was the commissioner for uh, shale gas and the government of PIAO. So this is thanks to the great wisdom of Piotr Naimski and of Kaczynski that we should, I think, breach certain divisions and to try and build a consensus, national consensus. And we have more such examples. I think the time's up. Um, we have a very vivid discussion just at the end, but could the professor respond uh, to what Piotr said, and then we'll wrap up the panel. I am a supporter of a rule that Josef Piłsudski once used, oh sorry, he formulated, that you have to be uh, romantic in terms of goals and positive is in terms of ways. We're almost uh, over with the panel, but please keep quiet. Please do not interfere because I'll bring, I'll restore law and order, Andrew. I would like you to understand better my love for Poland and my conviction. Poland is exceptional and great and valuable. And that you can be really proud of being in Poland. But I just don't want to resort to certain specific actions to obtain certain goals. One is of the Sharmetyev's self-propelled house called Krab, and I had to do quite a lot to successfully put uh, this this howitzer in commission and i'm happy that it does uh, it's doing a great job in ukraine now when we speak about the problem i would define that in terms that we have a similar problem in the 18th center where the first republic was nearing its collapse the civilizational collapse, civil, the, the, the collapse of the Polish society were there. Because the principle, uh, sorry, sorry, there is a principle thing that 
allows a state to grow and prosper is the bond between the citizens and the state, namely the same set of values. What we have in our heads and in our hearts is the most important thing. If we have different things, there will be no cons uh, consensus and agreement. So we, our problem now is that that which manifested itself already in the united euro and i mean the clash of civilizations we see other value systems that are competitive to what we follow as polish people and which I try to explain to you by defining my approach to Polishness. So this is the big problem. And our problem in the Polish society, the Polish nation, and I understand the doctor when he spoke about hope, that there is something that brings us together, cements us. But it is not possible to bring together things that are different in civilizational terms. In Berlin, people come up with the idea of multiculturalism, that you can uh, combine or uh, bring together Sharia with uh, our rules of civilization. It's not possible and that's where the problem emerges. And I do agree with what Mr. Skarnowski said. Oh, that it doesn't matter that elections are very important because the current for system in power, the party in power must win. The choice is about the system of values that is going to dominate our political scene going forward. If it's not the current value system, which is um, which is founded on my beloved Polishness, then we have a problem. Therefore, a positivistic means as the election won. I have never made a big career at the, with this formation, and I am not saying what I'm saying because people pay me for that. No, I look at it from the point of view, from the vantage point of my beloved Poland, and from the perspective of what I deem needs to happen. The other day I wrote a text about a ministerial appointee, and I believe that we're on the right way, maybe too slowly, but it's, that's okay. Big round of applause for the professor. Mr. Karnowski, right, we are behind time. And I'd like that the differences between uh, the formation political uh, parties are only apparent. No, they are not. They are quite tangible. There is an elite of a society that has uh, develop their programs? Or is it a foreign elite, compradoristic elite, like selling the Polish property, only those who uh, wish ill for Poland can could have sold those tools? Uh, the separation of powers and vesting too much power into the uh, local administration leads to Poland being a federal country that makes Poland weaker, weaker overall. 
So I believe there should be cycles looking for the common thing in Poland. And in every community that is going to a conflict, such cycles are needed. And my personal declaration, my personal affiliation is quite clear. But it all needs to be based on the truth. I'm not alluding to anybody personally, doctor, but symmetrism is not a right intellectual stance. It's just um, artificial acting. It's acting. I will kick those and punch the others without any explanation. So this is a hollow attitude. You cannot put an equal sign between the two parties in terms of Russia. Those who re who stopped construction of Nord Street and started resetting things with Putin and relinquish active Eastern policy put themselves outside of patriotism. Well, politicians can err in uh, various matters, or various matters, but they must not err in two things, in Russia and with or in matters with Germany. So what's the biggest challenge after, sorry, in 2023? It is regardless of the outcome of the elections, the Poles feel that they are still in their own country or state, and that this state pursues the policies that are good for them. Maybe not ideal, because it may differ from our values, but that it is, it is a legitimate Polish authority that has that window of opportunity. You may like it more or less, but you should nonetheless look at it as odd Polish authority, legitimate authority. So this is the biggest challenge due to this period of time. Too much pop culture in the elections. Some people claim that this is the right time to renounce allegiance and to rebel. If we are in exceptional times, I wish that all those confederations over the divisions are created. Even if we so not to have any doubts as to whether the institutions operate. And I think a good the, the difference of uh, symmetrism by Chalevsky that you should uh, straddle barricades because two opposite things give the right middle. My impression is that our symmetrism is about various things, uh, criticizing various uh, criticizing various parties over various matters, but I have no doubt which side is on the right side of history. In opposition to the majority of the Western world, but I cannot deny being Polish uh, to the other side. This is the book published after that of Piłsudski. Well, the author writes about all his uh, sentiments or resentments uh, towards Piłsudski and our allegations during the despotic times before the World War II. And then I find this speech of uh, Piłsudski, which actually ends the book on a consensual note that will need uh, the state uh, thriving or the state supporting uh, narrative that since he is dead, Piłsudski, we need to 
uh, make him a prominent politician going forward. Kurds, it's about life, the blood is possible to be spilled. It's about uh, heavy, important sacrifice. It's about compromising. It's about sacrificing what people believe or hold dearest, namely their convictions and values. So I think we're at a turning point where we need a great national idea, and we don't need 10 million of force for that, but 30 or even 38. And we should be prepared to sacrifice our values and our convictions for the benefit of our country. And this is what I'd like to encourage you to do, hopefully, and hope that the other side would become convinced, because ultimately we are the ones who are right. Professor Romashen Gremetiev, Jacek Karnowski, Piotr Trudnowski, were your and my guests. Thank you.
So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to discuss the Polish culture, which used to be a superpower, and we will see whether it holds true today. Piotr Gocek, a writer and columnist, big round of applause for the gentleman. Then we have Professor Krzysztof Keller, literature and history. In one, Krzysztof Masło, a literature critic, and Mateusz Mateszka, the president of the Polish television. It would have been a long list of uh, achievements of the Polish culture. I saw a letter of the um, Turkish visit to the Polish king. It was in Polish. And the 17th century, an educated person in Moscow was supposed to be fluent in Polish. In the 19th century, there was no Polish state, but we Polonized. And various creators of the Polish culture were of foreign origin, like Mr. Linde, a German who wrote the first Polish uh, textbook. Can we still have vestiges of that cultural dominance left, even if we cannot create a good Polish film? unless uh, the uh, head of the Polish TVP is going to defend the uh, serious crown of the kings. Or uh, have we suffered a defeat in terms of culture if we juxtapose the Polish culture against or with its backdrop of from many centuries ago? Well, I can uh, recall a story that the other day Zygmunt Kubiak, a European scientist, told me. He had his favorite poet by the name of Janitius, um, who may be familiar to Mr. Koller. And he spoke with his daughter about this poet, praising the poet, and she said, Dad, how many Janitius there used to be? And that's the point. We should not exaggerate over below the importance of our culture in the past and in the present. And since we have a difficult situation, culture is not a secret. Uh, there is a magazine that uh, is my favorite in which uh, the authors, contributors wrote that of the Polish Commonwealth ceased to exist as an idea. And since it does not exist, patriotism is undermined as well as other values. So there may be some ersatzes um, in, the, in the form of European identity. So what should the Polish culture do? It should stick to what it used to be proficient at and to hold a moral compass in your hand and because certain uh, things cannot be emphasized as they are and I am mad when people quote Jaromski, a famous Polish writer who said that the wounds need to be reopened because it will close and contain this contagion so uh, that means that you should speak ill of Polishness and you should not speak ill of your mother and of the Polishness. And if we uh, make sure that doesn't happen, well, that will be fine. And if we produce one or two films that are worth watching, then our position is not going to improve in any material way. I think we should go ahead and do what we need to do. to emphasize the role of the people that the young generation never heard of. Right, Professor, do we idealize uh, the power of the ancient Polish culture? 
what, in your opinion, is the scale of the current crisis of culture as compared with the past ages or times? Two responses. I don't know where you see that crisis, because I'm just trying to find my bearings here. The writers write, the filmmakers make films, and theaters up and alive and kicking. So, at the first glance, it seems that our culture is living up to the general expectation. The culture of a, a mid-sized country and the middle of Europe, which is not very interesting to uh, the general world culture because it is the Anglo-Saxon culture that defines the way how films are made or narratives about history. So when speaking about crisis, I believe that conservators and people who depart from this myth of golden age that once upon a time everything was better, today we have the age of iron when everything is much worse and we are headed towards the end of the world, that generation and so on. I have been a researcher of the periods of the end of the 16th and then beginning of 17th century. That was the peak of the power of Poland, but the division alongside the poly political board borders in this conflict was so aggressive that we barely avoided a, a civil war. What followed was uh, the uh, uprising or rebellion of Lubomirski, where blood was spilled. And if you read the chronicles there, from that time, that the best colleagues, warriors from the time of Swedish war perished by hundreds in the Battle of Gawam, then you conclude that you idealize the previous history or the, the, the old history and culture from today's perspective. And um, those times were quite good for Poland, 6th, 17th century. We used to have the largest territory in Europe, and oh, I think we were quite efficient in managing the state affairs. We have the, um, we have the free elections, uh, uh, the, um, the subjectivity of the, of the, of the citizens, uh, and would, would all represent certain values, and from our, we we tend to glorify that those from 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 time perspective. But please excuse me, I may may be uh, may be rude uh, to some of you, but have have we ever taking taking the the long history of literature? Uh, I'm the historian of literature. Have we ever, have we uh, managed uh, to? To uh, turn uh, Kohanovsky into the Shakespeare, into Shakespeare, uh, this is not a question of promotion only. When looking for 17th century Polish authors, quite genius uh, authors, uh, uh, and huge culture, uh, does anybody know about them apart from us? Uh, this is the power. The, this is the literary power. Their literary power. I remember one poet from the 17th century. Uh, in fact, there were two famous, uh, uh, famous in England, uh, maybe a point of reference. One of them is not that so, uh, no, Maciej Kazimierz Sarbiewski, and uh, not very, very much, not, not really known in Poland, but he, and he's recognized in, in England uh, um, only because, because his uh, poetry was published there, um, so to speak, published, and the second author, uh, when, his version is Goshnitsky um, only, only because uh, because Shakespeare mentioned him when talking about the figure of a of a Paul entitled about the perfect council. This was and that makes uh, these two stories make these two authors popular and and, and known. 
abroad. Uh, we have this uh, uh, this myth of the ancient culture, uh, but it needs to be observed from various perspectives. And uh, please, we, we need to remember that we follow those myths of the golden age, uh, uh, whereas it's, uh, it's, it's just a... <coughs> It's, it's not real. Editor um, Piotr Gociek, uh, I would like to address this question to you. This golden uh, age, would you uh, consider uh, this uh, contemporary uh, cultural context uh, uh, subject to crisis or not? And I would point to what Professor uh, Keller as mentioned, the culture reflects the, the society. On the right, uh, um, there there is this. Uh, sometimes there is this. Uh, uh, there is this uh, readiness to criticize uh, everything that, uh, uh, and uh, there is this conviction that, uh, by conviction among the right, uh, the members of the right uh, uh, side of the of the political scene, is that uh, that uh, the, the, the the political culture is. Uh, what is conservative is political culture, nothing else is. But remember that Jerzy Utramend is also a, a member of the Polish cultural since present in the Polish on the Polish cultural uh, scene. Uh, but it's quite natural to forget uh, some figures. Uh, uh, I don't believe that anybody will remember Jerzy Putramend in 100 years uh, or use those, uh, those, his books as, as uh, sources of reference. Uh, the culture ref reflects uh, the society, and in the case of Poland, it is really, it is really um, uh, well bruised, uh, I would say. I'm, bruised or broken uh, because this is what we are and uh, our nation is broken, very broken. Uh, uh, the question is how broken uh, our nation is. Uh, is it possible to put all those bones together again? I'm, um, one of the Hungarian politicians, maybe Orban, maybe another one, I don't remember, he once used a metaphor that a communism in uh, Europe uh, made uh, nations a fish, fish soup, uh, whereas uh, we, want this fi to, we want to turn this fish soup back into an aquarium uh, full, uh, filled with fish. Uh, I remember Professor Legutko talking about the spirit of uh, Poland. This country was uh, really divided before the war. Uh, but I remember, I, be, I believe it was richer. Um, the, there were many publications, uh, and the, the published authors uh, really appeared uh, and were published abroad. Uh, uh, sometimes simultaneously, simultaneously to uh, to the publication of their books in Warsaw and in Poland. An important, uh, an important part of this culture after the Second World War or state uh, outside the territory of Poland. This uh, culture was banned. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, never came back after 1989. Just, uh, I just, I could name just single, single such events. Uh, Piotr Shevich is one of the authors. Really, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really fond of, uh, fond of him. Uh, but he's staying in emigration, and uh, um, but we know about his publications and his works. Uh, and that's what what I mean by saying that the Polish culture uh, it was was bruised. Uh, the, uh, the, the Polish culture in the times of the, uh, the, the socialist culture and the, the time of communism uh, was, was, was being bruised again uh, because it was to serve certain purposes, purposes of the, of the, of the, 
of the authorities. Uh, 1989 is the is a turning point of uh, um, and the beginning and the beginning of creating our culture from the from scratch. Uh, and now uh, we have a new type of uh, culture that is not tailor made yet and not uh, taken care of particularly. And uh, taking uh, and, uh, this, uh, it's turned out very quickly that uh, uh, that some elements are unwelcome. Uh, the the average that uh, that some Europeans have, uh, and we don't. Uh, uh, because there is this division. Uh, on the one hand, we have the the Europeans, and on the other hand, we have uh, those who don't follow the European values are not treated as a as a grey mass. Uh, I remember my discussion with uh, Rukas Arbitowski. Uh, with, uh, with about box uh, and, and I talk to um, talk to others uh, about uh, about uh, TV productions and I I like our discussions uh, even though our opinions vary are completely different uh, it's very precious to have those discussions are very precious because we can we can get to know our uh, our point of view, looking for a platform of uh, co cooperation and, uh, and uh, joint observations, uh, and everybody has a right to post uh, to post their opinions. Uh, and then you have various processes affecting the culture. And uh, not every a country always. Uh, <coughs> It's it's not it's not a rule that uh, that uh, every country has uh, renowned uh, authors writers. Uh, not every culture has uh, Kochanowski, Tamoshman, or uh, Mickiewicz in every uh, era. Um, maybe maybe our Tamoshman of the twenty first century has just been born now. Maybe not in Poland. Maybe in Ukraine or in Great Britain. We don't know that. What we should struggle for is equality of chance, the equality of chance in this discussion. And this task requires a huge mental effort, uh, mental, well, intellectual effort, and some funds. Uh, and there are, um, on top of that, there are very um, natural human calculations. You know the pub, uh, public, you remember the publications who were big hopes, Cezary Michalski, for instance, the big hopes of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the journalism and uh, publications. And I, I remember certain works uh, published by authors which were quite promising, writers in their character. Uh, was it about the distribution of prestige? Yes, very much so. Uh, some uh, choices our, our authors make are driven by this uh, prestige, uh, prestige culture. Uh, but of course, the culture is not created and developed solely by uh, by the, the 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 big big literary and cultural uh, cultural vision. So, uh, not all uh, girls uh, signing in the Maleo project uh, uh, share the same uh, opinions, and uh, uh, no but uh, they were able to create something important for the published content. I mean, uh, Twardoga, uh, and, and uh, in the interest of mass when you uh, uh, writing about him and what happened, what had happened to him, uh, was the res re response uh, from by the, by the author was very arrogant. Uh, and he, he said that, he, or he wrote uh, that uh, he was now, he was then and um, on an expensive and luxurious yacht, uh, drinking, sipping some some uh, champagne. Yeah, but let me interrupt. Uh, but come on, let's not forget uh, he's an elderly person. Well, it could eat, it could always be worse. Uh, um, it's all. It's always. It could always be worse. 
Now I would like to address them, address you um, um, as a head of a huge uh, institution uh, with huge funds, uh, uh, but deprived uh, of uh, deprived of uh, certain well. Um, hmm. Um, well, you are not liked. Uh, the, the, the people, the, the, the people uh, from the Ministry of Culture or from, uh, don't see uh, many, the limitations. Uh, uh, why is it so difficult to overcome uh, to overcome the, the this uh, the, the the difficulties with the with the dis prestige uh, prestige distribution? But uh, well, let me address some of some of uh, some of the things I have heard. I wanted to start with Kohanovsky and Shakespeare, uh, but I wanted to address the same question as you did. Uh, I remember the Globe a few years ago. Uh, and published uh, some works by Kochanowski, and it was not by accident. Uh, uh, the text was not accidental because the text was uh, was uh, was written at the same the same time when uh, Shakespeare uh, made plays uh, for for the British uh, for the British folks. Shakespeare always. Uh, was himself an actor, and he uh, he played in front of the folks. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes uh, he was uh, watched by. Uh, sometimes he well, he could have been watched by uh, by the, the king or the queen, but normally he played in front of the folks. But uh, Shakespeare wrote for uh, for. Um, but his power was, was great. Uh, Shakespeare can is well known. Kochanowski is well known, but his popularity can never be compared to the popularity of Shakespeare. What is the reason why? Why? Why is that so? Is it is is it so because Shakespeare wrote for the folks and and Kochanowski for for the gentry? Uh, no, no, this was not the reason. Um, the power of, uh, of the Republic uh, disappeared and the uh, British Empire uh, thrived. So we're talking about some political uh, force and political influence. Uh, otherwise, Shakespeare would uh, have stayed unknown. Uh, we have uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of, uh, of playwright and, uh, and authors uh, who um, never became popular and famous. Uh, the British, uh, the British uh, uh, Empire started believing in Shakespeare and promoting him, and that's what made uh, Shakespeare among the well-known words, uh, Kochanowski uh, still is and will be just an expert. Uh, this is the power, the power of culture. The second um, opera scene uh, was the stage was created uh, at the Vasa uh, in the Vasa age here in Warsaw. So you may you can make um, a hypothesis that uh, with the power. Of, uh, of the Polish Republic uh, continued, uh, maybe our culture would be in a different place now. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the case. The Poland, the Republic of uh, Poland of, uh, of the 20th century, tried to uh, struggled to strive for success, but uh, was not successful. Unfortunately, let's imagine a situation uh, where when, where we have. Uh, where we have a certain link between uh, what happens in culture and, uh, and that what happens in, in the culture is uh, is uh, supported or is influenced by political decisions. Uh, can our culture be uh, a leading uh, trend uh, in, in the region? Uh, uh, yes, until until it is a sovereign. What does it mean? So where is a sovereign country culture? What uh, does it mean? Does it mean that it's uh, it's free from uh, influence? Uh, it's uh, resistant to influence? No, no, it's still open to 
uh, to uh, all the all the links. Uh, we remember the um, the um, Latin influence on the on the culture and the traces of that still visible in the in the culture uh, and the Byzantium uh, influences. This is the power of culture, the, the external um, influence, uh, external forces uh, on the culture. Certain um, an extreme example of a culture that has been borrowed uh, from elsewhere is Japan. Japan uh, borrowed and took uh, the Chinese uh, culture and religion and adopted uh, solely the elements which served the power of Japan. It has been this way, and it still is this way. Uh, in the cultural revival uh, for Poland, uh, it is very important to make it so very an independent. Because uh, we have seen in the last decades, in the, in the recent decades, we have seen that uh, otherwise it, it wouldn't be wouldn't be um, successful and efficient. Let's imagine uh, uh, central central states. Uh, some uh, one day one day central states announced pronounced uh, Poland and the and started the existence of Poland. Uh, um, but this uh, state uh, was su subordinate uh, to uh, external, uh, to the neighborhood countries and states, uh, and its culture was so uh, too. Borrowing from other cultures uh, are okay and are, 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 are very proved very efficient, but need to be very uh, uh, very um, honest uh, and very. Um, no, this was this was a theoretical introduction, but let's now go for practice. So we all would like uh, this Polish culture to be powerful, but uh, how can we how can we do it? Uh, how we can do it? Um, remember. How do you, how do you achieve this uh, this uh, breakthrough uh, in the development of, of culture? How do you how do you work out uh, the the breakthrough in the, the minds of people who uh, will shape this uh, culture in the future? I agree with uh, Dr. Maswin uh, and the. Uh, um, Breakthrough is uh, whenever we feel safe and comfortable with where we are. And we, uh, I remember I can I can quote examples, literary examples, which constitute this good bridge uh, that brings us and takes us to the place uh, where we feel comfortable. But it can't be achieved uh, just like this. Uh, you, uh, I, I know nine, you, you could read 90%, 90% of, uh, if you take all the uh, all the scripts uh, uh, that the Polish television is uh, uh, are sent to the Polish television, you will see that 90% of them lack something, really. I have certain observations myself, uh, but uh, um, I hope that I will be able to extend, uh, expand um, that. Um, I have never worked for the television, but uh, I used to be um, an expert and uh, evaluating scripts. Uh, and it is true that uh, every session, we have three sessions per year, we have got uh, 17, 20 scripts uh, and every time. Every time, uh, maybe one project would do. And 
deserved our signature with some corrections and with some modifications. Uh, um, then there were, there were, uh, the, 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 then we were accused of, of expecting too much from those scripts because others uh, were always able to select uh, good scripts and we never were. Well, the question that Mateusz Matyszkowicz asked is very good, but it needs an explanation about why these people feel not so good in the country and why they are not interested in certain things. My feeling is that there has something to do with distribution of prestige and the cultural grooming that the parents were subject to because we see clans or generations inheriting a certain uh, viewpoint and the belief that they really deserve a prominent place in the Polish culture and it's pecking order, let's just put it that way. The other day a great conference was uh, staged, uh, was organized on the place of Polish people in the Hollywood productions. At the end of the discussion, a very sober question was asked why the Poles in America do not have the same kind of recognition as Italians and Germans. And we discussed how. Uh, Italians are views, thanks to the films of uh, Scop uh, Coppola or, or Scorsese, and we quickly found the common denominator. And this exactly happens, what well, happens to the Latino culture, Mexican culture, as we speak. Even though the series are full of abominable characters trading in drags, the Latino culture is perceived as something interesting. Italian culture has become in the US a symbol of family culture of warmth and honor. Look at what uh, the little Italy uh, inhabitants, residents uh, behave in uh, Scorsese's film. But the Italian culture is cool. This is because Coppola or Scorsese never, uh, were never ashamed of the um, Italian roots. One of uh, the films was about what created this prominent director. The post-war Italian cinematography did that, but the Poles in Hollywood behave as people who make the point of avoiding everybody else noticing that they are Polish. To them, this is a very big burden. Scorsese or Coppola never did uh, films of sacrosanct Italians. They did a great films about human beings, about men, about what breaks them down, about sin, about uh, redemption and many other things. And our dream of the world watching great Polish productions about interesting Poles cannot come true if we feed and feed them with the sacrosanct poles because people don't like propaganda. But doing a great culture, in addition to being good, that culture would be Polish, and nobody would regard this as a burden, as something really shameful, then we cannot change anything until that happens. But the prestige distribution, how about this? But look at uh, the terrible results uh, that the immigration culture and its cut out of, of the mainstream broth. Well, it was sidelined or marginalized. There are 
magnificent stories and magnificent observations in the emigration literature where well, which the Polish filmmakers don't know. And if they wanted to do this, then the censors in the Gazeta Wyborcza uh, would uh, jump on them, ask, uh, arguing that they should look for inspiration elsewhere, Joanna Butter and others. Could you give us your example of the Polish contemporary culture that is worth elevating? President here mentioned uh, Chernyshevich, um, perhaps Halak. I would add Halak to that. Uh, there is a Polish writer whom very few persons present in this room ever had of. I could give you one ingenious example from a borderline between popular and high class literature. I can still recall my excitement when I watched Waldemar Wyszak's theatre piece. It was about American mafia with great characters. This guy is a great writer, so great that without being an investigative journalist of Baltimore Sun or a, a, an Italian, he can make make the headlines. All non essayic books of by Valdemar Wyszak is the ready-made screenplay for a film. But since Wyszak is a prohibited banned author, author, nobody from the graduates of the film academy would ever stumble upon the idea of making a film out of those books. There is another author who offers almost ready-made scripts for the films. And if you were able to acquire the rights to produce Matskevich's works into films, no graduate from the Film Academy have ever read Matskevich's books, not a single one. I'd like to draw your attention to one title. Quite recently, a second book by Grzegorz Musiar was published. He is the author of the Jaruzelski's War Diaries. And he wrote about Tamara Wempicka. The first book, volume, was published last year. Now the second volume follow, Tamara and the Volcano. I have not read anything that good for a long time at the level of popular literature. It's not a uh, super lofty book, but this book contains a character who actually actually combines everything. She is Jewish, she is homosexual, whatever. This is a very good character to film, but it is the book is not politically correct, so I will follow this book's, uh, let's say, uh, fate, if I may say so, outside Poland. But in Poland, it will be definitely shrouded in secrecy or in omerta. What are the factors that allow us to overcome the obstacles and to stop inhibiting the growth of the Polish culture? I cannot address your question straight ahead, but I'd like to refer to two things instead of look at Mateusz. I can recall discussion from a long time ago and the presidential palace where there was need was uh, voice for the education to offer something that used to be the classical gymnasium, including Greek and Latin languages. I'm a great fan of those languages because we, since we speak of education, we are inevitably headed for the topic of education. 
and I was busy commenting the list of best sellers and this is grueling your job really. It's masochistic and those, these are books who young generation, your daughters and sons read out of their own choice. I'm really keep finger, keeping fingers crossed for Minister Tarek, the Education Minister. And in 2006 and seven, Minister Gerty, who was the Minister of Education, Kaczynski's government, he made a coup against Viktor Vitor Gombrowicz. Okay, lectures, school textbooks are one thing. It's a very a vast topic, but the question is what the children really um, uh, read. And out of 30 uh, runners up for the list, uh, 20 of them are either crime stories or stories very naive which take place in the US mostly, not in Poland. But the young people love them because they found themselves and their spiritual problems and the feeling with feelings in them. So unless we penetrate them with very decent literature and the film, um, let's say the series of the age of the guilty is something that we really uh, watch with uh, suspense. I think the problems between Poland and the world and our culture, there used to be the singer by the name of Czesław Niemen, and uh, when he failed to make a great career in the in America, I think it was up to him that he failed. Someone wise said that he failed to make it, but well, that's a loss for America. Let's look at it from this point of view. Mitzkevich is known in Poland. Well, yes, so let's read Mitzkevich then. So, Professor, could you please refer to those culture things? I'm looking at the title of our meeting here. Polish culture power once and how about today? So this is a question around which our reflection should revolve. Namely, when is it that a culture founded on a language has significance? It is one, it is a sovereign culture and it has a mission that it's apparent that it's moving somewhere. I am an expert in old age cultures and ancient cultures and in various political circles republicanism is raised and the visit of the Greek uh, ambassadors or envoys by Kochanowski, one of the famous piece of Polish literature uh, this uh, book that is poorly written in grammar, grammar terms, there is a very long monologue of that, one of those envoys uh, consisting of over 250 verses which tell you what you can see and in the theater, well, uh, you don't need to tell people what they see, what they can see. So what follows in terms of our culture was that when the partitions occurred and occupation ensued, the problem of regaining liberties and independence overshadowed the republicanism. In a republic, 
independence and uh, freedom need to be cherished to practice virtues. And interestingly, our 19th century culture has received a mission which drove that culture forward, yielding very important works which are important for us and also from all the other cultures that are endangered. And I think that the power of the Polish culture, which at that time was not a culture of a victorious state, but of a non-existing country, which lives on in culture and its works. I think that was quite clear and strong. Then what followed was a period of uh, two decades in the interwar period when there was an out outbreak of freedom followed by whatever Thompson called colonizing the Polish culture, that is the People's Republic the first years after the war where we were reared or brought up in that big, great, big smoother crisis situation. Uh, that was summed up by the statement that Polishness is abnormality and the pedagogy of shame that we saw for the subsequent decades. I am not going to keep talking about the crisis because there is no crisis. We're in a dynamic situation of divisions and disputes. And we are in a position of the elites who fought us to be ashamed and always be sad. But on the other hand, now it is now time to create, also create ideas. And if our culture <coughs> followed even the craziest of ideas, and I I can remember two ideas, one by John Paul II. There will be a spark coming out of Poland. And then you ask us a question, what is the reason behind culture? What is it that we're doing it for? Maybe it's just this what we need to, to do. Uh, should be our spur. Well, every time when I see on popular streaming platforms a new series and the young, educated Warsaw public watches it, then the creators come and tell me that they can do something similar. And we had uh, more than several dozens of screenplays uh, that were advertised as Polish Peaky Blinders or Polish The Crown now. So this uh, repeats itself, uh, it reiterates as a copy-paste culture. So our Peaky Blinders, our Great Water, our Crown, this is what people advertise the works for or as. I can recall a statement by a large publisher once. Those who follow the trends in the market and start creating works, it's not the way that the um, most uh, reasonable person because once he or she finished that work, there will be a different trend. So every good publisher should uh, create his her own fashions and trends because if you create your own, construct your own train, you will have a seat in the first class, first carriage. And the Netflix, uh, there is a plague of series, Polish series based on Harlan Coben's novels. Others absolutely washed out. 
uh, one size fits all uh, candy. <coughs> Where the director makes uh, tremendous efforts not to associate this film with Poland. It, the, 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 the set could be anywhere else in the world, if you look at it. So this is a absolutely different position of in times, sorry, to what Professor Keller said, namely the times where Poland was a beacon. Marian Hemar is a volunteer pole. I'd love to see a TV series on what is of Hemar. He is a genius writer, one of the best poets in the 20th century, 20 times over better than, or two times over better than uh, Tuvim, a Jew, and a volunteer pole. Because when Poland did not exist, uh, the adjacent culture authors who attempted to create their cultural foundations at the time of new nations being born, they they did not reject the Polish culture. Ivan Franco worked in three languages, including Polish, and there were more similar creators who also had a prominent place in other cultures. Which means that if a literature has a mission and culture has a mission or purpose, that makes it more attractive rather than the power of the country that is standing behind it. Uh, let's say that the, the um, Jacob's Bible and um, um, and the, the results of uh, and the, the consequences, uh, uh, consequences still present and visible. Uh, the culture is filled with the um, filled with the, with the, uh, with examples uh, taken from the colonies. Uh, but let's take Germany. Germany is a political or an economic uh, economic uh, power. Uh, their culture is dead, I believe, because they don't have those renowned. Uh, authors, uh, uh, popular among among readers. Uh, why? Because they lack the essence. Uh, they, you can you can feel that uh, there is no direction. Um, they 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 can't follow. So um, so this is the this is the the principal question. What is the answer essence of the culture? Where, where which way should it go? It, which way which way it should go? Culture is not a struggle. Culture needs um, an objective as uh, some had. It needs uh, to have uh, something, needs to add, uh, needs to have the, the creators, the authors, needs to have something in their minds and uh, that uh, they will add and uh, uh, publish and present. Uh, the culture is for something. Yes? The, the, there is a purpose. Let's uh, mention uh, let's mention the uh, Mr. Mkiewicz, the, 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 the crazy person of the Polish culture and who uh, believed that the Pol believed in the promotion of the Polish culture. Uh, some of his ideas were really terrific. Uh, and uh, Zygmunt Kubiak before him, uh, who, uh, who uh, compared the Polishness to uh, and treated it in the same and the same uh, way as uh, the Mediterranean culture. And do you know any other examples? Any other vi examples of visions of the of the culture that the Polish culture could follow? Well, I would be faithful to Josef um, Matskiewicz. Um, you ask me to be practical and to talk in practical terms, um, and, and I will also be optimistic. Uh, well, well, the Polish television uh, is the thirty percent coverage of the Polish market. Uh, um, well, 30% of uh, polls uh, choose uh, our offer, select from our offer. There isn't anything to compare with it. There isn't uh, any other series introduced in the Polish market with a 3 million uh, people uh, audience. 
It simply doesn't happen. This is a capital, a certain capital, and a certain foundation. Big, uh, big international entities, uh, Amazon, uh, Disney, HBO, and uh, has, uh, have entered the Polish market. They have a certain advantage, uh, uh, as they have this whole library of licenses, global, uh, well, uh, global licenses. Uh, uh, you, without them, you wouldn't be able to follow many of the series, global series, but. Uh, the, but their national productions are very, very weak. Uh, we already have uh, we already have the first Polish series uh, launched on the, on the Netflix, available from Netflix. Uh, uh, we just are adopting very slowly, adopting uh, no new formats. Uh, the, uh, in fact, the Polish television has uh, is uh, the only partner to the Polish creators. Uh, uh, I hope you will see that in spring um, next year, and you will see the first signals of uh, of a big change entering the Polish culture. Any any hints? Uh, please share something with us. What what uh, is spring going to be about? Uh, before I uh, before I joined uh, this organization in 2016, I uh, read a lot of books, uh, and uh, I always uh, I always wondered why they hadn't been uh, they hadn't been well um, there were no films. Uh, I I can name I can provide uh, titles of, of books which have never been filmed. I don't know why. So I myself uh, uh, commissioned some of the adaptations and uh, filming uh, of some of the uh, some of the books. Uh, we will have a series dedicated to women, uh, to um, uh, similar to uh, to one uh, uh, Turkish production already available uh, on in. Uh, on our channels, uh, but this is this is to come. So why don't you why did you give a round of applause for that? So this is but it is still a beginning. Um, the objective of uh, the Polish television is uh, to make uh, Poles uh, uh, comfortable in the culture they've been uh, they've been brought up in. Okay, Mateusz Matuszkowicz uh, and his definition and Matskiewicz uh, and uh, looking for another reason for the Polish culture to play an important role. Why? Uh, we have this unique uh, expertise and knowledge of the, of the border of uh, Russian uh, com uh, imperial and communist oppression. Our expertise uh, and practical knowledge is huge here and we can and uh, we know how to use it. Uh, uh, we've been taken away this uh, privilege of uh, of talking about this uh, this freedom that we struggled for and that we that we won. That's also true uh, because uh, because uh, those themes uh, appeared in the Czech uh, Revolution and uh, in the Czech history, modern history, and uh, elsewhere in the East. Uh, when the, when the East was to, was to disassembled or and something bad happened in the East, then uh, the, um, the spotlights were direct again. Uh, we got in the spotlight again. So I know I'm I'm sure that. Uh, uh, our neighbors can learn a lot from us. Uh, I would like to recollect, recall uh, the words uh, uh, Jarosław Marek Nymkiewicz uh, in his uh, wonderful lecture about uh, Polishness. What this Polishness is, you can you can you can follow it on the internet. You can read uh, on our website. Uh, so he said. There, there was not a single um, um, drop of blood, of Polish blood in his veins. So all his predecessors were his ancestors. Sorry, were uh, from abroad. But he said Poland is a huge power. 
and this power just took me and uh, it took me and uh, made use of me. The essence of our question uh, behind us lies uh, and brings us, uh, leads us to, an, uh, to the answer. If Poland is ready and powerful enough to take someone and shape this person the way uh, the story I told you did. Uh, so uh, our discussion shouldn't be on the culture, but on uh, Polishness itself. Um, if you have minorities, uh, ethnic uh, minorities, or political minor minorities, they usually they tend to assimilate uh, and they usually tend to uh, to um, assimilate uh, to become similar to uh, the majority. So, how is it possible that uh, that the minorities in uh, at the times of partitions in the in the in, in, in the what would belong to Russia, uh, they assimilated not to the Russian culture but to the Polish culture. How is it possible? The minorities there. How would you wrap up this discussion? No. I don't want to wrap up. Um, I want to refer to um, Mr. Gotchik said. Uh, I'm very, um, I was very fortunate uh, because I was able to talk to all these renowned poets of uh, of all generations, decades. I mean, he must have gave each and the latter. Uh, we used to say in interviews when I was when I was a child, I was I wondered why God is so bad. Why God um, made other people be English? Uh, German, French, not Pol, not Polish. Please read Renkiewicz. And the, uh, the first, the, the, the filming about Mitkiewicz will start uh, also in spring. So Professor Krzysztof Keller, uh, Professor Krzysztof Maswan, Professor Krzysztof Keller, and um, Mr. Mateusz Matoszkowicz, thank you very much for uh, attending our panel, and thank you for your input. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to I would like to uh, close this conference. I would like to thank you for all the for the two days uh, for staying with us. You will be able to hear uh, to come back to all the panels and all the discussions on the internet. Uh, and I do encourage you to do so. And uh, I pronounce this conference uh, close now. Thank you.